Introduction of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways, or the Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Introduction. The three books gathered under the title In Search of the Castaways occupied much of Verne's attention during the three years following 1865. The characters used in these books were afterwards reintroduced in The Mysterious Island, which was in its turn a sequel to Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea. Thus this entire set of books form a united series upon which Verne worked intermittently during ten years. In Search of the Castaways, which has also been published as The Children of Captain Grant, and as A Voyage Around the World, is perhaps most interesting in connection with the last of these titles. It is our author's first distinctly geographical romance. By an ingenious device he sets before the rescuers a search which compels their circumnavigation of the globe around a certain parallel of the southern hemisphere. Thus they cross in turn through South America, Australia, and New Zealand, besides visiting minor islands. The three great regions form the subtitles of the three books which compose the story. In each region the rescuers meet with adventures characteristic of the land. They encounter Indians in America, bush rangers in Australia, and Maoris in New Zealand. The passage of the searching party gives ground, one is almost tempted to say, excuse, for a close and careful description of each country and of its inhabitants, step by step. Even the lesser incidents of the story are employed to emphasize the distinctive features of each land. The explorers are almost frozen on the heights of the Andes, and almost drowned in the floods of the Patagonian Pampas. An avalanche sweeps some of them away, a condor carries off a lad. In Australia they are stopped by jungles and by quagmires, they hunt kangaroos. In New Zealand they take refuge amid hot sulphur springs and in a house tabooed, they escape by starting a volcano into eruption. Here, then, are fancy and extravagance mixed with truth and information. Verne has done a vast and useful work in stimulating the interest not only of Frenchmen, but of all civilized nations, with regard to the lesser-known regions of our globe. He has broadened the knowledge and guided study. During the years following 1865 he even, for a time, deserted his favorite field of labor, fiction, and devoted himself to a popular semi-scientific book, now superseded by later works, entitled The Illustrated Geography of France and Her Colonies. Verne has, perhaps, had a larger share than any other single individual in causing the ever-increasing yearly tide of international travel. And because, with mutual knowledge among the nations, comes mutual understanding and appreciation, mutual brotherhood, hence Jules Verne was one of the first and greatest of those teachers who are now leading us toward international peace. End of introduction. Book One, Chapter One of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways, or The Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book One, South America, Chapter One. The shark. On the 26th of July, 1864, a magnificent yacht was steaming along the North Channel at full speed, with a strong breeze blowing from the northeast. The Union Jack was flying at the mizzenmast, and a blue standard bearing the initials E. G., embroidered in gold, and surmounted by a ducal coronet, floated from the top gallant head of the mainmast. The name of the yacht was the Duncan, and the owner was Lord Glenarvan, one of the sixteen Scotch peers who sit in the upper house, and the most distinguished member of the Royal Thames Yacht Club, so famous throughout the United Kingdom. Lord Edward Glenarvan was on board with his young wife, Lady Helena, and one of his cousins, Major McNabs. The Duncan was newly built, and had been making a trial trip a few miles outside the Firth of Clyde. She was returning to Glasgow, and the Isle of Arran already loomed in the distance, when the sailor on watch caught sight of an enormous fish sporting in the wake of the ship. Lord Edward, who was immediately apprised of the fact, came up on the poop a few minutes after with his cousin, and asked John Mangles, the captain, what sort of an animal he thought it was. 
"'Well, since your lordship asks my opinion,' said Mangles, "'I think it is a shark, and a fine large one, too.' "'A shark on these shores? There is nothing at all improbable in that,' returned the captain. "'This fish belongs to a species that is found in all latitudes and in all seas. It is the balance fish, or hammerhead shark, if I am not much mistaken. But if your lordship has no objections, and it would give the smallest pleasure to Lady Helena to see a novelty in the way of fishing, we'll soon haul up the monster and find out what it really is.' "'What do you say, McNabs? Shall we try it and catch it?' asked Lord Glenarvan. "'If you like, it's all one to me,' was his cousin's cool reply. "'The more of these terrible creatures that are killed, the better, at all events,' said John Mangles. "'So let's seize the chance, and it will not only give us a little diversion, but be doing a good action.' "'Very well. Set to work, then,' said Glenarvan. Lady Helena soon joined her husband on deck, quite charmed at the prospect of such exciting sport. The sea was splendid, and every movement of the shark was distinctly visible. In obedience to the captain's orders, the sailors threw a strong rope over the starboard side of the yacht, with a big hook at the end of it, concealed in a thick lump of bacon. The bait took at once, though the shark was full fifty yards distant. He began to make rapidly for the yacht, beating the waves violently with his fins, and keeping his tail in a perfectly straight line. As he got nearer, his great projecting eyes could be seen inflamed with greed, and his gaping jaws with their quadruple roll of teeth. His head was large, and shaped like a double hammer at the end of a handle. John Mangles was right. This was, evidently, a balance fish, the most voracious of all the squalidae species. The passengers and sailors on the yacht were watching all the animal's movements with the liveliest interest. He soon came within reach of the bait, turned over on his back to make a good dart at it, and in a second bacon and contents had disappeared. He had hooked himself now, as the tremendous jerk he gave the cable proved, and the sailors began to haul in the monster by means of tackle attached to the mainyard. He struggled desperately, but his captors were prepared for his violence, and had a long rope ready with a slip-knot, which caught his tail and rendered him powerless at once. In a few minutes more he was hoisted up over the side of the yacht and thrown on the deck. A man came forward immediately, hatchet in hand, and approaching him cautiously, with one powerful stroke cut off his tail. This ended the business, for there was no longer any fear of the shark. But, though the sailor's vengeance was satisfied, their curiosity was not. They knew the brute had no very delicate appetite, and the contents of his stomach might be worth investigation. This is the common practice on all ships when a shark is captured, but Lady Glenarvan declined to be present at such a disgusting exploration, and withdrew to the cabin again. The fish was still breathing, it measured ten feet in length, and weighed more than six hundred pounds. This was nothing extraordinary, for though the hammerhead shark is not classed among the most gigantic of the species, it is always reckoned among the most formidable. The huge brute was soon ripped up in a very unceremonious fashion. The hook had fixed right in the stomach, which was found to be absolutely empty, and the disappointed sailors were just going to throw the remains overboard, when the boatswain's attention was attracted by some large object sticking fast in one of the viscera. "'I say, what's this?' he exclaimed. "'That,' replied one of the sailors, "'why, it's a piece of rock, the beast swallowed by way of ballast. "'It's just a bottle, neither more nor less, that the fellow has got in his inside and couldn't digest,' said another of the crew. "'Hold your tongues, all of you,' said Tom Austin, the mate of the Duncan. "'Don't you see the animal has been such an inveterate tippler that he has not only drunk the wine, but swallowed the bottle?' "'What?' said Lord Glenarvan. "'Do you mean to say it is a bottle that the shark has got in his stomach?' "'Aye, it is a bottle, most certainly,' replied the boatswain, "'but not just from the cellar.' "'Why, Tom, be careful how you take it out,' said Lord Glenarvan, "'for bottles found in the sea often contain precious documents.' "'Do you think this does?' said Major McNams, incredulously. "'It possibly may, at any rate.' "'Oh, I'm not saying it doesn't. There may perhaps be some secret in it,' returned the Major. "'That's just what we're to see,' said his cousin. "'Well, Tom.' "'Here it is,' said the mate, holding up a shapeless lump he had managed to pull out, though with some difficulty. "'Get the filthy thing washed, then, and bring it to the cabin.' Tom obeyed, and in a few minutes brought in the bottle and laid it on the table, at which Lord Glenarvan and the Major were sitting, with the captain, and, of course, Lady Helena, for women, they say, are always a little curious. Everything is an event at sea. For a moment they all sat silent, gazing at this frail relic, 
wondering if it told the tale of sad disaster, or brought some trifling message from a frolic-loving sailor, who had flung it into the sea to amuse himself, when he had nothing better to do. However, the only way to know was to examine the bottle, and Glenarvan set to work without further delay, so carefully and minutely, that he might have been taken for a coroner making an inquest. He commenced by a close inspection of the outside. The neck was long and slender, and round the thick rim there was still an end of wire hanging, though eaten away with rust. The sides were very thick, and strong enough to bear great pressure. It was evidently of champagne origin, and the Major said immediately, "'That's one of our Clicquot's bottles.' Nobody contradicted him, as he was supposed to know, but Lady Helena exclaimed, "'What does it matter about the bottle, if we don't know where it comes from?' We shall know that, too, presently, and we may affirm this much already. It comes from a long way off. Look at those petrifications all over it, these different substances almost turned to mineral, we might say, through the action of the salt water. This waif had been tossing about in the ocean a long time before the shark swallowed it. I quite agree with you, said McNabbs. I dare say this frail concern has made a long voyage, protected by this strong covering. But I want to know where from, said Lady Glenarvan. "'Wait a little, dear Helena, wait. We must have patience with bottles. But if I am not much mistaken, this one will answer all our questions,' replied her husband, beginning to scrape away the hard substances round the neck. Soon the cork made its appearance, but much damaged by the water. "'That's vexing,' said Lord Edward, "'for if papers are inside they'll be in a pretty state.' "'It's to be feared they will,' said the Major. "'But it is a lucky thing the shark swallowed them, I must say,' added Glenarvan, "'for the bottle would have sunk to the bottom before long with such a cork as this.' "'That's true enough,' replied John Mangles, "'and yet it would have been better to have fished them up in the open sea. Then we might have found out the road they had come by taking the exact latitude and longitude, and studying the atmospheric and submarine currents. But with such a postman as a shark, that goes against wind and tide, there's no clue whatever to the starting-point.' "'We shall see,' said Glenarvan, gently taking out the cork. A strong odour of salt-water pervaded the whole saloon, and Lady Helena asked impatiently, "'Well, what is there?' "'I was right,' exclaimed Glenarvan. "'I see papers inside. But I fear it will be impossible to remove them,' he added, "'for they appear to have rotted with the damp, and are sticking to the sides of the bottle.' "'Break it,' said the Major. "'I would rather preserve the whole if I could.' "'No doubt you would,' said Lady Helena. "'But the contents are more valuable than the bottle.' and we had better sacrifice the one than the other. "'If your lordship would simply break off the neck, I think we might easily withdraw the papers,' suggested John Mangles. "'Try it, Edward, try it,' said Lady Helena. Lord Glenarvan was very unwilling, but he found there was no alternative. The precious bottle must be broken. They had to get a hammer before this could be done, though, for the stony material had acquired the hardness of granite. A few sharp strokes, however, soon shivered it to fragments, many of which had pieces of paper sticking to them. These were carefully removed by Lord Glenarvan, and separated and spread out on the table before the eager gaze of his wife and friends. End of Book One, Chapter One Book One, Chapter Two of In Search of the Castaways This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eddie Winter. In Search of the Castaways, or The Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book One, Chapter Two. The Three Documents. All that could be discovered, however, on these pieces of paper was a few words here and there, the remainder of the lines being almost completely obliterated by the action of the water. Lord Glenarvan examined them attentively for a few minutes, turning them over on all sides, holding them up to the light, and trying to decipher the least scrap of writing, while the others looked on with anxious eyes. At last, he said, there are three distinct documents here, apparently copies of the same document in three different languages. Here is one in English, one in French, and one in German. "'But can you make any sense out of them?' asked Lady Helena. "'That's hard to say, my dear Helena. The words are quite incomplete.' "'Perhaps the one may supplement the other,' suggested Major McNabbs. "'Very likely they will,' said the captain. "'It is impossible that the very same words should have been effaced in each document, and by putting the scraps together 
we might gather some intelligible meaning out of them. That's what we will do, rejoined Lord Glenarvan. But let us proceed methodically. Here is the English document first. All that remained of it was the following. 62. Bri, Gal, Sink, Stra, Aland, Skip, Gr, That Monit of Long, and Sistance, Lost. There's not much to be made out of that, said the Major, looking disappointed. No, but it is good English anyhow, returned the captain. There's no doubt of it, said Glenarvan. The words sink, a land, lost, are entire. Skip is evidently part of the word skipper, and that's what they call ship captains often in England. There seems a Mr. Gur mentioned, and that most likely is the captain of the shipwrecked vessel. Well, come, we have made out a good deal already, said Lady Helena. Yes, but unfortunately there are whole lines wanting, said the Major, and we have neither the name of the ship nor the place where she was shipwrecked. We will get that by and by, said Edward. Oh, yes, there is no doubt of it, replied the Major, who always echoed his neighbour's opinion. But how? By comparing one document with the other. Let us try them, said his wife. The second piece of paper was even more destroyed than the first. Only a few scattered words remained here and there. It ran as follows. Zeven, Juni, Glas, Zwei, Atrosen, Graus, Brinkt, Enen. This is written in German, said John Mangles, the moment he looked at it. And you understand that language, don't you? asked Lord Glenarvan. Perfectly. Come then, tell us the meaning of these words. The captain examined the document carefully and said, Well, here's the date of the accounts first. Zeven Juni means June the 7th, and if we put that before the figures 62, we have in the other document, it gives us the exact date, 7th of June, 1862. Capital, exclaimed Lady Helena. Go on, John. On the same line, resumed the young captain, there is a syllable glass, and if we add that to the gal we found in the English paper, we get the whole word Glasgow at once. The documents evidently refer to some ship that sailed out of the port of Glasgow. That is my opinion too, said the Major. The second line is completely effaced, continued the captain. But here are two important words on the third. There is zwei, which means two, and a chosen, or Matrosen, the German for sailors. Then I suppose it is about a captain and two sailors, said Lady Helena. It seems so, replied Lord Glenarvan. I must confess, your lordship, that the next word puzzles me. I can make nothing of it. Perhaps the third document may throw some light on it. The last two words are plain enough. Bring to Enon means bring them. And if you recollect in the English paper, we had assistance. So by putting the parts together, it reads thus, I think, Bring them assistance. Yes, that must be it, replied Lord Glenarvan. But where are the poor fellows? We have not the slightest indication of the place meantime, nor of where the catastrophe happened. Perhaps the French copy will be more explicit, suggested Lady Helena. Here it is then, said Lord Glenarvan, and that is in a language we all know. The words it contained were these. Toi, a, tanya, goni, astral, abor, conta, pr, cruel indi, jet, onget, et trente set degrees, onze minute, lat. There were figures, exclaimed Lady Helena. Look! Let us go steadily to work, said Lord Glenarvan, and begin at the beginning. I think we can make out from the incomplete words in the first line that a three-mast vessel is in question, and there is little doubt about the name. We get that from the fragments of the other papers. It is the Britannia. As to the next two words, Goni and Austral, it is only Austral that has any meaning to us. But that is a valuable scrap of information, said John Mangles. The shipwreck occurred in the southern hemisphere. That's a wide world, 
said the Major. Well, we'll go on, resumed Glenarvan. Here is the word abor. That is clearly the root of the verb abor day. The poor men have landed somewhere, but where? Conta, does that mean continent? Cruel? Cruel, interrupted John Mangles. I see now what grouse is part of in the second document. It is grausam, the word in German for cruel. Let's go on, said Lord Glenarvan, becoming quite excited over his task, as the incomplete words began to fill up and develop their meaning. Indy. Is it India, where they have been shipwrecked? And what can this word ongi be part of? Ah, I see, it is longitude, and here is the latitude, 37 degrees 11 minutes. That is a precise indication at last, then. But we haven't the longitude, objected McNabbs. But we can't get everything, my dear Major, and it is something at all events to have the exact latitude. The French document is decidedly the most complete of the three, but it is plain enough that each is the literal translation of the other, for they all contain exactly the same number of lines. What we have to do now is to put together all the words we have found and translate them into one language, and try to ascertain their most probable and logical sense. Well, what language shall we choose? asked the Major. I think we had better keep to the French, since that was the most complete document of the three. Your lordship is right, said John Mangles, and besides, we're all familiar with the language. Very well, then. I'll set to work. In a few minutes he had written as follows. Set Roi, 1862. Trois mains, Britannia, Glasgow. Sombre corny, austral, à terre, de matelot, capitaine gre, Abor, Contin, Pre, Cruel, Indy, Jet, ce document, de longitude, Air, trente sept, degrés, onze minutes, de latitude, Porte le secours, perdu. Meaning, 7th of June, 1862, Three Mast Britannia, Glasgow, Founded, Goni, Southern, on the coast, Two sailors, Gre, Captain, Landed, Contin, Pre, Cruel, Indy, thrown this document in longitude and 37 degrees 11 minutes latitude. Bring them assistance, lost. Just at that moment one of the sailors came to inform the captain that they were about entering the Firth of Clyde and to ask what were his orders. What are your lordship's intentions, said John Mangles, addressing Lord Glenarvan. To get to Dumbarton as quickly as possible, John, and Lady Helena will turn to Malcolm Castle while I go on to London and lay this document before the Admiralty. The sailor received orders accordingly and went out to deliver them to the mate. Now, friends, said Lord Glenarvan, let us go on with our investigations, for we are on the track of a great catastrophe, and the lives of several human beings depends on our sagacity. We must give our whole minds to the solution of this enigma. First of all, there are three very distinct things to be considered in this document. The things we know, the things we may conjecture, the things we do not know. What are those we know? We know that on the 7th of June, a three-mast vessel, the Britannia of Glasgow, foundered, that two sailors and the captain threw this document into the sea, in 37 degrees 11 minutes latitude, and they entreat help. Exactly so, said the Major. What are those now we may conjecture, continued Glenarvan, that the shipwreck occurred in the southern seas, and here I will draw your attention at once to the incomplete word, Goni. Doesn't the name of the country strike you even in the mere mention of it? Patagonia, exclaimed Lady Helena. Undoubtedly. But is Patagonia crossed by the 37th parallel? asked the Major. That is easily ascertained, said the Captain, opening a map of South America. Yes, it is. Patagonia just touches the 37th parallel. It cuts through Araucania, goes along the Pampas to the north, and loses itself in the Atlantic. Well, let us proceed then with our conjectures. The two sailors and the Captain land. Land where? Contin on the continent, 
on a continent, mark you, not an island. What becomes of them? There are two letters here, providentially, which give a clue to their fate. P.R. That must mean prisoners, and cruel Indian is evidently the meaning of the next two words. These unfortunate men are captives in the hands of cruel Indians. Don't you see it? Don't the words seem to come of themselves and fill up the blanks? Isn't the document quite clear now? Isn't the sense self-evident? Glenarvan spoke in a tone of absolute conviction, and his enthusiastic confidence appeared contagious, for the others all exclaimed too, Yes, it is evident, quite evident. After an instant, Lord Edward said again, To my own mind, the hypothesis is so plausible that I have no doubt whatever the event occurred on the coast of Patagonia, but still I will have inquiries made in Glasgow as to the destination of the Britannia, and we shall know if it is possible she should have been wrecked on those shores. Oh, there's no need to send so far to find out that, said John Mangles. I have the Mercantile and Shipping Gazette here, and we'll see the name on the list and all about it. Do look at once then, said Lord Glenarvan. The file of papers for the year 1862 was soon brought, and John began to turn over the leaves rapidly, running down each page with his eye in search of the name required. But his quest was not long, for in a few minutes he called out, I've got it! May the 30th, 1862, Peru, Caleo, with cargo for Glasgow, the Britannia, Captain Grant. Grant, exclaimed Lord Glenarvan. That is the adventurous Scotsman that attempted to found a new Scotland on the shores of the Pacific. Yes, rejoined John Mangles, it is the very man. He sailed from Glasgow in the Britannia in 1861, and has not been heard of since. There isn't a doubt of it, not a shadow of doubt, repeated Lord Glenarvan. It is just that same Captain Grant. The Britannia left Caleo on the 30th of May, and on the 7th of June, a week afterward, she is lost on the coast of Patagonia. A few broken, disjointed words we find in these documents tell us the whole story. You see, friends, our conjectures hit the mark very well. We know all now, except one thing, and that is the longitude. That is not needed now. We know the country. With the latitude alone, I would engage to go right to the place where the wreck happened. Then have we really all the particulars now? asked Lady Helena. All, dear Helena. I can fill up every one of these blanks the sea has made in the document as easily as if Captain Grant were dictating to me and he took up the pen, and dashed off the following lines immediately. On the 7th of June, 1862, the three-mast vessel Britannia of Glasgow has sunk on the coast of Patagonia in the southern hemisphere. Making for the shore, two sailors and Captain Grant are about to land on the continent, where they will be taken prisoners by cruel Indians. They have thrown this document into the sea, in longitude and latitude, thirty-seven degrees, eleven minutes. Bring them assistance, or they are lost. Capital! Capital, dear Edward, said Lady Helena. If those poor creatures ever see their native land again, it is you they will have to thank for it. And they will see it again, returned Lord Glenarvan. The statement is too explicit and clear and certain for England to hesitate about going to the aid of her three sons, cast away on a desert coast. What she has done for Franklin and so many others, she will do today for these poor shipwrecked fellows of the Britannia. Most likely the unfortunate men have families who mourn their loss. Perhaps this ill-fated Captain Grant had a wife and children, suggested Lady Helena. Very true, my dear, and I'll not forget to let them know that there is still hope. But now, friends, we had better go up on deck, as the boat must be getting near the harbour. A carriage and post-horses waited there in readiness to convey Lady Helena and Major McNabbs to Malcolm Castle, and Lord Glenarvan bade adieu to his young wife and jumped into the express train for Glasgow. But before starting, he confided an important missive to a swifter agent than himself, and a few minutes afterward it flashed along the electric wire to London to appear next day in the Times and Morning Chronicle in the following words. 
for information respecting the fate of the three-mast vessel Britannia of Glasgow, Captain Grant, apply to Lord Glenarvan, Malcolm Castle, Luss, Dumbartonshire, Scotland. End of Book One, Chapter Two. Book One, Chapter Three of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eddie Winter. In Search of the Castaways or the Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book One, Chapter Three The Captain's Children. Lord Glenarvan's fortune was enormous and he spent it entirely in doing good. His kind-heartedness was even greater than his generosity, for the one knew no bounds, while the other of necessity had its limits. As Lord of Luss and Laird of Malcolm, he represented his county in the House of Lords. But, with his Jacobite ideas, he did not care much for the favour of the House of Hanover, and he was looked upon coldly by the State Party in England because of the tenacity with which he clung to the traditions of his forefathers, and his energetic resistance to the political encroachments of Southerners. And yet he was not a man behind the times, and there was nothing little or narrow-minded about him, but while always keeping open his ancestral county to progress, he was a true Scotchman at heart, and it was for the honour of Scotland that he competed in the yacht races of the Royal Thames Yacht Club. Edward Glenarvan was thirty-two years of age. He was tall in person, and had rather stern features, but there was an exceeding sweetness in his look, and a stamp of highland poetry about his whole bearing. He was known to be brave to excess, and full of daring and chivalry, a Fergus of the nineteenth century, but his goodness excelled every other quality, and he was more charitable than St. Martin himself, for he would have given the whole of his cloak to any of the poor Highlanders. He had scarcely been married three months, and his bride was Miss Helena Tufnell, the daughter of William Tufnell, the great traveller, one of the many victims of geographical science, and of the passion for discovery. Miss Helena did not belong to a noble family, but she was Scotch, and that was better than all nobility in the eyes of Lord Glenarvan, and she was, moreover, a charming, high-souled, religious young woman. Lord Glenarvan did not forget that his wife was the daughter of a great traveller, and he thought it likely that she would inherit her father's predilections. He had the Duncan bill expressly that he might take his bride to the most beautiful lands in the world, and complete their honeymoon by sailing up the Mediterranean and through the clustering islands of the archipelago. However, Lord Glenarvan had gone now to London. The lives of the shipwrecked men were at stake, and Lady Helena was too much concerned herself about them to grudge her husband's temporary absence. A telegram next day gave hope of his speedy return, but in the evening a letter apprised her of the difficulties his proposition had met with, and the morning after brought another, in which he openly expressed his dissatisfaction with the Admiralty. Lady Helena began to get anxious as the day wore on. In the evening, when she was sitting alone in her room, Mr. Halbert, the house steward came in and asked if she would see a young girl and boy that wanted to speak to Lord Glenarvan. Some of the country people, asked Lady Helena. No, madam, replied the steward. I do not know them at all. They came by rail to Ballock and walked the rest of the way to Luss. Tell them to come up, Halbert. In a few minutes a girl and boy were shown in. They were evidently brother and sister, for the resemblance was unmistakable. The girl was about sixteen years of age. Her tired, pretty face and sorrowful eyes and resigned but courageous look, as well as her neat, though poor attire, made a favourable impression. The boy she held by the hand was about twelve, but his face expressed such determination that he appeared quite his sister's protector. The girl seemed too shy to utter a word at first, but Lady Helena quickly relieved her embarrassment by saying, with an encouraging smile, you wish to speak to me, I think. No, replied the boy, in a decided tone. Not to you, but to Lord Glenarvan. Excuse him, ma'am, said the girl, with a look at her brother. 
Lord Glenarvan is not at the castle just now, returned Lady Helena, but I am his wife, and if I can do anything for you... You are Lady Glenarvan, interrupted the girl. I am. The wife of Lord Glenarvan of Malcolm Castle, that put an announcement in the Times about the shipwreck of the Britannia. Yes, yes, said Lady Helena eagerly. And you? I am Miss Grant, ma'am, and this is my brother. Miss Grant, Miss Grant, exclaimed Lady Helena, drawing the young girl toward her and taking both her hands and kissing the boy's rosy cheeks. What is it you know, ma'am, about the shipwreck? Tell me, is my father living? Shall we ever see him again? Oh, tell me, said the girl earnestly. My dear girl, replied Lady Helena, heaven forbid that I should answer you lightly such a question. I would not delude you with vain hopes. Oh, tell me all, tell me all, ma'am. I am proof against sorrow. I can bear to hear anything. My poor child, there is but a faint hope but with the help of Almighty Heaven, it is just possible you may one day see your father once more. The girl burst into tears, and Robert seized Lady Glenarvan's hand and covered it with kisses. As soon as they grew calmer, they asked a complete string of questions, and Lady Helena recounted the whole story of the document, telling them that their father had been wrecked on the coast of Patagonia, and that he and two sailors, the sole survivors, appeared to have reached the shore, and had written an appeal for help in three languages, and committed it to the care of the waves. During the recital, Robert Grant was devouring the speaker with his eyes, and hanging on her lips. His childish imagination evidently retraced all the scenes of his father's shipwreck. He saw him on the deck of the Britannia, and then struggling with the billows, then clinging to the rocks, and lying at length exhausted on the beach. More than once he cried out, "'Oh, Papa, my poor Papa!' and pressed close to his sister. Miss Grant sat silent and motionless, with clasped hands, and all she said when the narration ended was, "'Oh, ma'am, the paper, please!' "'I have not it now, my dear child,' replied Lady Helena. "'You haven't it?' "'No. Lord Glenarvan was obliged to take it to London, for the sake of your father, but I have told you all it contained, word for word.' and how we managed to make out the complete sense from the fragments of words left, all except the longitude, unfortunately. We can do without that, said the boy. Yes, Mr. Robert, rejoined Lady Helena, smiling at the child's decided tone. And so you see, Miss Grant, you know the smallest details now, just as well as I do. Yes, ma'am, but I should like to have seen my father's writing. Well, tomorrow, perhaps tomorrow, Lord Glenarvan will be back. My husband determined to lay the document before the Lords of the Admiralty, to induce them to send out a ship immediately in search of Captain Grant. Is it possible, ma'am, exclaimed the girl, that you have done that for us? Yes, my dear Miss Grant, and I am expecting Lord Glenarvan back every minute now. Oh, ma'am, heaven bless you and Lord Glenarvan, said the young girl fervently, overcome with grateful emotion. My dear girl, we deserve no thanks. Any one in our place would have done the same. I only trust the hopes we are leading you to entertain may be realized. But till my husband returns, you will remain at the castle. No, no, ma'am, I could not abuse the sympathy you show to strangers. Strangers, dear child, interrupted Lady Helena. You and your brother are not strangers in this house, and I should like Lord Glenarvan to be able on his arrival to tell the children of Captain Grant himself what is going to be done to rescue their father. It was impossible to refuse an invitation given with such heart, and Miss Grant and her brother consented to stay till Lord Glenarvan returned. End of Book One, Chapter Three Book One, Chapter Four of In Search of the Castaways This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways, or The Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book One, Chapter Four. Lady Glenarvan's Proposal. Lady Helena thought it best to say nothing to the children about the fears Lord Glenarvan had expressed in his letters respecting the decisions of the Lords of the Admiralty with regard to the document nor did she mention the probable captivity of Captain Grant among the Indians of South America. 
Why sadden the poor children, and damp their newly cherished hopes? It would not in the least alter the actual state of the case, so not a word was said, and after answering all Miss Grant's questions, Lady Helena began to interrogate in her turn, asking her about her past life and her present circumstances. It was a touching, simple story she had heard in reply, and one which increased her sympathy for the young girl. Mary and Robert were the captain's only children. Harry Grant lost his wife when Robert was born, and during his long voyages he left his little ones in charge of his cousin, a good old lady. Captain Grant was a fearless sailor. He not only thoroughly understood navigation, but commerce also, a twofold qualification eminently useful to skippers in the merchant service. He lived in Dundee, in Perthshire, Scotland. His father, a minister of St. Catherine's Church, had given him a thorough education, as he believed that could never hurt anybody. Harry's voyages were prosperous from the first, and a few years after Robert was born he found himself possessed of a considerable fortune. It was then that he proposed the grand scheme which made him popular in Scotland. Like Glenarvan and a few noble families in the lowlands, he had no heart for the union with England. In his eyes the interests of his country were not identified with those of the Anglo-Saxons, and to give scope for personal development he resolved to found an immense Scotch colony on one of the ocean continents. Possibly he might have thought that some day they would achieve their independence, as the United States did, an example doubtless to be followed eventually by Australia and India. But whatever might be his secret motives, such was his dream of colonization. But, as is easily understood, the government opposed his plans, and put difficulties enough in his way to have killed an ordinary man. But Harry would not be beaten. He appealed to the patriotism of his countrymen, placed his fortune at the service of the cause, built a ship and manned it with a picked crew, and, leaving his children to the care of his old cousin, set off to explore the great islands of the Pacific. This was in 1861, and for twelve months, or up to May 1862, letters were regularly received from him, but no tidings whatever had come since his departure from Calot, in June, and the name of the Britannia never appeared in the shipping list. Just at this juncture the old cousin died, and Harry Grant's two children were left alone in the world. Mary Grant was then only fourteen, but she resolved to face her situation bravely, and to devote herself entirely to her little brother, who was still a mere child. By dint of close economy, combined with tact and prudence, she managed to support and educate him, working day and night, denying herself everything, that she might give him all he needed, watching over him and caring for him like a mother. The two children were living in this touching manner in Dundee, struggling patiently and courageously with their poverty. Mary thought only of her brother, and indulged in dreams of a prosperous future for him. She had long given up all hope of the Britannia, and was fully persuaded that her father was dead. What, then, was her emotion when she accidentally saw the notice in the Times? She never hesitated for an instant as to the course she should adopt, but determined to go to Dumbartonshire immediately, and learn the best and worst. Even if she were to be told that her father's lifeless body had been found on a distant shore, or in the bottom of some abandoned ship, it would be a relief from incessant doubt and torturing suspense. She told her brother about the advertisement, and the two children started off together that same day for Perth, where they took the train, and arrived in the evening at Malcolm Castle. Such was Mary Grant's sorrowful story, and she recounted it in so simple and unaffected a manner, that it was evident that she never thought her conduct had been that of a heroine through those long, trying years. But Lady Helena thought it for her, and more than once she put her arms round both the children, and could not restrain her tears. As for Robert, he seemed to have heard these particulars for the first time. All the while his sister was speaking, he gazed at her with wide-open eyes, only knowing how much she had done and suffered for him, and as she ended he flung herself on her neck, and exclaimed, "'Oh, mamma, my dear little mamma. It was quite dark by this time, and Lady Helena made the children go to bed, for she knew they must be tired after their journey. They were soon both sound asleep, dreaming of happy days. After they had retired, Lady Helena sent for Major McNabbs, and told him the incidents of the evening. "'That Mary Grant must be a brave girl,' said the Major. I only hope my husband will succeed, for the poor children's sake, said his cousin. It would be terrible for them if he did not. He will be sure to succeed, or the lords of the admiralty must have hearts harder than Portland stone. But notwithstanding McNabbs's assurance, Lady Helena passed the night in great anxiety, and could not close her eyes. 
Mary Grant and her brother were up very early next morning, and were walking about in the courtyard when they heard the sound of a carriage approaching. It was Lord Glenarvan, and almost immediately Lady Helena and the Major came out to meet him. Lady Helena flew toward her husband the moment he alighted, but he embraced her silently, and looked gloomy and disappointed, indeed even furious. "'Well, Edward,' she said, "'tell me. Well, Helena, dear, those people have no heart. They have refused? Yes, they have refused me a ship. They talked of the millions that had been wasted in search for Franklin, and declared the document was obscure and unintelligible. And then they said it was two years now since they were cast away, and there was little chance of finding them.' Besides, they would have it that the Indians, who made them prisoners, would have dragged them into the interior, and it was impossible, they said, to hunt all through Patagonia for three men, three Scotchmen, that the search would be vain and perilous, and cost more lives than it saved. In short, they assigned all the reasons that people invent who have made up their minds to refuse. The truth is, they remembered Captain Grant's projects, and that is the secret of the whole affair. So the poor fellow is lost for ever." "'My father! my poor father!' cried Mary Grant, throwing herself on her knees before Lord Glenarvan, who exclaimed in amazement, "'Your father! What? Is this Miss—' "'Yes, Edward,' said Lady Helena. "'This is Miss Mary Grant and her brother, the two children condemned to orphanage by the cruel admiralty.' "'Oh, Miss Grant,' said Lord Glenarvan, raising the young girl, "'if I had known of your presence—' He said no more, and there was a painful silence in the courtyard, broken only by sobs. No one spoke, but the very attitude of both servants and masters spoke their indignation at the conduct of the English government. At last the Major said, addressing Lord Glenarvan, "'Then you have no hope whatever?' "'None,' was the reply. "'Very well, then,' exclaimed little Robert, "'I'll go and speak to those people myself, and we'll see if they—' He did not complete his sentence, for his sister stopped him, but his clenched fist showed his intentions, were the reverse of Pacific. "'No, Robert,' said Mary Grant, we will thank this noble lord and lady for what they have done for us, and never cease to think of them with gratitude, and then we'll both go together. Mary, said Lady Helena, in a tone of surprise, go where? asked Lord Glenarvan. I am going to throw myself at the Queen's feet, and we shall see if she will turn a deaf ear to the prayers of two children who implore their father's life. Lord Glenarvan shook his head, not that he doubted the kind heart of Her Majesty, but he knew Mary would never gain access to her. Suppliants but too rarely reach the steps of a throne. It seems as if royal palaces had the same inscription on their doors that the English have on their ships. Passengers are requested not to speak to the man at the wheel. Lady Glenarvan understood what was passing in her husband's mind, and she felt the young girl's attempt would be useless, and only plunged the poor children in deeper despair. Suddenly a grand, generous purpose fired her soul, and she called out, "'Mary Grant, wait, my child, and listen to what I'm going to say.' Mary had just taken her brother by the hand, and turned to go away, but she stepped back at Lady Helena's bidding. The young wife went up to her husband, and said, with tears in her eyes, though her voice was firm, and her face beamed with animation, "'Edward, when Captain Grant wrote that letter and threw it into the sea, he committed it to the care of God. God has sent it to us, to us. Undoubtedly God intends us to undertake the rescue of these poor men.' "'What do you mean, Helena?' I mean this, that we ought to think ourselves fortunate if we can begin our married life with a good action. Well, you know, Edward, that to please me you planned a pleasure trip, but what could give us such genuine pleasure, or to be so useful, as to save those unfortunate fellows cast off by their country? Helena! exclaimed Lord Glenarvan. Yes, Edward, you understand me. The Duncan is a good strong ship. She can venture in the southern seas, or go round the world if necessary. Let us go, Edward, let us start off and search for Captain Grant. Lord Glenarvan made no reply to this bold proposition, but smiled, and holding out his arms, drew his wife into a close, fond embrace. Mary and Robert seized her hands, and covered them with kisses, and the servants who thronged the courtyard, and had been witnesses of this touching scene, shouted with one voice, Hurrah for the Lady of Luss! Three cheers for Lord and Lady Glenarvan! End of Book One, Chapter Four Book One, Chapter Five of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. In Search of the Castaways, or The Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. 
Book One, Chapter Five: The Departure of the Duncan. We have said already that Lady Helena was a brave, generous woman, and what she had just done proved it indisputably. Her husband had good reason to be proud of such a wife, one who could understand and enter into all his views. The idea of going to Captain Grant's rescue had occurred to him in London when his request was refused, and he would have anticipated Lady Helena. Only he could not bear the thought of parting from her. But now that she herself proposed to go, all hesitation was at an end. The servants of the castle had hailed the project with loud acclamations, for it was to save their brothers, Scotchmen like themselves, and Lord Glenarvan cordially joined his cheers with theirs for the Lady of Luss. The departure once resolved upon, there was not an hour to be lost. A telegram was dispatched to John Mangles the very same day, conveying Lord Glenarvan's orders to take the Duncan immediately to Glasgow, and to make preparations for a voyage to the southern seas and possibly round the world. For Lady Helena was right in her opinion that the yacht might safely attempt the circumnavigation of the globe if necessary. The Duncan was a steam yacht of the finest description. She was two hundred and ten tons burden. Much larger than any of the first vessels that touched the shores of the New World, for the largest of the four ships that sailed with Columbus was only seventy tons. She had two masts and all the sails and rigging of an ordinary clipper, which would enable her to take advantage of every favorable wind, though her chief reliance was on her mechanical power. The engine, which was constructed on a new system, was a high-pressure one of one hundred and sixty horsepower, and put in motion a double screw. This gave the yacht such swiftness that during her trial trip in the Firth of Clyde she made seventeen miles an hour, a higher speed than any vessel had yet attained. No alterations were consequently needed in the Duncan herself. John Mangles had only to attend to her interior arrangements. His first care was to enlarge the bunkers to carry as much coal as possible, for it is difficult to get fresh supplies en route. He had to do the same with the storerooms, and managed so well that he succeeded in laying in provisions enough for two years. There was an abundance of money at his command, and enough remained to buy a cannon on a pivot carriage which he mounted on the forecastle. There was no knowing what might happen, and it is always well to be able to send a good round bullet flying four miles off. John Mangles understood his business. Though he was only the captain of a pleasure yacht, he was one of the best skippers in Glasgow. He was thirty years of age, and his countenance expressed both courage and goodness, if the features were somewhat coarse. He had been brought up at the castle by the Glenarvan family, and had turned out a capital sailor, having already given proof, in some of his long voyages, of his skill and energy and sang froid. When Lord Glenarvan offered him the command of the Duncan, he accepted it with right good will, for he loved the master of Malcolm Castle like a brother, and had hitherto vainly sought some opportunity of showing his devotion. Tom Austin, the mate, was an old sailor worthy of all confidence. The crew, consisting of twenty-five men, including the captain and chief officer, were all from Dumbartonshire, experienced sailors, and all belonging to the Glenarvan estate. In fact, it was a regular clan, and they did not forget to carry with them the traditional bagpipes. Lord Glenarvan had in them a band of trusty fellows, skilled in their calling, devoted to himself, full of courage, and as practiced in handling firearms as in the maneuvering of a ship. A valiant little troop, ready to follow him anywhere, even in the most dangerous expeditions. When the crew heard whither they were bound, they could not restrain their enthusiasm, and the rocks of Dumbarton rang again with their joyous outbursts of cheers. But while John Mangles made the stowage and provisioning of the yacht his chief business, he did not forget to fit up the rooms of Lord and Lady Glenarvan for a long voyage. He had also to get cabins ready for the children of Captain Grant, as Lady Helena could not refuse Mary's request to accompany her. As for young Robert, he would have smuggled himself in somewhere in the hold of the Duncan rather than be left behind. He would willingly have gone as a cabin boy like Nelson. It was impossible to resist a little fellow like that, and indeed no one tried. He would not even go as a passenger, but must serve in some capacity as cabin boy, apprentice, or sailor. He did not care which. So he was put in charge of John Mangles to be properly trained for his vocation. And I hope he won't spare me the cat o' nine tails if I don't do properly," said Robert. "Rest easy on that score, my boy," said Lord Glenarvan gravely. He did not add that this mode of punishment was forbidden on board the Duncan, and moreover was quite unnecessary. 
To complete the role of passengers, we must name Major McNabs. The Major was about fifty years of age, with a calm face and regular features, a man who did whatever he was told, of an excellent, indeed a perfect temper, modest, silent, peaceable, and amiable, agreeing with everybody on every subject, never discussing, never disputing, never getting angry. He wouldn't move a step quicker or slower whether he walked upstairs to bed or mounted a breach. Nothing could excite him, nothing could disturb him, not even a cannonball, and no doubt he will die without ever having known even a passing feeling of irritation. This man was endowed in an eminent degree, not only with ordinary animal courage, that physical bravery of the battlefield which is solely due to muscular energy, but he had what is far nobler, moral courage, firmness of soul. If he had any fault it was his being so intensely scotch from top to toe, a Caledonian of the Caledonians, an obstinate stickler for all the ancient customs of his country. This was the reason he would never serve in England, and he gained his rank of major in the 42nd Regiment, the Highland Black Watch, composed entirely of Scotch noblemen. As a cousin of Glenarvan he lived in Malcolm Castle, and as a major he went as a matter of course with the Duncan. Such then was the personnel of this yacht, so unexpectedly called to make one of the most wonderful voyages of modern times. From the hour she reached the steamboat quay at Glasgow she completely monopolized the public attention. A considerable crowd visited her every day, and the Duncan was the one topic of interest in conversation, to the great vexation of the different captains in the port, among others of Captain Burton, in command of the Scotia, a magnificent steamer lying close beside her, and bound for Calcutta. Considering her size, the Scotia might justly look upon the Duncan as a mere fly-boat, and yet this pleasure-yacht of Lord Glenarvan was quite the centre of attraction, and the excitement about her daily increased. The Duncan was to sail out with the tide at three o'clock on the morning of the 25th of August. But before starting, a touching ceremony was witnessed by the good people of Glasgow. At eight o'clock the night before, Lord Glenarvan and his friends, and the entire crew, from the stokers to the captain, all who were to take part in this self-sacrificing voyage, left the yacht and repaired to St. Mungo's, the ancient cathedral of the city. This venerable edifice, so marvelously described by Walter Scott, remains intact amid the ruins made by the Reformation, and it was there, beneath its lofty arches, in the grand nave, in the presence of an immense crowd, and surrounded by tombs as thickly set as in a cemetery, that they all assembled to implore the blessing of heaven on their expedition, and to put themselves under the protection of Providence. The Reverend Mr. Morton conducted the service, and when he had ended and pronounced the benediction, a young girl's voice broke the solemn silence that followed. It was Mary Grant who poured out her heart to God in prayer for her benefactors, while grateful, happy tears streamed down her cheeks and almost choked her utterance. The vast assembly dispersed under the influence of deep emotion, and at ten o'clock the passengers and crew returned on board the vessel. End of Book One, Chapter Five Book One, Chapter Six of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways, or The Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book One, Chapter Six An Unexpected Passenger. The ladies passed the whole of the first day of the voyage in their berths, for there was a heavy swell in the sea and toward evening the wind blew pretty fresh, and the Duncan tossed and pitched considerably. But the morning after the wind changed, and the captain ordered the men to put up the foresail, and brigantine and foretopsail, which greatly lessened the rolling of the vessel. Lady Helena and Mary Grant were able to come on deck at daybreak, where they found Lord Glenarvan, Major McNabs, and the captain. "'And how do you sand the sea, Miss Mary?' said Lord Glenarvan. "'Pretty well, my lord. I am not very much inconvenienced by it. Besides, I shall get used to it. And our young Robert?' "'Oh, as for Robert,' said the captain, "'whenever he is not poking about down below in the engine-room, he is perched somewhere aloft among the rigging. A youngster like that laughs at seasickness. Why, look at him this very moment. Do you see him?' The captain pointed toward the foremast, and sure enough there was Robert, hanging on the yards of the top-gallant mast, a hundred feet above in the air. 
Mary involuntarily gave a start, but the captain said, "'Oh, don't be afraid, Miss Mary. He is all right. Take my word for it. I'll have a capital sailor to present to Captain Grant before long, for we'll find the worthy captain, depend upon it.' "'Heaven grant it, Mr. John,' replied the young girl. "'My dear child,' said Lord Glenarvan, "'there is something so providential in the whole affair, that we have every reason to hope. We are not going, we are led, we are not searching, we are guided. And then see all the brave men that have enlisted in the service of the good cause. We shall not only succeed in our enterprise, but there will be little difficulty in it. I promised Lady Helena a pleasure trip, and I am much mistaken if I don't keep my word. Edward, said his wife, you are the best of men. Not at all, was the reply, but I have the best of crews and the best of ships. You don't admire the Duncan, I suppose, Miss Mary. On the contrary, my lord, I do admire her, and I'm a connoisseur in ships, returned the young girl. Indeed. Yes, I've played all my life on my father's ships. He could have made me a sailor, for I dare say, at a pinch, I could reef a sail or plate a gasket easily enough. Do you say so, miss? exclaimed John Mangles. If you talk like that, you and John will be great friends, for he can't think any calling is equal to that of a seaman, and he can't fancy any other, even for a woman. Isn't it true, John? Quite so, said the captain, and yet, your lordship, I must confess that Miss Grant is more in her place on the poop than reefing a topsail. For all that, I am quite flattered by her remarks. And especially when she admires the Duncan, replied Glenarvan. "'Well, really,' said Lady Glenarvan, "'you are so proud of your yacht that you make me wish to look all over it, and I should like to go down and see how our brave men are lodged.' "'Their quarters are first-rate,' replied John. "'They are as comfortable as if they were at home.' "'And they really are at home, my dear Helena,' said Lord Glenarvan. "'This yacht is a portion of our old Caledonia, a fragment of Dumbartonshire, making a voyage by special favour, so that in a manner we are still in our own country.' The Duncan is Malcolm Castle, and the ocean is Loch Lomond. Very well, dear Edward, do the honours of the castle, then. At your service, madam, but let me tell Olbinett first. The steward of the yacht was an excellent maitre d'hôtel, and might have been French for his airs of importance, but for all that he discharged his functions with zeal and intelligence. Olbinett, said his master, as he appeared in answer to his summons, we are going to have a turn before breakfast. I hope we shall find it ready when we get back. He said this just as if it had been a walk to Tarbert or Loch Katrine they were going, and the steward bowed with perfect gravity in reply. "'Are you coming with us, Major?' asked Lady Helena. "'If you command me,' replied McNabbs. "'Oh,' said Lord Glenarvan, "'the Major is absorbed in his cigar. You mustn't tear him from it. He is an inveterate smoker, Miss Mary, I can tell you. He is always smoking, even while he sleeps.' The Major gave an assenting nod, and Lord Glenarvan and his party went below. McNabbs remained alone, talking to himself, as was his habit, and was soon enveloped in still thicker clouds of smoke. He stood motionless, watching the track of the yacht. After some minutes of this silent contemplation he turned around, and suddenly found himself face to face with a newcomer. Certainly, if anything could have surprised him, this rencontre would, for he had never seen the stranger in his life before. He was a tall, thin, withered-looking man, about forty years of age, and resembled a long nail with a big head. His head was large and massive, his forehead high, his chin very marked. His eyes were concealed by enormous round spectacles, and in his look was that peculiar indecision which is common to nactalopes, or people who have a peculiar construction of the eye, which makes the sight imperfect in the day and better at night. It was evident from his physiognomy that he was a lively, intelligent man. He had not the crabbed expression of those grave individuals who never laugh on principle, and cover their emptiness with a mask of seriousness. He looked far from that. His careless, good-humoured air, and easy, unceremonious manners, showed plainly that he knew how to take men and things on their bright side. But though he had not yet opened his mouth, he gave one the impression of being a great talker, and, moreover, one of those absent folks who neither see, though they are looking, nor hear, though they are listening. He wore a travelling cap, and strong, low, yellow boots with leather gaiters. His pantaloons and jacket were of brown velvet, and their innumerable pockets were stuffed with notebooks, memorandum-books, account-books, pocket-books, and a thousand other things, equally cumbersome and useless, not to mention a telescope in addition, which he carried in a shoulder-belt. 
The stranger's excitement was a strong contrast to the major's placidity. He walked round McNabbs, looking at him and questioning him with his eyes, without eliciting one remark from the imperturbable Scotchman, or awakening his curiosity in the least, to know where he came from, and where he was going, and how he had got on board the Duncan. Finding all his efforts baffled by the major's indifference, the mysterious passenger seized his telescope, drew it out to its fullest extent, about four feet, and began gazing at the horizon, standing motionless with his legs wide apart. His examination lasted some few minutes, and then he lowered the glass, set it upon deck, and leaned on it as if it had been a walking-stick. Of course his weight shut up the instrument immediately by pushing the different parts one into the other, and so suddenly that he fell full length on the deck, and lay sprawled at the foot of the mainmast. Any one else but the major would have smiled, at least, at such a ludicrous sight, but McNabbs never moved a muscle of his face. This was too much for the stranger, and he called out, with an unmistakably foreign accent, Steward! He waited a minute, but nobody appeared, and he called again, still louder, Steward! Mr. Olbinett chanced to be passing that minute on his way from the galley, and what was his astonishment at hearing himself addressed like this by a lanky individual of whom he had no knowledge whatever? Where can he have come from? Who is he? he thought to himself. He cannot possibly be one of Lord Glenarvan's friends. However, he went up on the poop and approached the unknown personage who accosted him with the inquiry, Are you the steward of this vessel? Yes, sir, replied Olbinett, but I have not the honor. I am the passenger in cabin number six. Number six? repeated the steward. Certainly, in your name, what is it? Olbinett. Well, Olbinett, my friend, we must think of breakfast, and that pretty quickly. It is thirty-six hours since I have had anything to eat, or rather thirty-six hours that I have been asleep, pardonable enough in a man who came all the way, without stopping, from Paris to Glasgow. What is the breakfast hour? Nine o'clock, replied Olbinett, mechanically. The stranger tried to pull out his watch to see the time, but it was not till he had rummaged through the ninth pocket that he found it. Ah, well, he said, it is only eight o'clock at the present. Fetch me a glass of sherry and a biscuit while I am waiting, for I am actually falling through sheer inanition. Olbinett heard him without understanding what he meant, for the voluble stranger kept on talking incessantly, flying from one subject to another. The captain? Is the captain up yet, and the chief officer? What is he doing? Is he asleep still? It is fine weather, fortunately, and the wind is favorable, and the ship goes all alone. Just at that moment John Mangles appeared on top of the stairs. Here is the captain, said Olbinett. "'Ah! Delighted, Captain Burton, delighted to make your acquaintance.' John Mangles stood stupefied, as much at seeing the stranger on board as hearing himself called Captain Burton. But the newcomer went on in the most affable manner. "'Allow me to shake hands with you, sir, and if I did not do so yesterday evening, it was only because I did not wish to be troublesome when you were starting. But to-day, Captain, it gives me great pleasure to begin my intercourse with you.' John Mangles opened his eyes as wide as possible, and stood staring at Olbinett and the stranger alternately. But without waiting for a reply, the rattling fellow continued, "'Now the introduction is made, my dear Captain. We are old friends. Let's have a little talk, and tell me how you like the Scotia?' "'What do you mean by the Scotia?' put in John Mangles at last. "'By the Scotia? Why, the ship we're on, of course. A good ship that has been commanded to me. Not only—' for its physical qualities, but also for the moral qualities of its commander, the brave Captain Burton. You will be some relation of the famous African traveller of that name. A daring man he was, sir. I offer you my congratulations. Sir, interrupted John, I am not only no relation of Burton, the great traveller, but I am not even Captain Burton. Ah, is that so? It is Mr. Burdness, the chief officer, that I am talking to at present. "'Mr. Burdness repeated John Mangles, beginning to suspect how the matter stood. Only he asked himself whether the man was mad, or some heedless rattle-pate. He was beginning to explain the case in a categorical manner, when Lord Glenarvan and his party came up on the poop. The stranger caught sight of them directly, and exclaimed, "'Ah! the passengers! the passengers! I hope you are going to introduce me to them, Mr. Burdness." But he could not wait for any one's intervention, and going up to them with perfect ease and grace, he said, bowing to Miss Grant, Madam, then to Lady Helena, with another bow, Miss, and to Lord Glenarvan, Sir. Here John Mangles interrupted him, and said, Lord Glenarvan. My lord, continued the unknown, I beg pardon for presenting myself to you, but at sea it is well to relax the strict rules of etiquette a little, 
and that the company of these ladies will make our voyage in the Scotia appear as short as agreeable. Lady Helena and Miss Grant were too astonished to be able to utter a single word. The presence of this intruder on the poop of the Duncan was perfectly inexplicable. Lord Glenarvan was more collected, and said, "'Sir, to whom have I the honour of speaking?' to Jacques Elisin François Marie Paganel, secretary of the Geographical Society of Paris, corresponding member of the societies of Berlin, Bombay, Darmstadt, Leipzig, London, St. Petersburg, Vienna, and New York, honorary member of the Royal Geographical and Ethnographical Institute of the East Indies, who, after having spent twenty years of his life in geographical work in the study, wishes to see active service, and is on his way to India to gain for the science what information he can by following up the footsteps of great travellers. End of Book One, Chapter Six Book One, Chapter Seven of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Young. In Search of the Castaways, or the Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book One, Chapter Seven. Jacques Paganel is undeceived. The secretary of the Geographical Society was evidently an amiable personage, for all this was said in the most charming manner. Lord Glenarvan knew quite well who he was now, for he had often heard Paganel spoken of, and was aware of his merits. His geographical works, his papers on modern discoveries, inserted in the reports of the Society, and his worldwide correspondence, gave him a most distinguished place among the literati of France. Lord Glenarvan could not but welcome such a guest, and shook hands cordially. "'And now that our introductions are over,' he added, "'you will allow me, Monsieur Paganel, to ask you a question.' Twenty, my lord,' replied Paganel. "'It will always be a pleasure to converse with you.' "'Was it last evening that you came on board this vessel?' "'Yes, my lord, about eight o'clock.' I jumped into a cab at the Caledonian Railway, and from the cab into the Scotia, where I had booked my cabin before I left Paris. It was a dark night, and I saw no one on board, so I found cabin number six and went to my berth immediately, for I had heard that the best way to prevent seasickness is to go to bed as soon as you start, and not to stir for the first few days, and moreover I had been traveling for thirty hours. So I tucked myself in, and slept conscientiously, I assure you, for thirty-six hours. Paganel's listeners understood the whole mystery now of his presence on the Duncan. The French traveller had mistaken his vessel, and gone on board while the crew were attending the service at St. Mungo's. All was explained. But what would the learned geographer say when he heard the name and destination of the ship in which he had taken passage? Then it is Calcutta, Monsieur Paganel, that you have chosen as your point of departure on your travels? Yes, my lord. To see India has been a cherished purpose with me all my life. It will be the realization of my fondest dreams to find myself in the country of elephants and thugs. Then it would be by no means a matter of indifference to you to visit another country instead. No, my lord, indeed, it would be very disagreeable, for I have letters from Lord Somerset, the Governor-General, and also a commission to execute for the Geographical Society. Ah, you have a commission. Yes. I have to attempt a curious and important journey, the plan of which has been drawn up by my learned friend and colleague, Monsieur Vivien de Saint-Martin. I am to pursue the track of the Schlagenwhite brothers, and Colonels Waugh and Webb, and Hodson, and Hook and Gabbett, the missionaries, and Moorcroft, and Monsieur Jules Remy, and so many celebrated travelers. I mean to try and succeed where Crick, the missionary so unfortunately failed in 1846, in a word, I want to follow the course of the river Yaro Zangbao Chow, which waters Tibet for a distance of fifteen hundred kilometers, flowing along the northern base of the Himalayas, and to find out at last whether this river does not join itself to the Brahmapatra in the northeast of Assam. The gold medal, my lord, is promised to the traveler who will succeed in ascertaining a fact which is one of the greatest desiderata to the geography of India. Paganel was magnificent. 
He spoke with superb animation, soaring away on the wings of imagination. It would have been impossible to stop him as to stop the Rhine at the falls of Schaffhausen. Monsieur Jacques Paganel, said Lord Glenarvan, after a brief pause, that would certainly be a grand achievement, and you would confer a great boon on science. But I should not like to allow you to be laboring under a mistake any longer, and I must tell you, therefore, that for the present at least, you must give up the pleasure of a visit to India. Give it up? And why? Because you are turning your back on the Indian peninsula. What? Captain Burton! I am not Captain Burton, said John Mangles. But the Scotia! This vessel is not the Scotia. It would be impossible to depict the astonishment of Paganel. He stared first at one, and then the other, in utmost bewilderment. Lord Glenarvan was perfectly grave, and Lady Helena and Mary showed their sympathy for his vexation by their looks. As for John Mangles, he could not but suppress a smile. But the Major appeared as unconcerned as usual. At last the poor fellow shrugged his shoulders, pushed down his spectacles over his nose, and said, You are joking. But just at that very moment his eye fell on the wheel of the ship, and he saw the two words on it. Duncan Glasgow. The Duncan! The Duncan! he exclaimed with a cry of despair, and forthwith rushed down the stairs and away to his cabin. As soon as the unfortunate savant had disappeared, every one, except the major, broke out into such peals of laughter that the sound reached the ears of the sailors in the forecastle. To mistake a railway, or to take the train to Edinburgh when you want to go to Dumbarton, might happen. But to mistake a ship and be sailing for Chile when you meant to go to India, that is a blunder indeed. However, said Lord Glenarvan, I am not much astonished at it in Paganel. He is quite famous for such misadventures. One day he published a celebrated map of America and put Japan on it. But for all that, he is distinguished for his learning, and he is one of the best geographers in France. But what shall we do with the poor gentleman, said Lady Helena? We cannot take him with us to Patagonia. Why not, replied McNabbs, gravely. We are not responsible for his heedless mistakes. Suppose he were in a railway train. Would they stop it for him? No, but he would get out at the first station. Well, that is just what he can do here, too, if he likes. He can disembark at the first place where we touch. While they were talking, Paganel came up again on the poop, looking very woebegone and crestfallen. He had been making inquiry about his luggage to assure himself that it was all on board, and kept repeating incessantly the unlucky words, The Duncan! The Duncan! He could find no others in his vocabulary. He paced restlessly up and down, sometimes stopping to examine the sails, or gaze inquiringly over the wide ocean at the far horizon. At length he accosted Lord Glenarvan once more, and said, And this Duncan, where is she going? To America, Monsieur Paganel, was the reply. And to what particular part? To Concepcion. To Chile? To Chile? cried the unfortunate geographer. And my mission to India? But what will Monsieur de Quatrefage, the president of the Central Commission, say? And Monsieur de Avazek? And Monsieur Cortenbert? And Monsieur Vivian de Saint Martin? How will I show my face at the seances of the society? Come, Monsieur Paganel, don't despair. It can all be managed. You will only have to put up with a little delay, which is relatively of not much importance. The Yoro Zhang Baoshao will wait for you still in the mountains of Tibet. We will soon put in at Madeira, and you will get a ship there to take you back to Europe. Thanks, my lord. I suppose I must resign myself to it. But people will say it is a most extraordinary adventure, and it is only to me such things happen. And then, too, there is a cabin taken for me on board the Scotia. Oh, as to the Scotia, you'll have to give that up meantime. But the Duncan is a pleasure yacht, is it not? began Paganel again, after a fresh examination of the vessel. Yes, sir, said John Mangles, and belongs to Lord Glenarvan. Who begs you will draw freely on his hospitality, said Lord Glenarvan. A thousand thanks, my lord. I deeply feel your courtesy, but allow me to make one observation. India is a fine country, and can offer many a surprising marvel to travelers. These ladies, I suppose, have never seen it. Well, now, the man at the helm has only to give a turn at the wheel, and the Duncan will sail as easily to Calcutta as to Concepcion. And since it is only a pleasure trip that you are... 
His proposal was met by such grave, disapproving shakes of the head that he stopped short before the sentence was completed, and Lady Helena said, Monsieur Paganel, if we were only on a pleasure trip, I should reply, let us all go to India together, and I am sure Lord Glenarvan would not object. But the Duncan is going to bring back shipwrecked mariners who were cast away on the shores of Patagonia, and we could not alter such a destination. The Frenchman was soon put in possession of all the circumstances of the case. He was no unmoved auditor, and when he heard of Lady Helena's generous proposition, he could not help saying, Madam, permit me to express my admiration of your conduct throughout, my unreserved admiration. Let your yacht continue her course. I should reproach myself were I to cause a single day's delay. Will you join us in our search, then? asked Lady Helena. It is impossible, madame. I must fulfill my mission. I shall disembark at the first place you touch at, wherever it may be. That will be Madeira, said John Mangles. Madeira be it, then. I shall only be one hundred and eighty leagues from Lisbon, and I shall wait there for some means of transport. Very well, Monsieur Paganel, it shall be as you wish. And, for my own part, I am very glad to be able to offer you, meantime, a few days' hospitality. I only hope you will not find our company too dull. Oh, my lord, exclaimed Paganel, I am but too happy to have made a mistake which has turned out so agreeably. Still, it is a very ridiculous plight for a man to be in, to find himself sailing to America when he set out to go to the East Indies. But in spite of this melancholy reflection, the Frenchman submitted gracefully to the compulsory delay. He made himself amiable and merry, and even diverting, and enchanted the ladies with his good humor. Before the end of the day, he was friends with everybody. At his request, the famous document was brought out. He studied it carefully and minutely for a long time, and finally declared his opinion that no other interpretation of it was possible. Mary Grant and her brother inspired him with the most lively interest. He gave them great hope. Indeed, the young girl could not help smiling at his sanguine prediction of success, and this odd way of foreseeing future events. But for his mission, he would have made one of the search party for Captain Grant, undoubtedly. As for Lady Helena, when he heard that she was a daughter of William Tufnell, there was a perfect explosion of admiring epithets. He had known her father, and what letters had passed between them when William Tufnell was a corresponding member of the society. It was he himself that had introduced him and Monsieur Maltebrun. What a rencontre this was, and what a pleasure to travel with the daughter of Tufnell. He wound up by asking permission to kiss her, which Lady Helena granted, though it was, perhaps, a little improper. End of Book One Chapter 7 Recording by Bill Young Book One, Chapter 8 of In Search of the Castaways This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org In Search of the Castaways, or The Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne Book One Chapter Eight, The Geographer's Resolution. Meantime, the yacht, favored by the currents from the north of Africa, was making rapid progress towards the equator. On the thirtieth of August, they sighted the Madeira group of islands, and Glenarvan, true to his promise, offered to put in there and land his new guest. But Paganel said, "My dear lord, I won't stand on ceremony with you. Tell me, did you intend to stop at Madeira before I came on board?" "No," replied Glenarvan. Well, then, allow me to profit by my unlucky mistake. Madeira is an island too well known to be of much interest now to a geographer. Everything about this group has been said and written already. Besides, it is completely going down as far as wine-growing is concerned. Just imagine, no vines to speak of being in a Madeira. In 1813, twenty-two thousand pipes of wine were made there, and in 1845 the number fell off to two thousand six hundred sixty-nine. It is a grievous spectacle. If it is all the same to you, we might go on to the Canary Isles instead. Certainly, it will not in the least interfere with our route. I know it will not, my dear lord. In the Canary Islands, you see, there are three groups to study, besides the peak of Tenerife, which I always wish to visit. This is an opportunity, and I should like to avail myself of it, and make the ascent of the famous mountain while I am waiting for a ship to take me back to Europe. As you please, my dear Paganel, 
said Lord Glenarvan, though he could not help smiling, and no wonder, for these islands are scarcely two hundred and fifty miles from Madeira, a trifling distance for such a quick sailor as the Duncan. Next day, about two p.m., John Mangles and Paganel were walking on the poop. The Frenchman was assailing his companion with all sorts of questions about Chile, when all at once the captain interrupted him, and pointing toward the southern horizon, said, "'Monsieur Paganel? Yes, my dear captain? Be so good as to look in this direction. Don't you see anything?' "'Nothing. You're not looking in the right place. It is not on the horizon, but above it in the clouds. In the clouds I might well not see. There, there, by the upper end of the bowsprit. I see nothing. Then you don't want to see. Anyway, though we are forty miles off, yet I tell you the peak of Tenerife is quite visible yonder above the horizon. But whether Paganel could not or would not see it then, two hours later he was forced to yield to ocular evidence or own himself blind. You do see it at last, then, said John Mangles. Yes, yes, distinctly, replied Paganel, adding in a disdainful tone, and that's what they call the peak of Tenerife. That's the peak. It doesn't look like much of a height. It is eleven thousand feet, though, above the level of the sea. That is not equal to Mont Blanc. Likely enough, but when you come to ascend it, probably you'll think it high enough. Oh, ascend it! Ascend it, my dear captain! What would be the good after Humboldt and Bonplan? That Humboldt was a great genius. He made the ascent of this mountain, and has given a description of it which leaves nothing unsaid. He tells us that it comprises five different zones, the zone of the wines, the zone of the laurels, the zone of the pines, the zone of the alpine heaths, and lastly, the zone of sterility. He set his foot on the very summit, and found that there was not even room enough to sit down. The view from the summit was very extensive, stretching over an area equal to Spain. Then he went right down into the volcano, and examined the extinct crater. What could I do? I should like you to tell me, after that great man. Well, certainly, there isn't much left to glean. That is vexing, too, for you would find it dull work waiting for a vessel in the peak of Tenerife. But I say, Mangles, my dear fellow, are there no ports in the Cape Verde Islands that we might touch at? Oh, yes, nothing would be easier than putting you off at Villa Praia. And then I should have one advantage, which is by no means inconsiderable. I should find fellow countrymen at Senegal, and that is not far away from those islands. I am quite aware that the group is said to be devoid of much interest, and wild, and unhealthy, but everything is curious in the eyes of a geographer. Seeing is a science. There are people who do not know how to use their own eyes, and who travel about with as much intelligence as a shellfish. But that's not in my line, I assure you. Please yourself, Monsieur Paganel. I have no doubt geographical science will be a gainer by your sojourn in the Cape Verde Islands. We must go in there, anyhow, for coal, so your disembarkation will not occasion the least delay. The captain gave immediate orders for the yacht to continue her route, steering to the west of the Canary Group, and leaving Tenerife on her larboard. She made rapid progress, and passed the Tropic of Cancer on the 2nd of September at 5 a.m. The weather now began to change, and the atmosphere became damp and heavy. It was the rainy season, le tempo das aguas, as the Spanish call it, a trying season to travellers, but useful to the inhabitants of the African islands, who lacked trees and consequently water. The rough weather prevented the passengers from going on deck, but did not make the conversation any less animated in the saloon. On the 3rd of September Paganel began to collect his luggage to go on shore. The Duncan was already steaming among the islands. She passed Sal, a complete tomb of sand lying barren and desolate, and went on among the vast coral reefs and athwart the isle of St. Jacques, with its long chain of basaltic mountains, till she entered the port of Villa Praia and anchored in eight fathoms of water before the town. The weather was frightful and the surf excessively violent, though the bay was sheltered from the sea winds. The rain fell in such torrents that the town was scarcely visible through it. It rose on a plain in the form of a terrace, buttressed on volcanic rocks three hundred feet high. The appearance of the island through the thick veil of rain was mournful in the extreme. Lady Helena could not go on shore as she had purposed. Indeed, even coaling was a difficult business, and the passengers had to content themselves below the poop as best they might. Naturally enough, the main topic of conversation was the weather— Everybody had something to say about it except the Major, who surveyed the universal deluge with the utmost indifference. Paganel walked up and down, shaking his head. 
"'It is clear enough, Paganel,' said Lord Glenarvan, "'that the elements are against you.' "'I'll be even with them for all that,' replied the Frenchman. "'You cannot face rain like that, Monsieur Paganel,' said Lady Helena. "'Oh, quite well, madam, as far as I myself am concerned. "'It is for my luggage and instruments that I am afraid. "'Everything will be ruined.' The disembarking is the worst part of the business. Once at Villa Praya you might manage to find pretty good quarters. They won't be over-clean, and you might find the monkeys and pigs are not always the most agreeable companions. But travellers are not too particular, and, moreover, in seven or eight months you would get a ship, I dare say, to take you back to Europe. Seven or eight months!' exclaimed Paganel. "'At least. The Cape Verde Islands are not much frequented by ships during the rainy season. But you can employ your time usefully.' This archipelago is still but little known. You can go up the large rivers, suggested Lady Helena. There are none, madam. Well, then, the small ones. There are none, madam. The running brooks, then. There are no brooks, either. You can console yourself with the forests, if that's the case, put in the Major. You can't make forests without trees, and there are no trees. A charming country, said the Major. Comfort yourself, my dear Paganel. You'll have the mountains, at any rate. Oh, they are neither lofty nor interesting, my lord, and besides they have been described already. Already, said Lord Glenarvan, yes, that is always my luck. At the Canary Islands I saw myself anticipated by Humboldt, and here by Monsieur Charles St. Clair de Ville, a geologist. Impossible. It is too true, replied Paganel in a doleful voice. Monsieur de Ville was on board the government corvette, La Dicide, when she touched at the Cape Verde Islands and he explored the most interesting of the group, and went to the top of the volcano in Isle Fogo. What is left for me to do after him? It is really a great pity, said Helena. What will become of you, Monsieur Paganel? Paganel remained silent. You would certainly have done much better to have landed at Madeira, even though there had been no wine, said Glenarvan. Still, the learned secretary was silent. I should wait, said the Major, just as if he had said, I should not wait. Paganel spoke again at length, and said, "'My dear Glenarvan, where do you mean to touch next? At Concepcion. Plague it! That is the long way out of the road to India. Not it! From the moment you pass Cape Horn you are getting nearer to it. I doubt it much.' "'Beside,' resumed Lord Glenarvan, with perfect gravity, "'when people are going to the Indies it doesn't matter much whether it is to the east or west.' "'What? It does not matter much.' Without taking into account the fact that the inhabitants of the Pampas and Patagonia are as much Indians as the natives of the Punjab. Well done, my lord. That's a reason that would never have entered my head. And then, my dear Paganel, you can gain the gold medal anyway. There is as much to be done, and sought, and investigated, and discovered in the Cordilleras and in the mountains of Tibet. But the course of the Yaro Zangzu Cho, what about that? Go up the Rio Colorado and said, it is a river but little known, and its course on the map is marked out too much according to the fancy of geographers. I know it is, my dear lord, they have made grave mistakes. Oh, I make no question that the Geographical Society would have sent me to Patagonia as soon as to India, if I had sent in a request to that effect, but I never thought of it. Just like you. Come, Monsieur Paganel, won't you go with us? asked Lady Helena, in her most winning tone. Madam, my mission— "'We shall pass through the Straits of Magellan, I must tell you,' said Lord Glenarvan. "'My lord, you are a tempter. Let me add that we shall visit Port Famine.' "'Port Famine!' exclaimed the Frenchman, besieged on all sides. "'That famous port in French annals. Think, too, Monsieur Paganel, that by taking part in our enterprise you will be linking France with Scotland. Undoubtedly. A geographer would be of much use to our expedition, and what can be nobler than to bring science to the service of humanity?' "'That's well said, madam. Take my advice, then, and yield to chance, or rather providence. Follow our example. It was providence that sent us the document, and we set out in consequence. The same providence brought you on board the Duncan. Don't leave her. Shall I say yes, my good friends? Come now, tell me. You want me very much to stay, don't you?' said Paganel. "'And you're dying to stay, now, aren't you, Paganel?' returned Glenarvan. "'That's about it,' confessed the learned geographer, "'but I was afraid it would be inconsiderate.'" End of Book One, Chapter Eight Book One, Chapter Nine of In Search of the Castaways This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
In Search of the Castaways, or The Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book One, Chapter Nine. Through the Straits of Magellan. The joy on board was universal when Paganel's resolution was made known. Little Robert flung himself on his neck in such tumultuous delight that he nearly threw the worthy secretary down, and made him say, "'Rude, petit bonhomme, I'll teach him geography.' Robert bade fair to be an accomplished gentleman some day, for John Mangles was to make a sailor of him, and the major was to teach him sang froid, and Glenarvan and Lady Helena were to instill into him courage and goodness and generosity, while Mary was to inspire him with gratitude towards such instructors." The Duncan soon finished taking in coal, and turned her back on the dismal region. She fell in before long with the current from the coast of Brazil, and on the 7th of September entered the southern hemisphere. So far, then, the voyage had been made without difficulty. Everybody was full of hope, for in this search for Captain Grant, each day seemed to increase the probability of finding him. The captain was among the most confident on board, but his confidence mainly arose from the longing desire he had to see Miss Mary happy. He was smitten with quite a peculiar interest for this young girl, and managed to conceal his sentiments so well that every one on board saw it, except himself and Mary Grant. As for the learned geographer, he was probably the happiest man in all the southern hemisphere. He spent the whole day in studying maps, which were spread out on the saloon table, to the great annoyance of Mr. Obanet, who could never get the cloth laid for meals, without disputes on the subject but all the passengers took his part except the major, who was perfectly indifferent about geographical questions, especially at dinner-time. Paganel also came across a regular cargo of old books in the chief officer's chest. They were in very damaged condition, but among them he ranked out a few Spanish volumes, and determined forthwith to set to work to master the language of Cervantes, as no one on board understood it, and it would be helpful in their search along the Chilean coast. Thanks to his taste for languages, he did not despair of being able to speak the language fluently when they arrived at Concepcion. He studied it furiously, and kept constantly muttering heterogeneous syllables. He spent his leisure hours in teaching young Robert, and instructed him in the history of the country they were so rapidly approaching. On the 25th of September the yacht arrived off the Straits of Magellan, and entered them without delay. This route is generally preferred by steamers on their way to the Pacific Ocean. The exact length of the straits is three hundred and seventy-two miles. Ships of the largest tonnage find, throughout, sufficient depth of water, even close to the shore, and there is a good bottom everywhere, an abundance of fresh water, and rivers abounding in fish, and forests and game, and plenty of safe and accessible harbors. In fact, a thousand things which are lacking in Strait Lamar and Cape Horn, with its terrible rocks, incessantly visited by hurricane and tempest. For the first three or four hours, that is to say, for about sixty to eighty miles, as far as Cape Gregory, the coast on either side was low and sandy. Jacques Paganel would not lose a single point of view, nor a single detail of the straits. It would scarcely take thirty-six hours to go through them, and the moving panorama on both sides, seen in all the clearness and glory of the light of a southern sun, was well worth the trouble of looking and admiring. On the Terra del Fuego side, a few wretched-looking creatures were wandering about on the rocks, but on the other side not a solitary inhabitant was visible. Paganel was so vexed at not being able to catch a glimpse of any Patagonians, that his companions were quite amused at him. He would insist that Patagonia, without Patagonians, was not Patagonia at all. But Glenarvan replied, "'Patience, my worthy geographer, we shall see the Patagonians yet.' "'I am not sure of it.' "'But there is such a people, anyhow,' said Lady Helena. "'I doubt it much, madam, since I don't see them. "'But surely the very name Patagonia, which means great feet in Spanish, "'would not have been given to imaginary beings.' "'Oh, the name is nothing,' said Paganel, who was arguing simply for the sake of arguing. "'And besides, to speak the truth, we are not sure if that is their name.' "'What an idea!' exclaimed Glenarvan. "'Did you know that, Major?' "'No,' replied McNabbs, "'and wouldn't give a Scotch pound note for the information.' You shall hear it, however, Major Indifferent. Though Magellan called the natives Patagonians, the Fuegans called them Terramenin, the Chileans Quacalhues, the colonists of Carmen Tehuaches, the Araucans Huiliches, Bougainville gives them the name of Huaja, and Faulkner that of the Tuhelets. The name they give themselves is Inakin. Now tell me, then, how would you recognize them? Indeed, is it likely that a people with so many names has any actual existence? 
"'That's a queer argument, certainly,' said Lady Helena. "'Well, let us admit it,' said her husband, "'but our friend Paganel must own that even if there are doubts about the name of the race, there is none about their size.' "'Indeed, I will never own anything so outrageous as that,' replied Paganel. "'They are tall,' said Glenarvan. "'I don't know that. "'Are they little, then?' asked Lady Helena. "'No one can affirm that they are. "'About the average, then?' said McNabbs. "'I don't know that, either. "'That's going a little too far,' said Glenarvan. "'Travellers who have seen them tell us.' "'Travellers who have seen them,' interrupted Paganel, "'don't agree at all in their accounts. "'Magellan said that his head scarcely reached to their waist.' "'Well, then, that proves. "'Yes, but Drake declares that the English are taller than the tallest Patagonian. "'Oh, the English, that may be,' replied the Major disdainfully, "'but we are talking of the Scotch. "'Cavendish assures us that they are tall and robust,' continued Paganel. "'Hawkins makes out that they are giants. "'Lamar and Shouten declare that they are eleven feet high.' "'These are all creditable witnesses,' said Glenarvan. "'Yes, quite as much as Wood, Narboa, and Faulkner, who say that they are of medium stature. Again, Byron, Gerardes, Bougainville, Wallace, and Carteret declared that the Patagonians are six feet six inches tall. "'But what is the truth, then, among all these contradictions?' asked Lady Helena. "'Just this, madam. The Patagonians have short legs and a large bust. Or, by way of a joke, we might say that these natives are six feet high when they are sitting, and only five when they are standing.' "'Bravo, my dear geographer,' said Glenarvan. "'That is very well put.' "'Unless the race has no existence, that would reconcile all statements,' returned Paganel. "'But here is one consolation at all events. The Straits of Magellan are very magnificent, even without Patagonians.' Just at this moment the Duncan was rounding the peninsula of Brunswick between splendid panoramas. Seventy miles after doubling Cape Gregory, she left on her starboard the penitentiary of Punta Arena. The church steeple and the Chilean flag gleamed for an instant among the trees, and then the strait wound on between huge granitic masses which had an imposing effect. Cloud-capped mountains appeared, their heads white with eternal snows, and their feet hid in immense forests. Toward the southwest, Mount Tarn rose sixty-five hundred feet high. Night came on, after a long lingering twilight, the light insensibly melting away into soft folds. These brilliant constellations began to bestud the sky, and the southern cross shone out. There were numerous bays along the shore, easy of access, but the yacht did not drop anchor in any. She continued her course fearlessly through the luminous darkness. Presently ruins came in sight, crumbling buildings, which the night invested with grandeur, the sad remains of a deserted settlement, whose name will be an eternal protest against these fertile shores and forests full of game the Duncan was passing Fort Famine. It was in that very spot that Sarmiento, a Spaniard, came in 1581, with four hundred emigrants, to establish a colony. He founded the city of St. Philip, but the extreme severity of winter decimated the inhabitants, and those who had struggled through the cold died subsequently of starvation. Cavendish, the corsair, discovered the last survivor dying of hunger in the ruins." After sailing along these deserted shores, the Duncan went through a series of narrow passes, between forests of beech and ash and birch, and at length doubled Cape Forward, still bustling with the ice of the last winter. On the other side of the strait, in Terra del Fuego, stood Mount Sarmiento, towering to a height of six thousand feet, an enormous accumulation of rocks, separated by bands of cloud, forming a sort of aerial archipelago in the sky. It is at Cape Forward that the American continent actually terminates, for Cape Horn is nothing but a rock sunk in the sea in latitude fifty-two degrees. At Cape Momo the straits widened, and she was able to get round Narborough Islands and advance in a more southerly direction, till at length the rock of Cape Pillories, the extreme point of Desolation Island, came in sight, thirty-six hours after entering the straits. Before her stern lay a broad, open, sparkling ocean, which Jacques Paganel greeted with enthusiastic gestures, feeling kindred emotions with those which stirred the bosom of Ferdinand de Magellan himself, when the sails of his ship, the Trinidad, first bent before the breeze from the great Pacific. End of Book One, Chapter Nine Book One, Chapter Ten of In Search of the Castaways this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit 
dot org. Book One, Chapter Ten, The Course Decided. A week after they had doubled the Cape Pillaris, the Duncan steamed into the bay of Talcahuano, a magnificent estuary twelve miles long and nine broad. The weather was splendid. From November to March, the sky is always cloudless, and a constant south wind prevails, as the coast is sheltered by the mountain range of the Andes. In obedience to Lord Glenarvan's order, John Mangles had sailed as near the archipelago of Chilo as possible, and examined all the creeks and windings of the coast, hoping to discover some traces of the shipwreck. A broken spar or any fragment of the vessel would have put them in the right track, but nothing whatever was visible, and the yacht continued her route till she dropped anchor at the port of Tacahuano, forty-two days from the time she had sailed out of the fogs of the Clyde. Glenarvan had a boat lowered immediately, and went on shore, accompanied by Paganel. The learned geographer gladly availed himself of the opportunity of making use of the language he had been studying so conscientiously, but to his great amazement found he could not make himself understood by the people. "'It's the accent I've not got,' he said. "'Let us go to the custom-house,' replied Glenarvan. They were informed on arriving there, by means of a few English words, aided by expressive gestures, that the British consul lived at Concepcion, an hour's ride distant. Glenarvan found no difficulty in procuring two fleet horses, and he and Paganel were soon within the walls of the great city, due to the enterprising genius of Valdivia, the valiant comrade of the Pizarros. How it was shorn of its ancient splendor! Often pillaged by the natives, burned in 1819, it lay in desolation and ruins, its walls still blackened by the flames, scarcely numbering eight thousand inhabitants, and already eclipsed by Talcahuano. The grass was growing in the streets, beneath the lazy feet of the citizens, and all trade and business, indeed any description of activity, was impossible. The notes of the mandolin resounded from every balcony, and languishing songs floated on the breeze. Concepcion, the ancient city of brave men, had become a village of women and children. Lord Glenarvan felt no great desire to inquire into the causes of this decay, though Paganel tried to draw him into a discussion on the subject. He would not delay an instant, but went straight on to the house of Mr. Bentick, Her Majesty's consul, who received him very courteously, and on learning their errand undertook to make inquiries all along the coast. But to the question whether a three-mast vessel, called the Britannia, had gone ashore either on the Chilean or Arachian coast, he gave a decided negative. No report of such an event had been made to him, or any of the other consuls. Glenarvan, however, would not allow himself to be disheartened. He went back to Talcahuano, and spared neither pains nor expense to make a thorough investigation of the whole seaboard. But it was in vain. The most minute inquiries were fruitless, and Lord Glenarvan returned to the yacht to report his ill success. Mary Grant and her brother could not restrain their grief. Lady Helena did her best to comfort them by loving caresses, while Jacques Paganel took up the document and began studying it again. He had been poring over it for more than an hour when Glenarvan interrupted him and said, "'Paganel, I appeal to your sagacity. Have we made an erroneous interpretation of the document? Is there anything illogical about the meaning?' Paganel was silent, absorbed in reflection. "'Have we mistaken the place where the catastrophe occurred?' continued Glenarvan. "'Does not the name Patagonia seem apparent even to the least clear-sighted individual?' Paganel was still silent. "'Besides,' said Glenarvan, "'does not the word Indian prove we are right?' "'Perfectly so,' replied McNabbs. "'And is it not evident, then, that at the moment of writing the words, the shipwrecked men were expecting to be made prisoners by the Indians?' "'I take exception to that, my lord,' said Paganel, "'and even if your other conclusions are right, this, at least, seemed to me irrational.' "'What do you mean?' asked Lady Helena, while all eyes were fixed on the geographer. "'I mean this,' replied Paganel, "'that Captain Grant is now a prisoner among the Indians, and I further add that the document states it unmistakably.' "'Explain yourself, sir,' said Mary Grant. "'Nothing is plainer, dear Mary. Instead of reading the document Serrant Prisonnier, read Sont Prisonnier, and the whole thing is clear.' "'But that is impossible,' replied Lord Glenarvan. "'Impossible? And why, my noble friend?' asked Paganel, smiling. "'Because the bottle could only have been thrown into the sea just when the vessel went to pieces on the rocks, and consequently the latitude and longitude given refer to the actual place of the shipwreck.' 
"'There is no proof of that,' replied Paganel, "'and I see nothing to preclude the supposition that the poor fellows were dragged into the interior by the Indians, and sought to make known the place of their captivity by means of this bottle. Except this fact, my dear Paganel, that there was no sea, and therefore they could not have flung the bottle into it. "'Unless they flung it into rivers which ran into the sea,' returned Paganel. This reply was so unexpected, and yet so admissible, that it made them all completely silent for a minute, though their beaming eyes betrayed the rekindling of hope in their hearts. Lady Helena was the first to speak. "'What an idea!' she exclaimed. "'And what a good idea!' was Paganel's naive rejoinder to her exclamation. "'What would you advise, then?' said Glenarvan. "'My advice is to follow the thirty-seventh parallel from the point where it touches the American continent to where it dips into the Atlantic, without deviating from it half a degree, and possibly in some part of its course we shall fall in with the shipwrecked party.' "'There is a poor chance of that,' said the Major. "'Poor as it is,' returned Paganel, "'we ought not to lose it. If I am right in my conjecture that the bottle has been carried into the sea on the bosom of some river, we cannot fail to find the track of the prisoners.' You can easily convince yourselves of this by looking at the map of the country. He unrolled a map of Chile and the Argentine provinces as he spoke, and spread it out on the table. Just follow me for a moment, he said, across the American continent. Let us make stride across the narrow strip of Chile, and over the Corderias of the Andes, and get into the heart of the Pampas. Shall we find any lack of rivers and streams and currents? No, for here are the Rio Negro and the Rio Colorado, and their tributaries intersected by the thirty-seventh parallel, and any of them might have carried the bottle on its waters. Then, perhaps, in the midst of a tribe in some Indian settlement on the shores of these almost unknown rivers, those whom I may call my friends await some providential intervention. Ought we to disappoint their hopes? Do you not all agree with me that it is our duty to go along the line my finger is pointing out at this moment on the map, and if after all we find I have been mistaken, still to keep straight on and follow the thirty-seventh parallel till we find those we seek, even if we go right round the world? His generous enthusiasm so touched his auditors that, involuntarily, they rose to their feet and grasped his hands, while Robert exclaimed, as he devoured the map with his eyes, "'Yes, my father is there!' "'And where he is,' replied Glenarvan, "'we'll manage to go, my boy, and find him.' Nothing can be more logical than Pagnell's theory, and we must follow the course he points out without the least hesitation. Captain Grant may have fallen into the hands of a numerous tribe, or his captors may be but a handful. In the latter case we shall carry him off at once, but in the event of the former, after we have reconnoitred the situation, we must go back to the Duncan on the eastern coast and get to Buenos Aires, where we can soon organize a detachment of men with Major McNabbs at their head, strong enough to tackle all the Indians in the Argentine provinces. "'That's capital, my lord,' said John Mangles, "'and may I add, there is no danger whatever crossing the continent.' "'Monsieur Paganel,' asked Lady Helena, "'you have no fear, then, that if the poor fellows have fallen into the hands of the Indians, their lives have at least been spared?' "'What a question! Why, madam, the Indians are not anthropopagi. Far from it. One of my own countrymen, Monsieur Guinard, associated with me in the Geographical Society, was three years a prisoner among the Indians in the Pampas. He had to endure sufferings and ill-treatment, but came off victorious at last. A European is a useful being in these countries. The Indians know his value, and take care of him as if he were some costly animal. "'There is not the least room, then, for hesitation,' said Lord Glenarvan. "'Go we must, and as soon as possible. What route must we take?' "'One that is both easy and agreeable,' replied Paganel, "'rather mountainous at first, and then sloping gently down to the eastern side of the Andes into a smooth plain, turfed and gravelled, quite like a garden. "'Let us see the map,' said the Major. "'Here it is, my dear McNabs. We shall go through the capital of Arancania, and cut the Cordillas by the pass of Antuco, leaving the volcano on the south, and gliding gently down the mountain sides.' past the Nequim and the Rio Colorado on the Pampas, till we reach the Sierra Tapaquin, from whence we shall see the frontier of the province of Buenos Aires. These we shall pass by, and cross over the Sierra Tandil, pursuing our search to the very shores of the Atlantic, as far as Point Medano. Paganel went through this program of the expedition without so much as a glance at the map. He was so posted up in the travels of Frezier, Molina, Humboldt, Miers, and Orbigny, that he had the geographical nomenclature at his fingers' ends, and could trust implicitly to his never-failing memory. 
"'You see, then, friend,' he added, "'that it is a straight course. "'In thirty days we shall have gone over it, "'and gained the eastern side before the Duncan, "'however little she may be delayed by the westerly winds. "'Then the Duncan is to cruise between Corrientes and Cape St. Antoine,' "'said John Mangles. "'Just so. "'And how is the expedition to be organized? asked Glenarvan. "'As simply as possible.' All there is to be done is to reconnoitre the situation of Captain Grant, and not come to gunshot with the Indians. I think that Lord Glenarvan, our natural leader, the Major, who would not yield his place to anybody, and your humble servant, Jacques Paganel. And me, interrupted Robert. Robert! Robert! exclaimed Mary. And why not? returned Paganel. Travels form the youthful mind. Yes, Robert, we four, and three of the sailors. "'And does your lordship mean to pass me by?' said John Mangles, addressing his master. "'My dear John,' replied Glenarvan, "'we leave passengers on board, those dearer to us than life, "'and who is to watch over them but the devoted captain?' "'Then we can't accompany you?' said Lady Helena, "'while a shade of sadness beclouded her eyes. "'My dear Helena, the journey will be so soon accomplished "'that it will be but a brief separation, and— "'Yes, dear, I understand, it is all right, "'and I do hope you may succeed.' "'Besides, you can hardly call it a journey,' added Paganel. "'What is it, then? "'It is just making a flying passage across the continent, "'the way a good man goes through the world, "'doing all the good he can. "'Transar beneficiendo, that is our motto.' "'This ended the discussion, if a conversation can be so called, "'where all who take part in it are of the same opinion. "'Preparations commenced the same day, "'but as secretly as possible to prevent the Indians getting scent of it.' The day of departure was fixed for the 14th of October. The sailors were all so eager to join the expedition that Glenarvan found the only way to prevent jealousy among them was to draw lots who should go. This was accordingly done, and fortune favoured the chief officer, Tom Austin, Wilson, a strong jovial young fellow, and Mulroddy, so good a boxer that he might have entered the list with Tom Sayers himself. Glenarvan displayed the greatest activity about the preparations, for he was anxious to be ready by the appointed day. John Mangles was equally busy in coaling the vessel, that she might weigh anchor at the same time. There was quite a rivalry between Glenarvan and the young captain about getting first to the Argentine coast. Both were ready on the 14th. The whole search-party assembled in the saloon to bid farewell to those who remained behind. The Duncan was just about to get under way, and already the vibration of the screws began to agitate the limpid waters of the Talcahuano. Glenarvan, Paganel, McNabbs, Robert Grant, Tom Austin, Wilson, and Mulrady stood armed with carbines and Colt's revolvers. Guides and mules awaited them at the landing stairs of the harbor. "'It is time,' said Lord Glenarvan at last. "'Go then, Edward,' said Lady Helena, restraining her emotion." Lord Glenarvan clasped her closely to his breast for an instant, and then turned away, while Robert flung his arms round Mary's neck. "'And now, friends,' said Paganel, "'let's have one good hearty shake of the hands all around, to last us till we get to the shores of the Atlantic.' This was not much to ask, but he certainly got strong enough grips to go some way towards satisfying his desire. All went on deck now, and the seven explorers left the vessel. They were soon on the quay, and as the yacht turned round to pursue her course, she came so near where they stood, that Lady Helena could exchange farewells once more. "'God help you!' she called out. "'Heaven will help us, madam,' shouted Paganel in reply, "'for you may be sure we'll help ourselves.' "'Go on,' sung out the captain to his engineer. At the same moment Lord Glenarvan gave the signal to start, and away went the mules along the coast, while the Duncan steamed out at full speed toward the broad ocean." End of Book One, Chapter Ten. Book One, Chapter Eleven of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rosanna Toronto. In Search of the Castaways or the Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book One, Chapter Eleven, Traveling in Chile. The native troops organized by Lord Glenarvan consisted of three men and a boy. The captain of the muleteers was an Englishman who had become naturalized through twenty years' residence in the country. He made a livelihood by letting up mules to travelers and leading them over the difficult passes of the cordi cordilleras, after which he gave them in the charge of a bacayano or Argentine guide. 
to whom the route through the pampas was perfectly familiar this englishman had not so far forgotten his mother tongue among mules and indians that he could not converse with his countrymen and a lucky thing it was for them as lord glenarvan found it far easier to give orders than to see them executed paganel was still unsuccessful making himself understood the catapaz as he was called in chilean had two natives called peons and a boy about twelve years of age under him the peons took care of the baggage mules and the boy led the madrina a young mare adorned with rattle and bells which walked in front followed by ten mules the travellers rode seven of these and the catapaz another the remaining two carried provisions and a few bales of goods intended to secure the good will of the cacique of the plain the peons walked according to their usual habit every arrangement had been made to ensure safety and speed for crossing the andes is something more than an ordinary journey it could not be accomplished without the help of the hardy mules of the far-famed argentine breed those reared in the country are much superior to their progenitors they are not particular about their food and only drink once a day and they can go with ease ten leagues in eight hours there are no inns along the road from one ocean to another the only viands on which travellers can regale themselves are dried meat rice seasoned with pimento and such game as may be shot and rout the torrents provide them with water in the mountains and the rivulets of in the plains which they improve by the addition of a few drops of rum and each man carries a supply of this in a bullock's horn called chiffle they have to be careful however not to indulge too freely in alcoholic drinks as the climate itself has a peculiarly exhilarating effect on the nervous system as for bedding is it, it is all contained in the saddle used by the natives called ricado the saddle is made of sheepskin tanned on one side and woolly on the other fastened by gorgeous embroidered straps wrapped in these warm coverings a traveller may sleep soundly and brave exposure to the damp nights glenarvan an experienced traveller who now knew how to adapt himself to the customs of other countries adopted the Chile chilean costume for himself and his whole party paganel and robert both alike children though of different growth were wild with delight as they inserted their heads in the national poncho an immense plaid with a hole in centre and their legs in high leather boots the mules were richly caparisoned with the arab bit in their mouths and long reins of plaited leather which served as a whip the headstall of the bridle was decorated with metal ornaments and the alforna double sacks of gay colored linen containing the day's provisions paganel distrait as usual was flung several times before he succeeded in bestriding his good steed but once in the saddle his inseparable telescope on his shoulder belt he held on well enough keeping his feet fast in the stirrups and trusting entirely to the sagacity of the beast as for robert his first attempt at mounting was successful and that proved that he had the making in him of an excellent horseman the weather was splendid as they started the sky a deep cloudless blue and yet the atmosphere so tempered by the sea breezes as to prevent any feeling of oppressive heat they marched rapidly among the winding shore of the bay of telcahueno in order to gain the extremity of the parallel thirty miles south no one spoke much the first day for the smoke of the duncan was still visible on the horizon and the pain of parting too keenly felt paganel talked to himself in spanish asking and answering questions the catapez moreover was a taciturn man naturally and had not been rather rendered loquacious by his calling he hardly spoke to his pans they understood their duties perfectly if one of the mules stopped they urged it on with a guttural cry and if that proved unavailing a good-sized pebble thrown with unerring game soon cured the animal's obstinacy if a strap got loose or a rain fell a peon came forward instantly and throwing off his poncho flung it over the beast's head 
till the accident was repaired and the march resumed the custom of the muleteers is to start immediately after breakfast about eight o'clock and not stop till they camp for the night about four p, p. m glenarvan fell in with the practice and the first halt was just as they arrived at araco situated at the very extremity of the bay to find the extremity of the thirty-seventh degree of latitude they could have required to proceed as far as the bay of carnero twenty-five miles further but the agents of glenarvan had already scoured that part of the coast and to repeat the exploration would have been useless it was therefore decided that araco should be the point of departure and they should keep on from there toward the east in a straight line since the weather was so favorable and the whole party even robert were in perfect health and altogether the journey had commenced under such favorable auspices it was deemed advisable to push forward as quickly as possible accordingly the next day they marched thirty-five miles or more and encamped at nightfall on the banks of rio bio bio the country still presented the same fertile aspect and abounded in flowers but animals of any sort only came in sight occasionally and there were no birds visible except a solitary heron or owl or a thrush or grebe flying from the falcon human beings there were none not a native appeared not even one of the guassos the degenerate offspring of indians and spaniards dashed across the plain like a shadow his flying steed dripping with blood from the cruel thrusts inflicted by the gigantic spurs of his master's naked feet it was absolutely impossible to make inquiries when there was no one to address and lord glenarvan came to the conclusion that captain grant must have been dragged right over the andes into the pampas and that it would be useless to search for him elsewhere the only thing to be done was to wait patiently and press forward with all the speed in their power on the seventeenth they set out in the usual line of march a line which it was hard work for robert to keep his ardor constantly compelled him to get ahead of the madrina to the great despair of his mule nothing but a sharp recall from glenarvan kept the boy in proper order the country now became more diversified and the rising ground indicated their approach to a mountainous district rivers were more numerous and came rushing noisily down the slopes paganel consulted his maps and when he found any of those streams not marked which often happened all the fire of a geographer burned in his veins and he would exclaim with a charming air of vexation a river which hasn't a name is like having no civil standing as no existence in the eye of geographical law he christened them forthwith without the least hesitation and marked them down on the map qualifying them with the most high-sounding adjectives he could find in the spanish language what a language he said how full and sonorous it is it is like the metal church bells are made of composed of seventy-eight parts of copper and twenty-two of tin but i say do you make any progress in it asked glenarvan most certainly my dear lord ah oh, if it wasn't the accent that wretched accent and for want of better work paganel whiled away the time along the road by practising the difficulties in pronunciation repeating all the break-jaw words he could though still making geographical observations any questions about the country that glenarvan might ask the catapes was sure to be answered by the learned frenchman before he could reply to the great astonishment of the guide who gazed at him in bewilderment about two o'clock that same day they came to a cross-road and naturally enough glenarvan inquired the name of it it is the route from jumbal to los angeles said paganel glenarvan looked at the catapes who replied quite right and then toward turning toward the geographer he added you have traveled in these parts before sir oh yes said paganel quite gravely on a mule no in an easy chair the catapes could not make him out but shrugged his shoulders and resumed his post at the head of the party at five in the evening they stopped in a gorge 
of no great depth, some miles above the little town of Loja, and encamped for the night at the foot of the Sierras, the first steeps of the great Cordilleras. End of Book One, Chapter Eleven. Book One, Chapter Twelve of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways, or The Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book One, Chapter Twelve, Eleven Thousand Feet Aloft. Nothing of importance had occurred hitherto in the passage through Chile, but all the obstacles and difficulties incident to a mountain journey were about to crowd on the travellers now. One important question had first to be settled which pass would take them over the Andes, and yet not be out of their fixed route? On questioning the catapes on the subject, he replied, There are only two practicable passes I know of in this part of the Cordilleras. The pass of Arici is one undoubtedly discovered by Valdivia Mendoza, said Paganel. Just so, and that of Villarica is the other. Precisely. Well, my good fellow, both these passes have only one fault— they take us too far out of our route, either north or south. "'Have you no other to propose?' asked the Major. "'Certainly,' replied Paganel. "'There is the pass of Antuco, on the slope of the volcano, in latitude thirty-seven degrees, thirty minutes, or, in other words, only half a degree out of our way.' "'That would do, but are you acquainted with this pass of Antuco, Catapez?' said Glenarvan. "'Yes, your lordship, I have been through it, but I did not mention it, as no one goes that way but the Indian shepherds with the herds of cattle. Oh, very well, if mares and sheep and oxen can go that way, we can, so let's start at once.' The signal for departure was given immediately, and they struck into the heart of the valley of Las Lejas, between great masses of chalk crystal. From this point the pass began to be difficult, and even dangerous. The angles of the declivities widened and the ledges narrowed, and frightful precipices met their gaze. The mules went cautiously along, keeping their heads near the ground, as if scenting the track. They marched in file. Sometimes, at a sudden bend of the road, the madrina would disappear, and the little caravan had to guide themselves by the distant tinkle of her bell. Often some capricious winding would bring the column in two parallel lines, and the catapes would speak to his peons across a crevasse of not two fathoms wide, though two hundred deep, which made them an inseparable gulf. Glenarvan followed his guide step by step. He saw that his perplexity was increasing as the way became more difficult, but did not dare to interrogate him, rightly enough, perhaps, thinking that both mules and muleteers were very much governed by instinct, and it was best to trust to them. About an hour longer the catapes kept wandering about almost at haphazard, though always getting higher up the mountains. At last he was obliged to stop short. They were in a narrow valley, one of those gorges called by the Indians quebrads, and on reaching the end a wall of porphyry rose perpendicularly before them, and barred further passage. The catapes, after vain attempts at finding an opening, dismounted, crossed his arms, and waited. Glenarvan went up to him and asked if he had lost his way. "'No, your lordship,' was the reply. "'But you are not in the pass of Antuco. "'We are. "'You are sure you are not mistaken? "'I am not mistaken. "'See, there are the remains of a fire left by the Indians, "'and there are the marks of the mares and the sheep. "'They must have gone on, then. "'Yes, but no more will go. "'The last earthquake has made the route impassable. "'To mules,' said the Major, "'but not to men. "'Ah, that's your concern. "'I have done all I could.' My mules and myself are at your service to try the other passes of the Cordillas. And would that delay us? Three days, at least. Lord Glenarvan listened silently. He saw the catapes was right. His mules could go no farther. When he talked of returning, however, Glenarvan appealed to his companions, and said, Will you go on, in spite of all the difficulty? We will follow your lordship, replied Tom Austin. And even precede you, added Paganel. What is it, after all? We have only to cross the top of the mountain chain— and once over, nothing can be easier of descent than the slopes we shall find there. When we get below, we shall find Baquanos, Argentine shepherds, who will guide us through the Pampas, and swift horses accustomed to gallop over the plains. Let's go forward, then, I say, and without a moment's hesitation. Forward! they all exclaimed. You will not go with us, then? said Glenarvan to the catapes. I'm the muleteer, was the reply. As you please, said Glenarvan. We can do without him, said Paganel. 
On the other side we shall get back to the road to Antuco, and I'm quite sure I'll lead you to the foot of the mountain as straight as the best guide in the Corderias. Accordingly, Glenarvan settled accounts with the Catipes, and bid farewell to him and his peons and mules. The arms and instruments, and a small stock of provisions, were divided among the seven travellers, and it was unanimously agreed that the ascent should recommence at once, and, if necessary, should continue part of the night. There was a very steep, winding path on the left, which the mules never would have attempted. It was toilsome work, but after two hours' exertion, and a great deal of roundabout climbing, the little party found themselves once more in the pass of Antuco. They were not far now from the highest peak of the Cordillas, but there was not the slightest trace of any beaten path. The entire region had been overturned by recent shocks of earthquake, and all they could do was to keep on climbing higher and higher. Paganel was rather disconcerted at finding no way out to the other side of the chain, and laid his account with having to undergo great fatigue before the topmost peaks of the Andes could be reached, for their mean height is between eleven and twelve thousand six hundred feet. Fortunately the weather was calm and the sky clear, in addition to the season being favorable, but in winter, from May to October, such an ascent would have been impracticable. The intense cold quickly kills travellers, and those who even manage to hold out against it fall victims to the violence of the temporales, a sort of hurricane peculiar to those regions, which yearly fills the abysses of the Cordillas with dead bodies. They went on toiling steadily upward all night, hoisting themselves up almost inaccessible plateaus, and leaping over broad, deep crevasses. They had no ropes, but arms linked in arms supplied the lack, and shoulders served for ladders. The strength now of Mulruddy and the dexterity of Wilson were taxed heavily. These two brave Scots multiplied themselves, so to speak, many a time, but for their devotion and courage the small band could not have gone on. Glenarvan never lost sight of young Robert, for his age and vivacity made him imprudent. Paganel was a true Frenchman in his impetuous ardor, and hurried furiously along. The major, on the contrary, only went as quick as was necessary, neither more nor less, climbing without the least apparent exertion. Perhaps he hardly knew, indeed, that he was climbing at all, or perhaps he fancied he was descending. The whole aspect of the region had now completely changed. Huge blocks of glittering ice, of a bluish tint on some of the declivities, stood up on all sides, reflecting the early light of morn. The ascent became very perilous. They were obliged to reconnoitre carefully before making a single step, on account of the crevasses. Wilson took the lead, and tried the ground with his feet. His companions followed exactly in his footprints, lowering their voices to a whisper, as the least sound would disturb the currents of air, and might cause the fall of the masses of snow suspended in the air seven or eight hundred feet above their heads. They had come now to the region of shrubs and bushes, which, higher still, gave place to grasses and cacti. At eleven thousand feet all trace of vegetation had disappeared. They had only stopped once, to rest and snatch a hurried meal, to recruit their strength. With superhuman courage, the ascent was then resumed amid increasing dangers and difficulties. They were forced to bestride sharp peaks and leap over chasms so deep that they did not dare to look down them. In many places wooden crosses marked the scene of some great catastrophes. About two o'clock they came to an immense barren plain, without a sign of vegetation. The air was dry, and the sky unclouded blue. At this elevation rain is unknown, and vapors only condense into snow or hail. Here and there peaks of porphyry or basalt pierce through the white winding sheet like the bones of a skeleton, and at intervals fragments of quartz or gneiss, loosened by the action of the air, fell down with a faint, dull sound, which in a denser atmosphere would have been almost imperceptible. However, in spite of their courage, the strength of the little band was giving way. Glenarvan regretted they had gone so far into the interior of the mountain, when he saw how exhausted his men had become. Young Robert held out manfully, but he could not go much further. At three o'clock Glenarvan stopped and said, "'We must rest.' He knew if he did not himself propose it, no one else would." rest rejoined paganel we have no place of shelter it is absolutely necessary however if it were only for robert no no said the courageous lad i can still walk don't stop you shall be carried my boy but we must get to the other side of the cordillas cost what it may there we may find perhaps some hut to cover us all i ask is a two hours longer march are you all of the same opinion said glenarvan 
Yes, was the unanimous reply, and Mulrady answered, I'll carry the boy. The march eastward was forthwith resumed. They had a frightful height to climb, yet to gain the topmost peaks. The rarefaction of the atmosphere produced that painful oppression known by the name of punya. Drops of blood stood on the gums and lips, and respiration became hurried and difficult. However strong the will of these brave men might be, the time came at last when their physical powers failed, and vertigo, that terrible malady in the mountains, destroyed not only their bodily strength but their moral energy. Falls became frequent, and those who fell could not rise again, but dragged themselves along on their knees. But just as exhaustion was about to make short work of any further ascent, and Glenarvan's heart began to sink as he thought of the snow lying far as the eye could reach, and of the intense cold, and saw the shadow of night fast overspreading the desolate peaks, and knew they had not a roof to shelter them, suddenly the Major stopped and said, in a calm voice, A hut! End of Book One, Chapter Twelve Book One, Chapter Three of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rosanna Taranta. In Search of the Castaways, or The Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book One, Chapter Thirteen A Sudden Descent. Any one else but McNabbs might have passed the hut a hundred times and gone all round it, and even over it, without suspecting its existence. It was covered with snow and scarcely distinguishable from the surrounding rocks, but Wilson and Mulrady succeeded in digging it out and clearing the opening after half an hour's hard work, to the great joy of the whole party, who eagerly took possession of it. They found it was a kasuka, constructed by the Indians, made of adobe a species of bricks baked in the sun. Its form was that of a cube, twelve feet on each side, and it stood on a block of basalt. A stone stair led up to the door, the only opening, and narrow as this door was, the hurricane and snow and hail found their way in when the temporales were unchained in the mountains. Ten people could easily find room in it, and though the walls might be none too water-tight in the rainy season, at this time of the year, at any rate, it was sufficient protection against the intense cold, which, according to the thermometer, was ten degrees below zero. Besides, there was a sort of fireplace in it, with a chimney of bricks, badly enough put together, certainly, but still it allowed of a fire being lighted. "'This will shelter us at any rate,' said Glenarvan even if it is not very comfortable. Providence had, has led us to it, and we can only be thankful. Why, it is a perfect palace, I call it, said Paganel. We only want flunkies and courtiers. We shall do capital here, especially when there is a good fire blazing on the hearth, for we are quite as cold as we are hungry. For my part, I would rather see a good faggot just now than a slice of venison. Well, Tom, We'll try and get some combustible or other, said Paganel. Combustibles on the top of the Cordilleras, exclaimed Mulrady, in a dubious tone. Since there is a chimney in the Kusuka, said the Major, the probability is that we shall find something to burn in it. Our friend McNabbs is right, said Glenarvan. Get everything in readiness for supper, and I'll go out and turn woodcutter. "'Wilson and I will go with you,' said Paganel. "'Do you want me?' asked Robert, getting up. "'No, my brave boy, rest yourself. "'You'll be a man when others are only children at your age,' replied Glenarvan. On reaching the little mound of porphyry, Glenarvan and two companions left the Kasuka. In spite of the perfect calmness of the atmosphere, the cold was stinging. Paganel consulted his barometer, and found that the depression of the mercury corresponded to an elevation of eleven thousand feet, only nine hundred and ten meters lower than Mount Blanc. But if these mountains had presented the difficulties of the giant of the Swiss Alps, not one of the travelers would have crossed the great chain of the New World. On reaching a little mound of porphyry, Glenarvan and Pagnell 
stopped to gaze about them and scanned the horizon on all sides. They were now on the summit of the Nevadas, of the Cordilleras, and could see over an area of forty miles. The valley of the Colorado was already sunk in shadow, and night was fast drawing her mantle over the eastern slopes of the Andes. The western side was illuminated by the rays of the setting sun, and peaks and glaciers flashed back as golden beams with dazzling radiance. On the south the view was magnificent. Across the wild valley of the Torbidos, about two miles distant, rose the volcano of Antuca. The mountain roared like some enormous monster, and vomited red smoke, mingled with torrents of sooty flame. The surrounding peaks appeared on fire. Showers of red-hot stones, clouds of reddish vapor, and rockets of lava, all combined, presented the appearance of glowing, sparkling streams. The splendor of the spectacle increased every instant as night deepened, and the whole sky became lighted up with a dazzling reflection of the blazing crater, while the sun, gradually becoming shorn of his sunset glories, disappeared like a star lost in the distant darkness of the horizon. Paganel and Glenarvan would have remained long enough gazing at the sublime struggle between the fires of earth and heaven, if the more practical Wilson had not reminded them of the business on hand. There was no wood to be found, however, but fortunately the rocks were covered with the poor, dry species of lichen. Of this they made an ample provision, as well as of a plant called Loretta, the root of which burns tolerably well. This precious combustible was carried back to the Kusuka, and heaped up on the hearth. It was a difficult matter to kindle it, though, and still more to keep it alight. The air was so rarefied that there was scarcely oxygen enough in it to support combustion. At least this was the reason assigned by the Major. By way of compensation, however, he added, water will boil at less than one hundred degrees heat. It will come to the point of ebullition before ninety-nine degrees. McNabbs was right as the thermometer proved, for it was plunged into the kettle when the water boiled, and the mercury only rose to ninety-nine degrees. Coffee was soon ready, and eagerly gulped down by everybody. The dry meat certainly seemed poor fare, and Paganel couldn't help saying, I tell you what, some grilled llama wouldn't be bad with this, would it? They say that the llama is subtle for the ox and the sheep, and I should like to know if it is in an elementary respect. What? replied the Major. You're not content with your supper, most learned Paganel. Enchanted with it, my brave Major. Still, I must confess, I should not say no to a dish of llama. You are a saberite. I plead guilty to the charge. But come now. Though you call me that, you wouldn't sulk at a beefsteak yourself, would you? Probably not. And if you were asked to lie in wait for a llama, notwithstanding the cold and the darkness, you would do it without the least hesitation? Of course, and if it will give you the slightest pleasure. His companions had hardly time to thank him for his obliging good nature, when distant and prolonged howls broke on their ear, plainly not proceeding from one or two solitary animals, but from a whole troop of and one moreover, that was rapidly approaching. Providence had sent them a supper, as well as led them to a hut. This was the geographer's conclusion, but Glenarvan damped his joy somewhat by remarking that the quadrupeds of the Cordilleras are never met with in such a high latitude. Then where can these animals come from? asked Tom Austin. Don't you hear them getting nearer? An avalanche! suggested Mulrady. Impossible, returned Baganel. That is regular howling. Let us go out and see, said Glenarvan. Yes, and be ready for hunting, replied McNabbs, arming himself with his carbine. They all rushed forthwith out of the Kashuka. Night had completely set in, dark and starry. The moon, now in her last quarter, had not yet risen. 
the peaks on the north and east had disappeared from view, and nothing was visible save the fantastic silhouette of some towering rocks here and there. The howls, and clearly the howls of terrified animals, were redoubled. They proceeded from that part of the Cordilleras which lay in darkness. What could be going on here? Suddenly a furious avalanche came down, an avalanche of living animals mad with fear. The whole plateau seemed to tremble. There were hundreds, perhaps thousands, of these animals, and in spite of the rarefied atmosphere their noise was deafening. Were they wild beasts from the Pampas, or herds of llamas and vicuanas? Glenarvan, McNabbs, Robert, Austin, and the two soldiers had just time to throw themselves flat on the ground before they swept past like a whirlwind, only a few paces distant. Paganel, who had remained standing to take advantage of his peculiar powers of sight, was knocked down in a twinkling. At the same moment the report of firearms was heard. The Major had fired, and it seemed to him that an animal had fallen close by, and that the whole herd— yelling louder than ever, had rushed down and disappeared among the declivities lighted up by the reflection of the volcano. "'Ah! I've got them!' said a voice, the voice of Paganel. "'Got what?' asked Glenarvan. "'My spectacles,' was the reply. "'One might expect to lose that much in such a tumult as this. "'You are not wounded, I hope? "'No, only knocked down. "'But by what?' "'By this,' replied the Major, holding up the animal he had killed. They all hastened eagerly into the hut to examine McNabb's prize by the light of the fire. It was a pretty creature, like a small camel without a hump. The head was small and the body flattened, the legs were long and slender, the skin fine and the hair the color of café au lait. Paganel had scarcely looked at it before he exclaimed, "'Eguinacle!' "'What sort of an animal is that?' asked Glenarvan. "'When you can eat, and it is good savory meat, I assure you. "'A dish of Olympus. "'I knew we should have fresh meat for supper, and such meat. "'But who is going to cut up the beast?' "'I will,' said Wilson. "'Well, I'll undertake to cook it,' said Paganel. "'Can we cook, then, Monsieur Paganel?' asked Robert. "'I should think so, my boy.' I'm a Frenchman, and in every Frenchman there is a cook. Five minutes afterward Paganel began to grill large slices of venison from the embers made by the use of the larietas, and in about ten minutes a dish was ready, which he served up to his companions by the tempting name of guanaco cutlets. No one stood on ceremony, but fell to with a hearty good will. To the absolute stupefaction of the geographer, however, the first mouthful was greeted with the general grimace, and such exclamations as, Tough! It is horrible! It is not edible! The poor savant was obliged to own that his cutlets could not be relished, even by hungry men. They began to banter him about his Olympian dish, and indulge in jokes at his expense, but all he cared about was to find out how it happened that the flesh of the guanaco, which was certainly good and edible food, had turned out so badly in his hands. At last light broke in on him, and he called out, "'I see through it now. Yes, I see through it. I have found out the secret now.' "'The meat was too long kept, wasn't it?' asked McNabbs quietly. "'No, but the meat had walked too much. "'How could have I, I have forgotten that?' "'What do you mean?' asked Tom Austin. "'I mean this. "'The guanaco is only good for eating when it is killed in a state of rest. "'If it has been long hunted and gone over much ground before it is captured, "'it is no longer edible.' I can affirm the fact, by the mere taste, that this animal has come a great distance, and consequently the whole herd has. You are certain of this? asked Glenarvan. Absolutely certain. But what could have frightened the creatures so, and driven them from their haunts, when they ought to have been quietly sleeping? That's the question, my dear Glenarvan. 
I could not possibly answer. Take my advice, and let us go to sleep without troubling our heads about it. I say, Major, shall we go to sleep? Yes, we'll go to sleep, Paganel. Each one thereupon wrapped himself up in his poncho, and the fire was made up for the night. Loud snores in every tune and key soon resounded from all sides of the hut, the deep bass contribution of Palganel completing the harmony. But Glenarvan could not sleep. Secret uneasiness kept him in a continual state of wakefulness. His thoughts reverted involuntarily to those frightened animals, flying in one common direction, impelled by one common terror. They could not be pursued by wild beasts for at such an elevation there were almost none to be met with, and of hunters still fewer. What terror that could have driven them among the precipices of the Andes! Glenarvan felt a presentiment of approaching danger, but gradually he fell into a half-drowsy state, and his apprehensions were lulled. Hope took the place of fear. He saw himself on the morrow of the plains of the Andes, where the search would actually commence, and perhaps success was close at hand. He thought of Captain Grant and his two sailors, and their deliverance from cruel bondage. As these visions passed rapidly through his mind, every now and then he was roused by the crackling of the fire, or sparks flying out, or some little jet of flame would suddenly flare up and illumine the faces of his slum slumbering companions. Then his presentiments returned in greater strength than before, and he listened anxiously to the sounds outside the hut. At certain intervals he fancied he could hear rumbling noises in the distance, dull and threatening like the mutterings of thunder from a storm. There surely must be a storm raging down below at the foot of the mountains. He got up and went out to sea. The moon was rising. The atmosphere was pure and calm not a cloud visible either above or below. Here and there was a passing reflection from the flames of Antuco, but neither storm nor lightning and myriads of bright stars studded the zenith. Still the rumbling noises continued. They seemed to meet together and cross the chain of the Andes. Glenarvan returned to the Kasuga more easily than ever, questioning within himself as to the connection between these sounds and the flight of the guanacos. He looked at his watch and found the time was about two in the morning. As he had no certainty, however, of any immediate danger, he did not wake his companions, who were sleeping soundly after their fatigue, and after a little dozed off himself and slumbered heavily for some hours. All of a sudden, a violent crash made him start to his feet. A deafening noise fell on his ears, like the roar of artillery. He felt the ground giving way beneath him, and the kasuka rocked to and fro and opened. He shouted to his companions, but they were already awake and tumbling pell-mell over each other. They were being rapidly dragged down a steep declivity. Day dawned and revealed a terrible scene. The form of the mountains changed in an instant. Cones were cut off. Tottering peaks disappeared as if some trap had opened at their base. Owing to a peculiar phenomenon of the Cordilleras, an enormous mass, many miles in extent, had been displaced entirely and was speeding down toward the plain. "'An earthquake!' exclaimed Paganel. He was not mistaken. It was one of those cataclysms frequent in Chile, and in this very region where Capiapo had been twice destroyed and Santiago four times laid in ruins in fourteen years. The region of the globe is so underlaid with volcanic fires, and the volcanoes of recent origin are such insufficient safety valves for the subterranean vapors that shocks are of frequent occurrence and are called by the people Tremblores, the plateau to which the seven men were clinging, holding on by tufts of lichen, and giddy and terrified in the extreme, was rushing down the declivity with the swiftness of an express, at the rate of fifty miles an hour. Not a cry was possible, nor an attempt to get off or stop. 
They could not even have heard themselves speak. The internal rumblings and crashes of the avalanches, the fall of masses of granite and basalt, and the whirlwind of pulverized snow made all communication impossible. Sometimes they went perfectly smoothly along without jolts or jerks, and sometimes, on the contrary, the plateau would reel and roll like a ship in a storm, coasting past abysses in which fragments of the mountain were falling, tearing up trees by the roots, and leveling, as if with the keen edge of an immense scythe, every projection of the declivity. How long this indescribable descent would last no one could calculate, nor what it would end in ultimately. None of the party knew whether the rest were still alive, whether one or another were not already lying in the depths of some abyss. Almost breathless with the swift motion, frozen with the cold air, which pierced through them, and blinded with the whirling snow, they gasped for breath, and became exhausted and nearly inanimate, only retaining their hold of the rocks by a powerful instinct of self-preservation. Suddenly a tremendous shock pitched them right off, and sent them rolling to the very foot of the mountain. The plateau had stopped. For some minutes no one stirred. At last one of the party picked himself up, and stood on his feet, stunned by the shock but still firm on his legs. This was the Major. He shook off the blinding snow and looked around him. His companions lay in a close circle, like the shots from a gun that had just been discharged, piled one on top of another. The Major counted them. All were there except one. That one was Robert Grant. End of Book One, Chapter Thirteen Book One Chapter Fourteen of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline. In Search of the Castaways, or The Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book One, Chapter Fourteen Providentially Rescued. The eastern side of the Cordilleras of the Andes consists of a succession of lengthened declivities, which slope down almost insensibly to the plain. The soil is carpeted with rich herbage, and adorned with magnificent trees, among which in great numbers were apple trees, planted at the time of the conquest, and golden with fruit. There were literally perfect forests of these. This district was, in fact, just a corner of fertile Normandy. The sudden transition from a desert to an oasis, from snowy peaks to verdant plains, from winter to summer, cannot fail to strike the traveler's eye. The ground, moreover, had recovered its immobility. The trembling had ceased, though there was little doubt the forces below the surface were carrying on their devastating work further on, for shocks of earthquake are always occurring in some part or other of the Andes. This time the shock had been one of extreme violence. The outline of the mountains was wholly altered, and the pompous guides would have sought vainly for the accustomed landmarks. A magnificent day had dawned. The sun was just rising from his ocean bed, and his bright eyes streamed already over the Argentine plains, and ran across to the Atlantic. It was about eight o'clock. Lord Glenarvan and his companions were gradually restored to animation by the Major's efforts. They had been completely stunned, but had sustained no injury whatever. The descent of the Cordilleras was accomplished, and as Dame Nature had conveyed them at her own expense, they could only have praised her method of locomotion if one of their number, and that one the feeblest and youngest, the child of the party, had not been missing at the roll call. The brave boy was beloved by everybody. Paganel was particularly attached to him, and so was the Major, with all his apparent coldness. As for Glenarvan, he was in absolute despair when he heard of his disappearance, and pictured to himself the child lying in some deep abyss, 
wildly crying for succor. "'We must go and look for him, and look till we find him,' he exclaimed, almost unable to keep back his tears. "'We cannot leave him to his fate. Every valley and precipice and abyss must be searched, through and through. I will have a rope fastened round my waist and go down myself. I insist upon it. You understand? I insist upon it. Heaven grant Robert may be still alive. If we lose the boy, how could we ever dare to meet the father? What right have we to save the captain at the cost of his son's life? Glenarvan's companions heard him in silence. He sought to read hope in their eyes, but they did not venture to meet his gaze. At last he said, "'Well, you hear what I say, but you make no response. "'Do you mean to tell me that you have no hope, not the slightest?' "'Again there was silence, till McNabbs asked, "'Which of you can recollect when Robert disappeared?' "'No one could say.' "'Well, then,' resumed the Major, "'you know this at any rate. "'Who was the child beside during our descent of the Cordilleras?' "'Beside me,' replied Wilson. "'Very well. Up to what moment did you see him beside you? Try, if you can remember.' "'All that I can recollect is that Robert Grant was still by my side, holding fast by a tuft of lichen, less than two minutes before the shock which finished our descent.' "'Less than two minutes? Mind what you are saying. I dare say a minute seemed a very long time to you.' Are you sure you are not making a mistake? I don't think I am. No, it was just about two minutes, as I tell you. Very well, then. And was Robert on your right or left? On my left. I remember that his poncho brushed past my face. And with regard to us, how were you placed? On the left, also. "'Then Robert must have disappeared on this side,' said the Major, turning toward the mountain and pointing toward the right. "'And I should judge,' he added, "'considering the time that has elapsed, that the spot where he fell is about two miles up. "'Between that height and the ground is where we must search, dividing the different zones among us, and it is there we shall find him.' "'Not another word was spoken.' the six men commenced their explorations, keeping constantly to the line they had made in their descent, examining closely every fissure, and going into the very depths of the abysses, choked up though they partly were with fragments of the plateau, and more than one came out again with garments torn to rags and feet and hands bleeding. For many long hours these brave fellows continued their search without dreaming of taking rest but all in vain. The child had not only met his death on the mountain, but found a grave which some enormous rock had sealed forever. About one o'clock Glenarvan and his companions met again in the valley. Glenarvan was completely crushed with grief. He scarcely spoke. The only words that escaped his lips amid his sighs were, I shall not go away. I shall not go away. No one of the party but could enter into his feeling and respect it. "'Let us wait,' said Paganel to the Major and Tom Austin. "'We will take a little rest and recruit our strength. We need it anyway, either to prolong our search or continue our route.' "'Yes, and as Edwards wishes it, we will rest. He has still hope, but what is it he hopes?' "'Who knows?' said Tom Austin. "'Poor Robert,' replied Paganel, brushing away a tear. The valley was thickly wooded, and the Major had no difficulty in finding a suitable place of encampment. He chose a clump of tall carob trees, under which they arranged their few belongings. Few indeed, for all they had were sundry wraps and firearms, and a little dried meat and rice.' Not far off there was a rio, which supplied them with water, though it was still somewhat muddy after the disturbance of the avalanche. Mulrady soon had a fire lighted on the grass and a warm, refreshing beverage to offer his master. 
but Glenarvan refused to touch it, and lay stretched on his poncho in a state of absolute prostration. So the day passed, and night came on, calm and peaceful as the preceding had been. While his companions were lying motionless, though wide awake, Glenarvan betook himself once more to the slopes of the Cordilleras, listening intently in hope that some cry for help would fall upon his ear. He ventured far up, in spite of his being alone, straining his ear with painful eagerness to catch the faintest sound, and calling aloud in an agony of despair. But he heard nothing save the beatings of his own heart, though he wandered all night on the mountain. Sometimes the major followed him, and sometimes Paganel, ready to lend a helping hand among the slippery peaks and dangerous precipices, among which he was dragged by his rash and useless imprudence. All his efforts were in vain, however, and to his repeated cries of, Robert! Robert! Echo was the only response. Day dawned, and it now became a matter of necessity to go and bring back the poor lord from the distant plateau, even against his will. His despair was terrible. Who could dare to speak of quitting this fatal valley? Yet provisions were done, and Argentine guides and horses were not far off to lead them to the Pampas. To go back would be more difficult than to go forward. Besides, the Atlantic Ocean was the appointed meeting place with the Duncan. These were strong reasons against any long delay. Indeed, it was best for all parties to continue the route as soon as possible. McNabs undertook the task of rousing Lord Glenarvan from his grief. For a long time his cousin seemed not to hear him. At last he shook his head and said almost inaudibly, Did you say we must start? Yes, we must start. Wait one hour longer. Yes, we'll wait another, replied the major. The hour slipped away, and again Glenarvan begged for longer grace. To hear his imploring tones, one might have thought him a criminal begging a respite. So the day passed on till it was almost noon. McNabbs hesitated now no longer, but, acting on the advice of the rest, told his cousin that start they must, for all their lives depended on prompt action. "'Yes, yes,' replied Glenarvan. "'Let us start. Let us start.' But he spoke without looking at McNabbs. His gaze was fixed intently on a certain dark speck in the heavens. Suddenly he exclaimed, extending his arm and keeping it motionless, as if petrified. There! There! Look! Look! All eyes turned immediately in the direction indicated so imperiously. The dark speck was increasing visibly. It was evidently some bird hovering above them. A condor, said Paganel. Yes, a condor, replied Glenarvan. Who knows? He is coming down. He is gradually getting lower. Let us wait. Paganel was not mistaken. It was assuredly a condor. This magnificent bird is the king of the southern Andes and was formerly worshipped by the Incas. It attains an extraordinary development in those regions. Its strength is prodigious. It has frequently driven oxen over the edge of precipices down into the depths of abysses. It seizes sheep, and kids and young calves browsing on the plains, and carries them off to inaccessible heights. It hovers in the air far beyond the utmost limits of human sight, and its powers of vision are so great that it can discern the smallest objects on the earth beneath. What had this condor discovered, then? Could it be the corpse of Robert Grant? Who knows? repeated Glenarvan keeping his eye immovably fixed on the bird. The enormous creature was fast approaching, sometimes hovering for a while with outspread wings, and sometimes falling with the swiftness of inert bodies in space. Presently he began to wheel round in wide circles. They could see him distinctly. He measured more than fifteen feet, and his powerful wings bore him along with scarcely the slightest effort 
for it is the prerogative of large birds to fly with calm majesty while insects have to beat their wings a thousand times a second. The Major and Wilson had seized their carbines, but Glenarvan stopped them by a gesture. The condor was encircling in his flight a sort of inaccessible plateau about a quarter of a mile up the side of the mountain. He wheeled round and round with dazzling rapidity, opening and shutting his formidable claws and shaking his cartilaginous carbuncle, or comb. "'It is there! There!' exclaimed Glenarvan. A sudden thought flashed across his mind, and with a terrible cry he called out, Fire! Fire! Oh, suppose Robert were still alive! That bird! But it was too late. The condor had dropped out of sight behind the crags. Only a second passed, a second that seemed an age, and the enormous bird reappeared, carrying a heavy load and flying at a slow rate. A cry of horror rose on all sides. It was a human body the condor had in its claws, dangling in the air and apparently lifeless. It was Robert Grant. The bird had seized him by his clothes and had him hanging already at least one hundred and fifty feet in the air. He had caught sight of the travelers and was flapping his wings violently, endeavoring to escape with his heavy prey. Oh, would that Robert were dashed to pieces against the rocks, rather than be a— He did not finish his sentence, but seizing Wilson's carbine, took aim at the condor. His arm was too trembling, however, to keep the weapon steady. Let me do it, said the major, and with a calm eye and sure hands and motionless body, he aimed at the bird, now three hundred feet above him in the air. But before he had pulled the trigger, the report of a gun resounded from the bottom of the valley. A white smoke rose from between two masses of basalt, and the condor, shot in the head, gradually turned over and began to fall, supported by his great wings spread out like a parachute. He had not let go of his prey, but gently sank down with it on the ground, about ten paces from the stream. "'We've got him!' "'We've got him!' shouted Glenarvan, and without waiting to see where the shot so providentially came from, he rushed toward the condor, followed by his companions. When they reached the spot, the bird was dead, and the body of Robert was quite concealed beneath his mighty wings. Glenarvan flung himself on the corpse, and, dragging it from the condor's grasp, placed it flat on the grass, and knelt down and put his ear to the heart. But a wilder cry of joy never broke from human lips than Glenarvan uttered the next moment, as he started to his feet and exclaimed, He is alive! He is still alive! The boy's clothes were stripped off in an instant, and his face bathed with cold water. He moved slightly, opened his eyes, looked round, and murmured, Oh, my lord, is it you? he said. My father! Glenarvan could not reply. He was speechless with emotion, and kneeling down by the side of the child so miraculously saved, burst into tears. End of Book One, Chapter Fourteen Recording by Roger Moline Book One, Chapter Fifteen of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways, or The Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book One, Chapter Fifteen, Thalcave. Robert had no sooner escaped one terrible danger than he ran the risk of another scarcely less formidable. He was almost torn to pieces by his friends, for the brave fellows were so overjoyed at the sight of him, that in spite of his weak state, none of them would be satisfied without giving him a hug. However, it seemed as if rough hugging did not hurt sick people, at any rate it did not hurt Robert, but quite the contrary. But the first joy of deliverance over, the next thought was, who was the deliverer? Of course it was the Major who suggested looking for him, and he was not far off 
for about fifty paces from the rio a man of very tall stature was seen motionless on the lowest crags at the foot of the mountain a long gun was lying at his feet he had broad shoulders and long hair bound together with leather thongs he was over six feet in height his bronzed face was red between the eyes and mouth black by the lower eyelids and white on the forehead he wore the costume of the patagonians on the frontiers consisting of a splendid cloak ornamented with scarlet arabesques made of the skins of the guanaco sewed together with ostrich tendons and with the silky wool turned up on the edge under this mantle was a garment of fox skin fastened round the waist and coming down to a point in front a little bag hung from his belt containing colours for painting his face his boots were pieces of oxhide fastened round the ankles by straps across this patagonian had a splendid face indicating real intelligence notwithstanding the medley of colours by which it was disfigured his waiting attitude was full of dignity indeed to see him standing grave and motionless on his pedestal of rocks one might have taken him for a statue of sang froid as soon as the major perceived him he pointed him out to glenarvan who ran toward him immediately the patagonian came two steps forward to meet him and glenarvan caught hold of his hand and pressed it in his own it was impossible to mistake the meaning of the action for the noble face of the scotch lord so beamed with gratitude that no words were needed the stranger bowed slightly in return and said a few words that neither glenarvan nor the major could understand the patagonian surveyed them attentively for a few minutes and spoke again in another language but the second idiom was no more intelligible than the first certain words however caught glenarvan's ear as sounding like spanish a few sentences of which he could speak. Espanol? he asked. The Patagonian nodded in reply, a movement of the head which has an affirmative significance among all nations. That's good, said the Major. Our friend Paganel will be the very man for him. It is lucky for us that he took it into his head to learn Spanish. Paganel was called forthwith. He came at once and saluted the stranger with all the grace of a Frenchman but his compliments were lost on the Patagonian, for he did not understand a single syllable. However, on being told how things stood, he began in Spanish, and opening his mouth as wide as he could, the better to articulate, said, Vos sois un homme de bem. You are a brave man. The native listened, but made no reply. He doesn't understand, said the geographer. Perhaps you haven't the right accent, suggested the major. That's just it. Confound the accent. Once more Paganel repeated his compliments, but with no better success. "'I'll change the phrase,' he said, and in slow, deliberate tones he went on, "'Sam duvida un patago, a Patagonian, undoubtedly. No response still. Dizem, said Paganel. "'Answer me.' But no answer came. "'Vos compriendes? Do you understand?' shouted Paganel, at the very top of his voice, as if he would burst his throat. Evidently the Indian did not understand, for he replied in Spanish, No comprendo, I do not understand. It was Paganel's turn now to be amazed. He pushed his spectacles right down over his nose, as if greatly irritated, and said, I'll be hanged if I can make out one word of his infernal patois. It's a Rakanian, that's certain. Not a bit of it, said Glenarvan. It was Spanish he spoke. And addressing the Patagonian, he repeated the word, Espanol? Spanish? si sí, si sí. yes yes replied the indian paganel's surprise became absolute stupefaction the major and his cousin exchanged sly glances and mcnab said mischievously with a look of fun on his face ah ah my worthy friend is this another of your misadventures you seem to have quite a monopoly of them what said paganel pricking up his ear yes it's clear enough the man speaks spanish he yes he certainly speaks spanish Perhaps it is some other language you have been studying all this time, instead of— But Paganel would not allow him to proceed. He shrugged his shoulders and said stiffly, You go a little too far, Major. Well, how is it that you don't understand him, then? Why, of course, because the man speaks badly, replied the learned geographer, getting impatient. He speaks badly, that is to say, because you can't understand him, returned the Major coolly. Come, come, McNabs, put in Glenarvan. Your supposition is quite inadmissible. However distraught our friend Paganel is, it is hardly likely he would study one language for another. Well, Edward, or rather you, my good Paganel, explain it then. I explain nothing. I give proof. 
Here is the book I use daily, to practice myself in the difficulties of the Spanish language. Examine it for yourself, Major, he said, handing him a volume in a very ragged condition, which he had brought up, after a long rummage, from the depths of one of his numerous pockets. Now you can see whether I am imposing on you, he continued indignantly. And what's the name of this book? asked the Major, as he took it from his hands. The Lucidides, an admirable epic which— The Lucidides! exclaimed Glenarvan. Yes, my friend, the Lucidides of the great Camons, neither more nor less. Camons, repeated Glenarvan, but Paganel, my unfortunate fellow, Camons was a Portuguese. It is Portuguese you have been learning for the last six weeks. Camons, Lucidides, Portuguese! Paganel could not say more. He looked vexed, while his companions, who had gathered round, broke out in a furious burst of laughter. The Indian never moved a muscle of his face. He quietly awaited the explanation of this incomprehensible mirth. "'Fool! Idiot that I am!' at last uttered Paganel. "'Is it really a fact? You are not joking with me. It is what I have actually been doing. Why, it is a second confusion of tongues like Babel. Ah, me! Alack a day! My friends, what is to become of me? To start for India and arrive at Chile! To learn Spanish and talk Portuguese! Why, if I go on like this, some day I shall be throwing myself out of the window instead of my cigar!' To hear Paganel bemoan his misadventures and see his comical discomfiture would have upset any one's gravity. Besides, he set the example himself, and said, "'Laugh away, my friends, laugh as loud as you like. You can't laugh at me half as much as I laugh at myself.' "'But I say,' said the Major, after a minute, "'this doesn't alter the fact that we have no interpreter.' "'Oh, don't distress yourself about that,' replied Paganel. "'Portuguese and Spanish are so much alike that I made a mistake, but this very resemblance will be a great help toward rectifying it. In a short time I shall be able to thank the Patagonian in the language he speaks so well. Paganel was right. He soon managed to exchange a few words with the stranger, and found out even that his name was Thalcave, a word that signified in Araucanian the thunderer. This surname had, no doubt, come from his skill in handling firearms. But what rejoiced Glenarvan most was to learn that he was a guide by occupation, and, moreover, a guide across the Pampas. To his mind, the meeting with him was so providential that he could not now doubt of the success of their enterprise. The deliverance of Captain Grant seemed an accomplished fact. When the party went back to Robert, the boy held out his arms to the Patagonian, who silently laid his hand on his head, and proceeded to examine him with the greatest care, gently feeling each of his aching limbs. Then he went down to the Rio, and gathered a few handfuls of wild celery, which grew on the banks, with which he rubbed the child's body all over. He handled him with the most exquisite delicacy, and his treatment so revived the lad's strength, that it was soon evident that a few hours' rest would set him all right. It was accordingly decided that they should encamp for the rest of the day and the ensuing night. Two grave questions, moreover, had to be settled, where to get food and means of transport. Provisions and mules were both lacking. Happily, they had Thalcave, however, a practised guide, and one of the most intelligent of his class. He undertook to find all that was needed, and offered to take him to a tolderia of Indians, not further than four miles off at most, where he could get supplies of all he wanted. This proposition was partly made by gestures, and partly by a few Spanish words which Paganel managed to make out. His offer was accepted, and Glenarvan and his learned friends started off with him at once. They walked at a good pace for an hour and a half, and had to make great strides to keep up with the giant Thalcave. The road lay through a beautiful fertile region, abounding in rich pasturages, where a hundred thousand cattle might have fed comfortably. Large ponds, connected by an invisible labyrinth of rios, amply watered these plains and produced their greenness. Swans with black heads were disporting in the water, disputing possession with the numerous intruders which gambled over the lanos. The feathered tribes were of most brilliant plumage, and of marvellous variety and deafening noise. The Issacus, a graceful sort of dove with grey feathers streaked with white, and the yellow cardinals, were flitting about in the trees like moving flowers, while overhead pigeons, sparrows, chingolos, bugueros, and monguitas were flying swiftly along, rending the air with their piercing cries. Paganel's admiration increased with every step, and he had nearly exhausted his vocabulary of adjectives by his loud exclamations, to the astonishment of the Patagonian, to whom the birds and the swans and the prairies were everyday things. The learned geographer was so lost in delight that he seemed hardly to have started before they came in sight of the Indian camp, 
or Tolderia, situated in the heart of a valley. About thirty nomadic Indians were living there in rude cabins made of branches, pasturing immense herd of milch cows, sheep, oxen, and horses. They went from one prairie to another, always finding a well-spread table for their four-footed guests. These nomads were a hybrid type of Arucans, Pehuenches, and Aucas. They were Ando-Peruvians of an olive tint, of medium stature and massive form, with a low forehead, almost circular face, thin lips, high cheekbones, effeminate features, and cold expression. As a whole they are about the least interesting of the Indians. However, it was their herds Glenarvan wanted, not themselves. As long as he could get beef and horses, he cared for nothing else. Thalcave did the bargaining. In exchange for seven ready-saddled horses of the Argentine breed, one hundred pounds of charqui, or dried meat, several measures of rice, and leather bottles for water, the Indians agreed to take twenty ounces of gold, as they could not get wine or rum, which they would have preferred, though they were perfectly acquainted with the value of gold. Glenarvan wished to purchase an eighth horse for the Patagonian, but he gave him to understand that it would be useless. They got back to the camp in less than half an hour, and were hailed with acclamations by the whole party, or rather the provisions and horses were. They were all hungry, and ate heartily of the welcome viands. Robert took a little food with the rest. He was fast recovering strength. The close of the day was spent in complete repose and pleasant talk about the dear absent ones. Paganel never quitted the Indian's side. It was not that he was so glad to see a real Patagonian, by whom he looked a perfect pygmy, a Patagonian who might have almost rivalled the Emperor Maximi, and that Congo negro seen by the learned Vanderbrock, both eight feet high. But he caught up Spanish phrases from the Indian and studied the language without a book this time, gesticulating at a great rate all the grand sonorous words that fell on his ear. "'If I don't catch the accent,' he said to the Major, "'it won't be my fault. But who would have said to me that it was a Patagonian who would teach me Spanish one day?' End of Book One, Chapter Fifteen Book One, Chapter Sixteen of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways, or The Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book One, Chapter Sixteen The News of the Lost Captain. Next day, the twenty second of October, at eight o'clock in the morning, Thalcave gave the signal for departure. Between the twenty-second and forty-second degrees the Argentine soil slopes eastward, and all the travellers had to do was follow the slope right down to the sea. Glenarvan had supposed Thalcave's refusal of a horse was that he preferred walking, as some guides do, but he was mistaken, for just as they were ready the Patagonian gave a peculiar whistle, and immediately a magnificent steed of the pure Argentine breed came bounding out of a grove close by at his master's call. Both in form and colour the animal was of perfect beauty. The Major, who was a thorough judge of all good points of a horse, was loud in his admiration of this sample of the Pampas breed, and considered that, in many respects, he greatly resembled an English hunter. This splendid creature was called Thauca, a word in Patagonian which means bird, and he well deserved the name. Thalcave was a consummate horseman, and to see him on his prancing steed was a sight worth looking at. The saddle was adapted to the two hunting weapons in common use on the Argentine plains, the bolas and the lasso. The bolas consists of three balls fastened together by a strap of leather, attached to the front of the recado. The Indians fling them often at the distance of a hundred feet from the animal or enemy of which they are in pursuit, and with such a precision that they catch round their legs and throw them down in an instant. It is a formidable weapon in their hands, and one they handle with surprising skill. The lazo is always retained in the hand. It is simply a rope, thirty feet long, made of tightly twisted leather, with a slip knot at the end, which passes through an iron ring. This noose was thrown by the right hand, while the left keeps fast hold of the rope, the other end of which is fastened to the saddle. A long carbine, on the shoulder belt, completed the accoutrements of the Patagonian. He took his place at the head of the party, quite unconscious of the admiration he was exciting, and they set off going alternately at a gallop and walking pace, for the trot seemed altogether unknown to them. Robert proved to be a bold rider, and completely reassured Glenarvan as to his ability to keep his seat. The pampas commenced at the very foot of the cordilleras. 
they may be divided into three parts. The first extends from the chain of the Andes, and stretches over an extent of two hundred and fifty miles, covered with stunted trees and bushes. The second four hundred and fifty miles is clothed with magnificent herbage, and stops about one hundred and eighty miles from Buenos Aires. From this point to the sea, the foot of the traveller treads over immense prairies of luzerne and thistles, which constitute the third division of the Pampas. On issuing from the gorges of the Cordilleras, Glenarvan and his band came first to plains of sand, called Medanos, lying in ridges like waves of the sea, and so extremely fine that the least breath of wind agitated the light particles, and sent them flying in clouds, which rose and fell like water-spouts. It was a spectacle which caused both pleasure and pain, for nothing could be more curious than to see the said water-spouts wandering over the plain, coming in contact and mingling with each other, and falling and rising in wild confusion. But on the other hand, nothing could be more disagreeable than the dust which was thrown off by these innumerable medanos, which was so impalpable that, close one's eyes as they might, it found its way through the lids. This phenomenon lasted the greater part of the day. The travellers made good progress, however, and about four o'clock the Cordilleras lay full forty miles behind them, the dark outlines being already almost lost in the evening mists. They were all somewhat fatigued with the journey, and glad enough to halt for the night on the banks of the Nequam, called Ramid, or Camo, by certain geographers, a troubled, turbulent, rapid flowing between high red banks. No incident of any importance occurred that night or the following day. They rode well and fast, finding the ground firm, and the temperature bearable. Toward noon, however, the sun's rays were extremely scorching, and when evening came, a bar of clouds streaked the southwest horizon, a sure sign of a change in the weather. The Patagonian pointed it out to the geographer, who replied, "'Yes, I know,' and turning to his companions added, "'See, a change of weather is coming. We are going to have a taste of Pampero.' and he went on to explain that this pampero is very common in the Argentine plains. It is an extremely dry wind which blows from the southwest. Thalcave was not mistaken, for the pampero blew violently all night, and was sufficiently trying to poor fellows only sheltered by their ponchos. The horses lay down on the ground, and the men stretched themselves beside them in a close group. Glenarvan was afraid they would be delayed by the continuance of the hurricane, but Paganel was able to reassure him on that score, after consulting his barometer. The Pampero generally brings a tempest which lasts three days, and may be always foretold by the depression of the mercury, he said, but when the barometer rises, on the contrary, which is the case now, all we need expect is a few violent blasts. So you can make your mind easy, my good friends, by sunrise the sky will be quite clear again. "'You talk like a book, Paganel,' replied Glenarvan. "'And I am one, and what's more, you are welcome to turn over my leaves whenever you like.' The book was right. At one o'clock the wind suddenly lulled, and the weary men fell asleep and woke at daybreak, refreshed and invigorated. It was the twentieth of October, and the tenth day since they had left Talcahuano. They were still ninety miles from the point where the Rio Colorado crosses the thirty-seventh parallel, that is to say, about two days' journey.' Glenarvan kept a sharp lookout for the appearance of any Indians, intending to question them, through Thalcave, about Captain Grant, as Paganel could not speak to him well enough for this. But the track they were following was one little frequented by the natives, for the ordinary routes across the Pampas lie further north. If by chance some nomadic horseman came in sight far away, he was off again like a dart, not caring to enter into conversation with strangers. To a solitary individual, a little troop of eight men, all mounted and well armed, wore a suspicious aspect, so that any intercourse either with honest men or even banditti was almost impossible. Glenarvan was regretting this exceedingly, when he unexpectedly met with a singular justification of his rendering of the eventful document. In pursuing the course the travellers had laid down for themselves, they had several times crossed the routes over the plains in common use, but had struck into none of them. Hitherto Thalcave had made no remark about this. He understood quite well, however, that they were not bound for any particular town or village or settlement. Every morning they set out in a straight line toward the rising sun, and went on without the least deviation. Moreover, it must have struck Thalcave that instead of being the guide he was guided, yet with true Indian reserve, he maintained absolute silence. But on reaching a particular point, he checked his horse suddenly and said to Paganel, "'The Carmen route,' "'Yes, my good Patagonian,' replied Paganel in his best Spanish, "'the route from Carmen to Mendoza. 
We are not going to take it? No, replied Paganel. Where are we going, then? Always to the east. That's going nowhere. Who knows? Thalcave was silent, and gazed at the geographer with an air of profound surprise. He had no suspicion that Paganel was joking, for an Indian is always grave. You are not going to Carmen, then? he added, after a moment's pause. No. Nor to Mendoza? No, nor to Mendoza. Just then Glenarvan came up to ask the reason of the stoppage, and what he and Thalcave were discussing. He wanted to know whether we were going to Carmen or Mendoza, and was very surprised at my negative reply to both questions. Well, certainly it must seem strange to him. I think so. He says we are going nowhere. Well, Paganel, I wonder if it is possible to make him understand the object of our expedition, and what our motive is for always going east. That would be a difficult matter, for an Indian knows nothing about degrees, and the finding of the document would appear to him a mere fantastic story. Is it the story he would not understand, or the storyteller? said McNabbs quietly. Ah, McNabbs, I see you have small faith in my Spanish yet. Well, try it, my good friend. So I will. And turning around to the Patagonian, he began his narrative, breaking down frequently for the want of a word, and the difficulty of making certain details intelligible to a half-civilized Indian. It was quite a sight to see the learned geographer. He gesticulated and articulated, and so worked himself up over it, that the big drops of sweat fell in a cascade down his forehead onto his chest. When his tongue failed, his arms were called to aid. Paganel got down on the ground and traced a geographical map on the sand, showing where the lines of latitude cross, and where the two oceans were, along which the Carmen route led. Thalcave looked on composedly, without giving any indication of comprehending or not comprehending. The lesson lasted half an hour, when the geographer left off, wiped his streaming face, and waited for the Patagonian to speak. "'Does he understand?' said Glenarvan. "'That remains to be seen, but if he doesn't, I give it up,' replied Paganel. Thalcave neither stirred nor spoke. His eyes remained fixed on the lines drawn in the sand, now becoming fast effaced by the wind. Well, said Paganel to him at length. The Patagonian seemed not to hear. Paganel fancied he could detect an ironical smile already on the lips of the Major, and determined to carry the day, was about to recommence his geographical illustrations, when the Indian stopped him by a gesture and said, You are in search of a prisoner? Yes, replied Paganel. And just on this line between the setting and rising sun, added Thalcave, speaking in Indian fashion of the route from west to east, "'Yes, that's it. And it's your God,' continued the guide, "'that has sent you the secret of this prisoner on the waves. God himself.' "'His will be accomplished, then,' replied the native almost solemnly. "'We will march east, and if it needs be, to the sun.' Paganel, triumphing in his pupil, immediately translated his replies to his companions, and exclaimed, "'What an intelligent race! All my explanations would have been lost on nineteen in every twenty peasants in my own country.' Glenarvan requested him to ask the Patagonian if he had heard of any foreigners who had fallen into the hands of the Indians of the Pampas. Paganel did so, and waited an answer. Perhaps I have. The reply was no sooner translated than the Patagonian found himself surrounded by the seven men, questioning him with eager glances. Paganel was so excited he could hardly find words, and he gazed at the grave Indian as if he could read the reply on his lips. Each word spoken by Thalcave was instantly translated, so that the whole party seemed to hear him speak in their mother tongue. "'And what about the prisoner?' asked Paganel. "'He was a foreigner. You have seen him?' "'No, but I have heard the Indians speak of him. He is brave. He has the heart of a bull.' "'The heart of a bull?' said Paganel. "'Ah, this magnificent Patagonian language. You understand him, my friends. He means a courageous man.' "'My father!' exclaimed Robert Grant, and turning to Paganel, he asked what this Spanish was for, "'Is it my father?' "'Es mio padre,' replied the geographer. Immediately taking Thalcave's hands in his own, the boy said, in a soft tone, "'Es mio padre.' "'Suo padre,' replied the Patagonian, his face lighting up. He took the child in his arms, lifted him up on his horse, and gazed at him with peculiar sympathy. His intelligent face was quite full of feeling." But Paganel had not completed his interrogations. This prisoner, who was he? What was he doing? When had Thalcave heard of him? All these questions poured upon him at once. He had not long to wait for an answer, and learned that the European was a slave in one of the tribes that roamed the country between the Colorado and the Rio Negro. 
But where was the last place he was in? With the cacique Calfacora. In the line we have been following? Yes. And who is this cacique? The chief of the Poyuches Indians, a man with two tongues and two hearts. That's to say, false in speech and false in action, said Paganel, after he had translated this beautiful figure of the Patagonian language. And can we deliver our friend? he added. You may, if he is still in the hands of the Indians. And when did you last hear of him? A long while ago. The sun has brought two summers since then to the Pampas. The joy of Glenarvan cannot be described. This reply agreed perfectly with the date of the document, but one still remained for him to put to Thalcave. You spoke of a prisoner, but were there not three? I don't know, said Thalcave. And do you know nothing of his present situation? Nothing. This ended the conversation. It was quite possible that the three men had become separated long ago, but still this much was certain, that the Indians had spoken of a European that was in their power, and the date of the captivity, and even the descriptive phrase about the captive, evidently pointed to Harry Grant. End of Book One, Chapter Sixteen Book One, Chapter Seventeen of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways, or the Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book One, Chapter Seventeen A Serious Necessity. The Argentine Pampas extend from the thirty fourth to the fortieth degree of southern latitude. The word pampa, of Araucanian origin, signifies grass plain, and justly applies to the whole region. The mimosas growing on the western part, and the substantial herbage on the eastern, give those plains a peculiar appearance. The soil is composed of sand and red or yellow clay, and this is covered by a layer of earth in which the vegetation takes root. The geologist would find rich treasures in the tertiary strata here, for it is full of antediluvian remains, enormous bones, which the Indians attribute to some gigantic race which lived in a past age. The horses went on at a good pace through the thick Paja Brava, the grass of the Pampas, par excellence, so high and thick that the Indians find shelter in it from storms. At certain distances, but increasingly seldom, there were wet, marshy spots, almost entirely under water where the willows grew, and a plant called the Gignarium argentium. Here the horses drank their fill greedily, as if bent on quenching their thirst for the past, present, and future. Thalcave went first to beat the bushes and frighten away the cleaners, a most dangerous species of viper, the bite of which killed an ox in less than an hour. For two days they plodded steadily across this arid and deserted plain. The dry heat became severe. There were not only no rios, but even the ponds dug out by the Indians were dried up. As the drought seemed to increase with every mile, Paginal asked Thalcave when he expected to come to water. "'At Lake Salinas,' replied the Indian. "'And when shall we get there?' "'Tomorrow evening.' When the Argentines travel in the Pampas, they generally dig wells and find water a few feet below the surface. But the travellers could not fall back on this resource, not having the necessary implements. They were therefore obliged to husband the small provision of water they still had left, and deal it out in rations, so that if no one had enough to satisfy his thirst, no one felt it too painful. They halted at evening, after a course of thirty miles, and eagerly looked forward to a good night's rest to compensate for the fatigue of day. But their slumbers were invaded by a swarm of mosquitoes which allowed them no peace. Their presence indicated a change of wind which shifted to the north. A south or south-west wind generally puts to flight these little pests. Even these petty yields of life could not ruffle the Major's equanimity, but Paginal, on the contrary, was perfectly exasperated by such trifling annoyances. He abused the poor mosquitoes desperately, and deplored the lack of some acid lotion which would have eased the pain of their stings. The Major did his best to console him by reminding him of the fact they only had to do with one species of insect among the three hundred thousand naturalists reckon. He would listen to nothing, and got up in very bad temper. He was willing to start at daybreak, however, for they had to get to Lake Salinas before sundown. The horses were tired out and dying for water, and though their riders had stinted themselves for their sakes, still their ration was very insufficient. The drought was constantly increasing, and the heat none the less for the wind being north, this wind being the simoom of the pampas. There was a brief interruption this day to the monotony of the journey. 
Mulready, who was in front of the others, rode hastily back to report the approach of a troop of Indians. The news was received with very different feelings by Glenarvan and Thalcave. The Scotchman was glad of the chance of gleaning some information about his shipwrecked countrymen, while the Patagonian hardly cared to encounter the nomadic Indians of the prairie, knowing their bandit propensities. He rather sought to avoid them, and gave orders to his party to have their arms in readiness for any trouble. Presently the nomads came into sight, and the Patagonian was reassured at the finding they were only ten in number. They came within a hundred yards of them, and stopped. This was near enough to observe them distinctly. They were fine species of the native races, which had been almost entirely swept away in 1833 by General Rosas, a tall in stature, with arched forehead and olive complexion. They were dressed in guanaco skins, and they carried lances twenty feet long, knives, slings, bolas, and lassoes, and, by their dexterity in the management of their horses, showed themselves to be accomplished riders. They appeared to have stopped for the purpose of holding a council with each other, for they shouted and gesticulated at a great rate. Glenarvan determined to go up to them, but he had no sooner moved forward than the whole band wheeled round and disappeared with incredible speed. It would have been useless for the travellers to attempt to overtake them with such worn-out horses. "'The cowards!' exclaimed Paganel. "'Haste comes off too quick for honest folks,' said McNabbs. "'Who are these Indians, Thalcave?' asked Paganel. "'Gauchos.' "'The gauchos!' cried Paganel, and, turning to his companions, he added, "'We need not have been so much on our guard. There was nothing to fear.' "'How is that?' asked McNabbs. "'Because the gauchos are inoffensive peasants.' "'You believe that, Paganel?' "'Certainly I do. They took us for robbers and fled in terror.' "'I rather think they did not dare to attack us,' replied Glenarvan, "'much vexed at not being able to enter into some sort of communication with those Indians, whatever they were.' "'That's my opinion, too,' said the Major. "'For if I am not mistaken, instead of being harmless, the gauchos are formidable out-and-out bandits.' "'The idea!' exclaimed Paganel, and forthwith commenced a lively discussion of this ethnological thesis, so lively that the Major became excited, and quite contrary to his usual suavity, said bluntly, "'I believe you are wrong, Paganel.' "'Wrong?' replied Paginal. "'Yes. Thalcave took them for robbers, and he knows what he is talking about.' "'Well, Thalcave was mistaken this time,' retorted Paginal, somewhat sharply. "'The gauchos are agriculturalists and shepherds, and nothing else. "'As I have stated in a pamphlet on the natives of the Pampas, written by me, which has attracted some notice.' "'Well, well, you have committed an error, that's all, Monsieur Paginal.' "'What, Monsieur McNabbs? You tell me that I have committed an error?' "'an inadvertence, if you like, which you can put among the errata in your next edition.' Paginal, highly incensed at his geographical knowledge being brought into question, and even jested about, allowed his ill-humour to get the better of him, and said, "'No, sir, that my books have no need of such errata.' "'Indeed? Well, on this case they have, at any rate,' retorted McNabbs, quite as obstinate as his opponent. "'Sir, I think you are very annoying to-day, and I think you are very crabbed.' Glenarvan thought it was high time to interfere, for the discussion was getting too hot, so he said, "'Come now, there is no doubt that one of you is very teasing, and the other is very crabbed, and I must say I am surprised at both of you.' The Patagonian, without understanding the cause, could see that the two friends were quarrelling. He began to smile and said, quietly, "'It's the north wind.' "'The north wind?' exclaimed Paginal. "'What's the north wind got to do with it?' "'Oh, it's just that,' said Glenarvan. "'It's the north wind that has put you in a bad temper. "'I have heard that, in South America, the wind greatly irritates the nervous system.' "'By St. Patrick, Edward, you are right,' said the Major, laughing heartily. "'But Paginal, in a towering rage, would not give up the contest, "'and turned upon Glenarvan, whose intervention in this jesting manner he resented. "'And so, my lord, my nervous system is irritated,' he said. "'Yes, Paginal, it is the north wind, a wind which causes many a crime in the Pampas.' as the tramontane does in the Campania of Rome. "'Crimes?' returned the geographer. "'Do I look like a man that would commit crimes?' "'That's not exactly what I said.' "'Tell me at once that I want to assassinate you.' "'Well?' Oh, "'I am really afraid,' replied Glenarvan, bursting into an uncontrollable fit of laughter, in which all the others joined. Paginal said no more, but went off in front alone, and came back in a few minutes quite himself, as if he had completely forgotten his grievance." At eight o'clock in the morning, Thalcave, who was considerably in advance of the rest, descried in the distance the much-desired lake, and in less than a quarter of an hour they reached its banks. But a grievous disappointment awaited them. 
the lake was dried up. End of Book One, Chapter Seventeen. Book One, Chapter Eighteen of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways, or The Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book One, Chapter Eighteen, In Search of Water. Lake Salinas ends the string of lagoons connected with the Sierras Ventana and Guamini. Numerous expeditions were formerly made there from Buenos Aires to collect the salt deposited on its banks, as the waters contain great quantities of chloride of sodium. But when Thalcave spoke of the lake as supplying drinkable water, he was thinking of the rios of fresh water which run into it. Those streams, however, were all dried up also, and the burning sun had drunk up everything liquid, and the consternation of the travellers may be imagined at the discovery. Some action must be taken immediately, however, for what little water still remained was almost bad, and could not quench thirst. Hunger and fatigue were forgotten in the face of this imperious necessity. A sort of leather tent, called a ruka, which had been left by the natives, afforded the party a temporary resting-place, and the weary horses stretched themselves along the muddy banks, and tried to browse on the marine plants and dry reeds they found there, nauseous to the taste as they must have been. As soon as the whole party were ensconced in the ruka, Paginal asked Thalcave what he thought was best to be done. A rapid conversation followed, a few words of which were intelligible to Glenarvan. Thalcave spoke calmly, but the lively Frenchman gesticulated enough for both. After a little, Thalcave sat silent and folded his arms. "'What does he say?' asked Glenarvan. "'I fancied he was advising us to separate.' "'Yes, into two parties. Those of us whose horses are so done out with fatigue and thirst that they can scarcely drag one leg after the other.' are to continue the route as best they can, while the others, whose steeds are fresher, are to push on in advance toward the river Guamini, which throws itself into Lake San Lucas about thirty-one miles off. If there should be water enough in the river, they are to wait on the banks till their companions reach them, but should it be dried up, they will hasten back and spare them a useless journey. "'And what will we do then?' asked Austin. "'Then we shall have to make up our minds to go seventy-two miles south, as far as the commencement of the Sierra Ventana, where the rivers abound.' It is wise counsel, and we will act upon it without loss of time. My horse is intolerable, good trim, and I volunteer to accompany Thalcave. Oh, my lord, take me, said Robert, as if it were a question of some pleasure party. But would you be able for it, my boy? Oh, I have a fine beast, which just wants to have a gallop. Please, my lord, to take me. Come then, my boy, said Glenarvan, delighted not to leave Robert behind. If we three don't manage to find out fresh water somewhere, he added, we must be very stupid. "'Well, well, what about me?' said Paginal. "'Oh, my dear Paginal, you must stay with the reserve corps,' replied the Major. "'You are too well acquainted with the thirty-seventh parallel and the river Guamini, and the whole pampas for us to let you go. Neither Mulready, nor Wilson, nor myself would be able to rejoin Thalcave at the given rendezvous, but we would put ourselves under the banner of the brave Jacques Paginal with perfect confidence.' "'I resign myself,' said the geographer, much flattered at having supreme command.' "'But, Paginal, no distractions,' added the Major. "'Don't you take us to the wrong place, to the borders of the Pacific, for instance?' "'Oh, you insufferable Major, it would serve you right,' replied Paginal, laughing. "'But how will you manage to understand what Thalcave says, Glenarvan?' he continued. "'I suppose,' replied Glenarvan, "'the Patagonian and I won't have much to talk about. "'Besides, I know a few Spanish words, and, at a pinch, "'I should not fear either making him understand me or my understanding him. "'Go, then, my worthy friend.' "'We'll have supper first, rejoined Glenarvan, "'and then sleep, if we can, till it is starting time.' "'The supper was not very reviving without drink of any kind, "'and they tried to make up for the lack of it by a good sleep. "'But Paginal dreamed of water all night, "'of torrents and cascades, of rivers and ponds, "'and streams and brooks. "'In fact, he had a complete nightmare. "'Next morning, at six o'clock, "'the horses of Thalcave, Glenarvan, and Robert were got ready. "'The last ration of water was given to them, and drunk with more avidity than satisfaction, for it is filthy, disgusting stuff. The three travellers then jumped onto their saddles and set off, shouting au revoir to their companions. "'Don't come back, whatever you do,' called Paginal after them. The Desertio de las Salinas, which they had come to traverse, is a high plain, covered with stunted trees not above ten feet high, and small mimosas, which the Indians call curamamel, 
and jumez, a bushy shrub rich in soda. Here and there large spaces were covered with salt, which sparkled in the sunlight with astonishing brilliancy. These might easily have been taken for sheets of ice, had not the intense heat forbidden the illusion, and the contrast between these dazzling white sheets presented the dry, burned-up ground gave the desert a most peculiar character. Eighty miles south, on the contrary, the Sierra Ventana, toward which the travellers might possibly have to betake themselves should the Guamini disappoint their hopes, the landscape was totally different. There the fertility is splendid, the pasturage is incomparable. Unfortunately, to reach them would necessitate a march of one hundred and thirty miles south, and this was why Thalcave thought it best to go first to Guamini, as it was not only much nearer, but also on the direct line of route. The three horses went forward, might and main, as if instinctively knowing whither they were bound. Thayuka especially displayed a courage that neither fatigue nor hunger could damp. He bounded like a bird over the dried-up Canadas and the bushes of the Kuramamal, his loud, joyous neighing seeming to bode success to the search. The horses of Glenavon and Robert, though not so light-footed, felt the spur of his example and followed him bravely. Thalcave inspirited his companions as much as Thayuka did his four-footed brethren. He sat motionless in the saddle, but often turned his head to look at Robert, and ever and anon gave him a shout of encouragement and approval, as he saw how well he rode. Certainly the boy deserved praise, for he was fast becoming an excellent cavalier. "'Bravo, Robert,' said Glenavon. "'Thalcave is evidently congratulating you, my boy, and paying you compliments.' "'What for, my lord?' "'For your good horsemanship.' "'I can hold firm on, that's all,' replied Robert, blushing with pleasure at such an encomium. "'That is the principal thing, Robert, and you are too modest. I tell you that some day you will turn out to be an accomplished horseman.' "'What would Papa say to that?' said Robert, laughing. "'He wants me to be a sailor.' "'The one won't hinder the other. "'If all cavaliers wouldn't make good sailors, "'there is no reason why all sailors should not make good horsemen. "'To keep one's footing on the yards must teach a man to hold on firm, "'and, as to managing the reins and making a horse go through all sorts of movements, "'that's easily acquired. Indeed it comes naturally.' "'Poor father,' said Robert, "'how he will thank you for saving his life.' "'You love him very much, Robert?' "'Yes, my lord, dearly. "'He was so good to me and my sister. "'We were his only thought.' and whenever he came home from his voyages we were sure of some souvenir from all the places he had been to, and, better still, of loving words and caresses. Ah, if you knew him you would love him too. Mary is most like him. He has a soft voice like hers. That's strange for a sailor, isn't it? Yes, Robert, very strange. I see him still, the boy went on, as if speaking to himself. Good brave papa. He put me to sleep on his knee, crooning an old Scotch ballad about the locks of our country. The time sometimes comes back to me, but very confused-like. So it does to Mary, too. Ah, oh, my lord, how we loved him. Well, I do think one needs to be little to love one's father like that. Yes, and to be grown up, my child, to venerate him, replied Glenavon, deeply touched by the boy's genuine affection. During this conversation the horses had been slackening speed, and were only walking now. You will find him, said Robert again, after a few minutes' silence. "'Yes, we will find him,' was Glenavon's reply. "'Thalcave has set us on the track, and I have some great confidence in him.' "'Thalcave is a brave Indian, isn't he?' said the boy. "'That indeed he is. "'Do you know something, my lord? "'What is it, and then I will tell you. "'That all the people you have with you are brave. "'Lady Helena, who I love so, and the Major with his calm manner, "'and Captain Mangles and Monsieur Paganel, and all the sailors on the Duncan. "'How courageous and devoted they are! "'Yes, my boy, I know that,' replied Glenavon. "'And you know that you are the best of all?' "'No, most certainly I don't know that.' "'Well, it is time you did, my lord,' said the boy, seizing his lordship's hand and covering it with kisses. Glenavon shook his head, but said no more, as a gesture from Thalcave made them spur on their horses and hurry forward. But it was soon evident that, with the exception of Thayuka, the wearied animals could not go quicker than a walking pace. At noon they were obliged to let them rest for an hour. They could not go on at all, and refused to eat the alfaferas, a poor burnt-up sort of lucern that grew there. Glenavon began to be uneasy. Tokens of sterility were not the least on the decrease, and the want of water might involve serious calamities. Thalcave said nothing, thinking probably that it would be time enough to despair if the Guamini should be dried up, if, indeed, the heart of an Indian can ever despair. Spur and whip had both to be employed to induce the poor animals to resume the route, 
and then they only crept along, for their strength was gone. Theuka, indeed, could have galloped swiftly enough, and reached the Rio in a few hours, but Thalke would not leave his companions behind, alone in the midst of a desert. It was hard work, however, to get the animal to consent to walk quietly. He kicked and reared and neighed violently, and was subdued at last by his master's voice more than hand. Thalke positively talked to the beast, and Theuka understood perfectly, though unable to reply, for, after a great deal of arguing, the noble creature yielded, though he still champed a bit. Thalcave did not understand Theuka, it turned out, though Theuka understood him. The intelligent animal felt humidity in the atmosphere, and drank it in with frenzy, moving and making a noise with his tongue, as if taking deep draughts of some cool, refreshing liquid. The Patagonian could not mistake him now. Water was not far off. The two other horses seemed to catch their comrade's meaning, and, inspired by his example, made a last effort and galloped forward after the Indian. About three o'clock a white line appeared in the dip of the road, and seemed to tremble in the sunlight. "'Water!' explained Glenavan. "'Yes, yes, it's water!' shouted Glenavan. They were right, and the horses knew it too, for there was no need now to urge them on. They tore over the ground as if mad, and in a few minutes had reached the river, and plunged in up to their chests. Their masters had to go on too, whether they would or not, but they were so rejoiced at being able to quench their thirst that this compulsory bath was no grievance. "'Oh, how delicious this is!' explained Robert, taking a deep draught. "'Drink moderately, my boy,' said Glenavan, but he did not set the example. Thalcave drank very quietly, without hurrying himself, taking small gulps, but as long as a lazo, as the Patagonians say. He seemed as if he were never going to leave off, and really there was some danger of his swallowing up the whole river. At last Glenavan said, "'Well, our friends won't be disappointed this time. They will be sure of finding clear, cool water when they get here. That is to say, if Thalcave leaves any for them. But couldn't we go to meet them? It would spare them several hours suffering and anxiety. You're right, my boy, but how could we carry them this water? The leather bottles were left with Wilson. No, it is better for us to wait for them, as we agreed. They can't be here till the middle of the night, so the best thing we can do is to get a good bed and a good supper ready for them. Thalcave had not waited for Glenavan's proposition to prepare the encampment. He had been fortunate enough to discover on the banks of the Rio Aramada a sort of enclosure, which had served as a fold for flocks, and was shut in on three sides. A more suitable place could not be found for the night's lodging, provided they had no fear of sleeping in the open air beneath the starlit heavens, and none of Thalcave's companions had much solicitude on that score. Accordingly they took possession at once, and stretched themselves at full length on the ground in the bright sunshine to dry their dripping garments. "'Well, now, we've secured a lodging, and we must think of supper,' said Glenavan. "'Our friends must not have reason to complain of the couriers they sent to precede them, and if I am not much mistaken they will be very satisfied. It strikes me that an hour's shooting won't be lost time. Are you ready, Robert?' "'Yes, my lord,' replied the boy, standing up, gun in hand. Why Glenavan proposed this was, that the banks of the Guamini seemed to be the general rendezvous of the game in the surrounding plains. A sort of partridge peculiar to the Pampas, called the Tinamou, black wood-hens, a species of plover called Turu Turu, yellow rays and waterfowl with magnificent green plumage, rose in coveys. No quadrupeds, however, were visible, but Thalcave pointed to the long grass and thick brushwood, and gave his friends to understand that they were lying there in concealment. Disdaining the feathered tribes when more substantial game was at hand, the hunters' first shots were fired into the underwood. Instantly there rose by the hundred roebucks and guanacos, like those that had swept over them that terrible night in the Cordilleras. But the timid creatures were so frightened that they were all out of gunshot in a twinkling. The hunters were obliged to content themselves with a humbler game, though in an alimentary point of view nothing better could be wished. A dozen of red partridges and rays were speedily brought down, and Glenavan also very cleverly managed to kill a te tetra or peccary, a pachydermatous animal, the flesh of which is excellent eating. In less than half an hour the hunters had all the game they required. Robert had killed a curious animal belonging to the order Indentita, an armadillo, a sort of tattoo, covered with a hard bony shell in movable pieces, and measuring a foot and a half long. It was very fat and would make an excellent dish, the Patagonian said. Robert was very proud of his success. Thalcave did his part by patching a nandu, a species of ostrich, remarkable for its extreme swiftness. There could be no entrapping such an animal, and the Indian did not attempt it. He urged Thayuka to a gallop and made a direct attack knowing that if the first aim missed, the Nandu would soon tire out horse and rider by involving them in an inextricable labyrinth of windings. 
The moment, therefore, that Thalcave got to the right distance, he flung his burlas with such a powerful hand, and so skilfully, that he caught the bird round the legs, and paralyzed his efforts at once. In a few seconds it lay flat on the ground. The Indian had not made his capture for the mere pleasure and glory of such a novel chase. The flesh of a Nandu is highly esteemed, and Thalcave felt bound to contribute his share to the common repast. They returned to the Ramada, bringing back the string of partridges, the ostrich, the peccary, and the armadillo. The ostrich and the peccary were prepared for cooking by divesting them of their tough skins and cutting them into thin slices. As to the armadillo, he carries his cooking apparatus with him, and all that had to be done was to place him in his own shell over the glowing embers. The substantial dishes were reserved for the night-comers, and the three hunters contented themselves with devouring the partridges, and washed down their meal with clear fresh water, which was pronounced superior to all the porter in the world, even to the famous highland uskabor or whisky. The horses had not been overlooked. A large quantity of dry fodder was discovered lying heaped up in the Ramada, and this was supplied to them amply with both food and bedding. When all was ready, the three companions wrapped themselves in the ponchos, and stretched themselves on an eiderdown of alfalfares, the usual bed of hunters in the pampas. End of Book One, Chapter Eighteen In Search of the Castaways by Jules Verne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Anna Roberts. In Search of the Castaways or The Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book One, Chapter Nineteen The Red Wolves. Night came, but the orb of night was invisible to the inhabitants of the earth, for she was just in her first quarter. The dim light of the stars was all that illumined the plain. The waters of the Guamini ran silently, like a sheet of oil over a surface of marble. Birds, quadrupeds, and reptiles were resting motionless after the fatigues of the day, and the silence of the desert brooded over the far-spreading pampas. Glenarvan, Robert, and Thalcave had followed the common example, and lay in profound slumber on their soft couch of lucerne. The worn-out horses had stretched themselves full length on the ground, except Thauka, who slept standing, true to his high blood, proud in repose as in action, and ready to start at his master's call. Absolute silence reigned within the enclosure, over which the dying embers of the fire shed a fitful light. However, the Indian's sleep did not last long. For about ten o'clock he woke, sat up, and turned his ear toward the plain, listening intently, with half-closed eyes. An uneasy look began to depict itself on his usually impassive face. Had he caught scent of some party of Indian marauders, or of jaguars, water-tigers, and other terrible animals that haunt the neighborhood of rivers? Apparently it was the latter, for he threw a rapid glance on the combustible materials heaped up in the enclosure, and the expression of anxiety on his countenance seemed to deepen. This was not surprising, as the whole pile of valfafares would soon burn out, and could only ward off the attacks of wild beasts for a brief interval. There was nothing to be done in the circumstances but wait, and wait he did, in a half-recumbent posture, his head leaning on his hands, and his elbows on his knees, like a man roused suddenly from his night's sleep. A whole hour passed, and any one except Thalcave would have lain down again on his couch, reassured by the silence round him. But where a stranger would have suspected nothing, the sharpened senses of the Indian detected the approach of danger. As he was thus watching and listening, Thauka gave a low neigh and stretched his nostrils toward the entrance of the ramada. This startled the Patagonian, and made him rise to his feet at once. Thauka sense an enemy, he said to himself, going toward the opening, to make careful survey of the plains. Silence still prevailed, but not tranquillity, for Thalcave caught a glimpse of shadows moving noiselessly over the tufts of Kuramamel. Here and there luminous spots appeared, dying out and rekindling constantly, in all directions, like fantastic lights dancing over the surface of an immense lagoon. An inexperienced eye might have mistaken them for fireflies, which shine at night in many parts of the pampas. But Thalcave was not deceived. He knew the enemies he had to deal with, and lost no time in loading his carbine and taking up his post in front of the fence. He did not wait for long for a strange cry— a confused sound of barking and howling broke over the pampas, followed next instant by the report of the carbine, which made the uproar a hundred times worse. Glenarvan and Robert woke in alarm and started to their feet instantly. "'What is it?' exclaimed Robert. "'Is it the Indians?' asked Glenarvan. 
No, replied Thalcave, the Aguaras. Aguaras, said Robert, looking inquiringly at Glenarvan. Yes, replied Glenarvan, the red wolves of the Pampas. They seized their weapons at once, and stationed themselves beside the Patagonian, who pointed toward the plain from whence the yelling resounded. Robert drew back involuntarily. "'You are not afraid of wolves, my boy?' said Glenarvan. "'No, my lord,' said the lad in a firm tone. "'And, moreover, beside you I am afraid of nothing.' "'So much the better. These aguaras are not very formidable either, and if it were not for their number I should not give them a thought. "'Never mind. We are all well armed. Let them come.' "'We'll certainly give them a warm reception,' rejoined Glenarvan. His lordship only spoke thus to reassure the child, for a secret terror filled him at the sight of this legion of bloodthirsty animals let loose on them at midnight. There might possibly be some hundreds, and what could three men do, even armed to the teeth, against such a multitude? As soon as Thalcave said the word Aguara, Glenarvan knew that he meant the Red Wolf, for this is the name given to it by the Pampas Indians. This voracious animal, called by naturalists the Canis jubatus, is in shape like a large dog, and has the head of a fox. Its fur is a reddish cinnamon color, and there is a black mane all down the back. It is a strong, nimble animal, generally inhabiting marshy places, and pursuing aquatic animals by swimming, prowling about by night, and sleeping during the day. Its attacks are particularly dreaded at the estancias, or sheep stations, as it often commits considerable ravages, carrying off the finest of the flock. Singly, the aguara is not much to be feared, but they generally go in immense packs, and one had better have to deal with a jaguar or cougar than with them. Both from the noise of the howling and the multitude of shadows leaping about, Glenarvan had a pretty good idea of the number of the wolves, and he knew that they had scented a good meal of human flesh or horse flesh, and none of them would go back to their dens without a share. It was certainly a very alarming situation to be in. The assailants were gradually drawing closer. The horses displayed signs of the liveliest terror, with the exception of Thauka, who stamped his foot and tried to break loose and get out. His master could only calm him by keeping up a low, continuous whistle. Glenarvan and Robert had posted themselves so as to defend the opening of the ramada. They were just going to fire into the nearest ranks of the wolves when Thalcave lowered their weapons. "'What does Thalcave mean?' asked Robert. "'He forbids our firing. And why?' "'Perhaps he thinks it is not the right time.' But this was not the Indian's reason, and so Glenarvan saw when he lifted the powder flask, showed him it was nearly empty. "'What's wrong?' asked Robert. "'We must husband our ammunition,' was the reply." "'Today's shooting has cost us dear, and we are short of powder and shot. "'We can't fire more than twenty times.' "'The boy made no reply, and Glenarvan asked him if he was frightened. "'No, my lord,' he said. "'That's right,' returned Glenarvan. "'A fresh report resounded that instant. "'Thalcave had made short work of one assailant more audacious than the rest, "'and the infuriated pack had retreated to within a hundred steps of the enclosure.' On a sign from the Indian, Glenarvan took his place, while Thalcave went back into the enclosure, and gathered up all the dried grass and alfafares, and, indeed, all the combustibles he could rake together, and made a pile of them at the entrance. Into this he flung one of the still-glowing embers, and soon the bright flame shot up into the dark night. Glenarvan could now get a good glimpse of his antagonists, and saw that it was impossible to exaggerate their numbers or their fury. The barrier of fire just raised by Thalcave had redoubled their anger, though it had cut off their approach. Several of them, however, urged on by the hindmost ranks, pushed forward into the very flames and burned their paws for their pains. From time to time another shot had to be fired, notwithstanding the fire, to keep off the howling pack, and in the course of an hour fifteen dead animals lay stretched on the prairie. The situation of the besieged was, relatively speaking, less dangerous now. As long as the powder lasted, and the barrier of fire burned on, there was no fear of being overmastered. But what was to be done afterward, when both means of defense failed at once? Glenarvan's heart swelled as he looked at Robert. He forgot himself in thinking of this poor child, as he saw him showing a courage so far above his years. Robert was pale, but he kept his gun ready, and stood with firm foot ready to meet the attacks of the infuriated wolves. However, after Glenarvan had calmly surveyed the actual state of affairs, he determined to bring things to a crisis. "'In an hour's time,' he said, "'we shall neither have powder nor fire. It will never do to wait till then before we settle what to do.' 
Accordingly, he went up to Thalgave, and tried to talk to him by the help of the few Spanish words his memory could muster, though their conversation was often interrupted by one or the other having to fire a shot. It was no easy task for the two men to understand each other, but most fortunately Glenarvan knew a great deal of the peculiarities of the Red Wolf, otherwise he could never have interpreted the Indian's words and gestures. As it was, fully a quarter of an hour elapsed before he could get any answer from Thalcave to tell Robert in reply to his inquiry. "'What does he say?' "'He says that at any price we must hold out till daybreak. The Aguara only prowls about at night, and goes back to his lair with the first streak of dawn. It is a cowardly beast that loves the darkness and dreads the light. An owl on four feet.' "'Very well. Let us defend ourselves, then, till morning.' "'Yes, my boy, and with knife thrusts when gun and shots fail.' Already Falcave had set the example, for whenever a wolf came too near the burning pile, the long arm of the Patagonian dashed through the flames and came out again reddened with blood. But very soon this means of defence would be at an end. About two o'clock Falcave flung his last armful of combustibles into the fire, and barely enough powder remained to load a gun five times. Glenarvan threw a sorrowful glance round him. He thought of the lad standing there, and of his companions and those left behind, whom he loved so dearly. Robert was silent. Perhaps the danger seemed less imminent to his imagination. But Glenarvan thought for him, and pictured to himself the horrible fate that seemed to await him inevitably. Quite overcome by his emotion, he took the child in his arms, and, straining him convulsively to his heart, pressed his lips on his forehead, while tears he could not restrain streamed down his cheeks. Robert looked up into his face with a smile, and said, I am not frightened. No, my child, no, and you are right. In two hours daybreak will come, and we shall be saved. Bravo, Thalcave! My brave Patagonian, bravo! He added, as the Indian that moment leveled two enormous beasts who endeavored to leap across the barrier of flames. But the fire was fast dying out, and the denouement of the terrible drama was approaching. The flames got lower and lower. Once more the shadows of night fell on the prairie, and the glaring eyes of the wolves glowed like phosphorescent balls in the darkness. A few minutes longer, and the whole pack would be in the enclosure. Falcave loaded his carbine for the last time, killed one more enormous monster, and then folded his arms. His head sank on his chest, and he appeared buried in deep thought. Was he planning some daring, impossible, mad attempt to repulse the infuriated horde? Glenarvan did not venture to ask. At this very moment the wolves began to change their tactics. The deafening howls suddenly ceased. They seemed to be going away. Gloomy silence spread over the prairie, and made Robert exclaim, "'They're gone!' But Falcave, guessing his meaning, shook his head. He knew they would never relinquish their sure prey till daybreak made them hasten back to their dens. Still, their plan of attack had evidently been altered. They no longer attempted to force the entrance, but their new maneuvers only heightened the danger. They had gone round the Ramada, as by common consent, and were trying to get in on the opposite side. The next minute they heard their claws attacking the moldering wood, and already formidable paws and hungry savage jaws had found their way through the palings. The terrified horses broke loose from their halters and ran about the enclosure, mad with fear. Glenarvan put his arms round the young lad, and resolved to defend him as long as his life held out. Possibly he might have made a useless attempt at flight when his eye fell on Thalcave. The Indian had been stalking about the Ramada like a stag, when he suddenly stopped short, and, going up to his horse, who was trembling with impatience, began to saddle him with the most scrupulous care, without forgetting a single strap or buckle. He seemed no longer to disturb himself in the least about the wolves outside, though their yells had redoubled in intensity. A dark suspicion crossed Glenarvan's mind as he watched him. "'He is going to desert us!' he exclaimed at last as he saw him seize the reins as if preparing to mount. He never, replied Robert. Instead of deserting them, the truth was that the Indian was going to try and save his friends by sacrificing himself. Thaouka was ready, and stood champing his bit. He reared up, and his splendid eyes flashed fire. He understood his master. But just as the Patagonian caught hold of the horse's mane, Glenarvan seized his arm with a convulsive grip, and said, pointing to the open prairie, "'You are going away?' "'Yes,' replied the Indian, understanding his gesture. Then he said a few words in Spanish, which meant, "'Thauca, good horse, quick, will draw all the wolves away after him.' "'Oh, Thalcave!' exclaimed Glenarvan. 
"'Quick, quick!' replied the Indian, while Glenarvan said in a broken, agitated voice to Robert, "'Robert, my child, do you hear him? He wants to sacrifice himself for us. He wants to rush away over the Pampas, and turn off the wolves from us by attracting them to himself.' "'Friend Thalcave,' returned Robert, throwing himself at the feet of the Patagonian, "'Friend Thalcave, don't leave us.' "'No,' said Glenarvan, "'he shall not leave us.' And turning toward the Indian, he said, pointing to the frightened horses, "'Let us go together.' "'No,' replied Thalcave, catching his meaning. "'Bad beasts, frightened. Thauca, good horse.' "'Be it so, then,' returned Glenarvan. "'Thalcave will not leave you, Robert. He teaches me what I must do. It is for me to go, and for him to stay by you.' Then, seizing Thauca's bridle, he said, "'I am going, Thalcave, not you.' "'No,' replied the Patagonian quietly. "'I am!' exclaimed Glenarvan, snatching the bridle out of his hands. "'I myself! Save this boy, Thalcave! I commit him to you!' Glenarvan was so excited that he mixed up English words with his Spanish. But what mattered the language at such a terrible moment? A gesture was enough. The two men understood each other. However, Thalcave would not give in, and though every instant's delay but increased the danger, the discussion continued. Neither Glenarvan nor Thalcave appeared inclined to yield. The Indian had dragged his companion towards the entrance of the Ramada, and showed him the prairie, making him understand that now was the time when it was clear from the wolves, but that not a moment was to be lost, for should this maneuver not succeed, it would only render the situation of those left behind more desperate. And he knew his horse well enough to be able to trust his wonderful lightness and swiftness to save them all. But Glenarvan was blind and obstinate, and determined to sacrifice himself at all hazards, when suddenly he felt himself violently pushed back. Thaouka pranced up, and reared himself bolt upright on his hind legs, and made a bound over the barrier of fire, while a clear young voice called out, "'God save you, my lord!' But before either Thalcave or Glenarvan could get more than a glimpse of the boy, holding on fast by Thaouka's mane, he was out of sight. "'Robert! Oh, you unfortunate boy!' cried Glenarvan. But even Thalcave did not catch the words, for his voice was drowned in the frightful uproar made by the wolves, who had dashed off at a tremendous speed on the track of the horse. Thalcave and Glenarvan rushed out of the Ramada. Already the plain had recovered its tranquillity, and all that could be seen of the red wolves was a moving line far away in the distant darkness. Glenarvan sank prostrate on the ground, and clasped his hands despairingly. He looked at Thalcave, who smiled with his accustomed calmness, and said, Thaouka, good horse, brave boy, he will save himself. And suppose he falls, said Glenarvan. He'll not fall. But notwithstanding Thalcave's assurances, poor Glenarvan spent the rest of the night in torturing anxiety. He seemed quite insensible now to the danger they had escaped through the departure of the wolves, and would have hastened immediately after Robert if the Indian had not kept him back by making him understand the impossibility of their horses overtaking Thaouka and also that boy and horse had outdistanced the wolves long since, and that it would be useless going to look for them till daylight. At four o'clock morning began to dawn. A pale glimmer appeared in the horizon, and pearly drops of dew lay thick on the plain and on the tall grass, already stirred by the breath of day. The time for starting had arrived. "'Now,' cried Thalcave, "'come!' Glenarvan made no reply, but took Robert's horse, and sprung into the saddle. Next minute both men were galloping at full speed toward the west, in the line in which their companions ought to be advancing. They dashed along at a prodigious rate for a full hour, dreading every minute to come across the mangled corpse of Robert. Glenarvan had torn the flanks of his horse with his spurs in his mad haste, when at last gunshots were heard in the distance at regular intervals, as if fired as a signal. "'There they are!' exclaimed Glenarvan, and both he and the Indian urged on their steeds to a still quicker pace— till in a few minutes more they came up to the little detachment conducted by Paganel. A cry broke from Glenarvan's lips, for Robert was there, alive and well, still mounted on the superb Thaouka, who neighed loudly with delight at the sight of his master. "'Oh, my child, my child!' cried Glenarvan, with indescribable tenderness in his tone. Both he and Robert leaped to the ground, and flung themselves into each other's arms. Then the Indian hugged the brave boy in his arms. "'He is alive, he is alive,' repeated Glenarvan again and again. "'Yes,' replied Robert, "'and thanks to Thaouka.' This great recognition of his favorite services was wholly unexpected by the Indian, who was talking to him that minute, caressing and speaking to him, as if human blood flowed in the veins of the proud creature. Then turning to Paganel, he pointed to Robert and said, "'A brave!' And employing the Indian metaphor, he added, 
His spurs did not tremble. But Glenarvan put his arms round the boy and said, "'Why wouldn't you let me or Thalcave run the risk of this last chance of deliverance, my son?' "'My lord,' replied the boy in tones of gratitude, "'wasn't it my place to do it? Thalcave has saved my life already, and you, you are going to save my father.'" End of chapter 19book 1 chapter 20 of in search of the castaways this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this reading by anna roberts in search of the castaways or the children of captain grant by jules verne book 1 chapter 20 strange signs after the first joy of the meeting was over, Paganel and his party, except perhaps the Major, were only conscious of one feeling. They were dying of thirst. Most fortunately for them, the Guamini ran not far off, and about seven in the morning the little troop reached the enclosure on its banks. The precincts were strewed with the dead wolves, and judging from their numbers, it was evident how violent the attack must have been, and how desperate the resistance. As soon as the travellers had drunk their fill, they began to demolish the breakfast prepared in the Ramada, and did ample justice to these extraordinary viands. The Nandu fillets were pronounced first-rate, and the armadillo was delicious. "'To eat moderately,' said Paganel, "'would be positive ingratitude to Providence. We must eat immoderately.' And so they did, but were none the worse for it. The water of the Guamini greatly aided digestion, apparently." Glenarvan, however, was not going to imitate Hannibal at Capua, and at ten o'clock next morning gave the signal for starting. The leathern bottles were filled with water, and the day's march commenced. The horses were so well rested that they were quite fresh again, and kept up a canter almost constantly. The country was not so parched up now, and consequently less sterile, but still a desert. No incident occurred of any importance during the second and third of November and in the evening they reached the boundary of the Pampas, and camped for the night on the frontiers of the province of Buenos Aires. Two-thirds of their journey was now accomplished. It was twenty-two days since they left the bay of Talcahuano, and they had gone four hundred fifty miles. Next morning they crossed the conventional line which separates the Argentine plains from the region of the Pampas. It was here that Thalcave hoped to meet the caciques, in whose hands, he had no doubt, Harry Grant and his men were prisoners." From the time of leaving the Guamini, there was marked change in the temperature, to the great relief of the travellers. It was much cooler, thanks to the violent and cold winds from Patagonia, which constantly agitate the atmospheric waves. Horses and men were glad enough of this, after what they had suffered from the heat and drought, and they felt animated with fresh ardour and confidence. But contrary to what Thalcave had said, the whole district appeared uninhabited, or rather abandoned. Their route often led past, or went right through, small lagoons, sometimes of fresh water, sometimes of brackish. On the banks and bushes about these, king wrens were hopping about, and larks singing joyously in concert with the tangaras, the rivals in color of the brilliant hummingbirds. On the thorny bushes, the nests of the anubis swung to and fro in the breeze like an Indian hammock, and on the shore magnificent flamingos stalked in regular order, like soldiers marching, and spread out their flaming red wings. Their nests were seen in groups of thousands, forming a complete town, about a foot high, and resembling a truncated cone in shape. The flamingos did not disturb themselves in the least at the approach of the travellers, but this did not suit Paganel. "'I have been very desirous a long time,' he said to the Major, "'to see a flamingo flying.' "'All right,' replied McNabbs. "'Now, while I have the opportunity, I should like to make the most of it,' continued Paganel. "'Very well, do it, Paganel.' "'Come with me, then, Major, and you too, Robert. I want witnesses.' And all three went off towards the flamingos, leaving the others to go on in advance. As soon as they were near enough, Paganel fired, only loading his gun, however, with powder, for he would not shed even the blood of a bird uselessly. The shot made the whole assemblage fly away en masse, while Paganel watched them attentively through his spectacles. "'Well, did you see them fly?' he asked the Major. "'Certainly I did,' was the reply. "'I could not help seeing them, unless I had been blind.' "'Well, and did you think they resembled feathered arrows when they were flying?' "'Not in the least.' "'Not a bit,' added Robert. "'I was sure of it,' said the geographer, with a satisfied air, 
and yet the very proudest of modest men, my illustrious countryman, Chateaubriand, made the inaccurate comparison. Oh, Robert, comparison is the most dangerous figure in rhetoric that I know. Mind you avoid it all your life, and only employ it in a last extremity. Are you satisfied with your experiment? asked McNabbs. Delighted. And so am I, but we had better push on now, for your illustrious Chateaubriand has put us more than a mile behind. On rejoining their companions, they found Glenarvan busily engaged in conversation with the Indian, though apparently unable to make him understand. Thalcave's gaze was fixed intently on the horizon, and his face wore a puzzled expression. The moment Paganel came in sight, Glenarvan called out, "'Come along, friend Paganel. Thalcave and I can't understand each other at all.' After a few minutes' talk with the Patagonian, the interpreter turned to Glenarvan and said, Thalcave is quite astonished at the fact, and certainly it is very strange that there are no Indians, nor even traces of any to be seen in these plains, for they are generally thick with companies of them, either driving along cattle stolen from the estancias, or going to the Andes to sell their zorillo cloths and plated leather whips. And what does Thalcave think is the reason? He does not know. He is amazed, and that's all. But what description of the Indians did he reckon on meeting in this part of the Pampas? Just the very ones who had the foreign prisoners in their hands, the natives under the rule of the caciques Calfucora, Catriel, or Yanchetrus. Who are these caciques? Chiefs that were all-powerful thirty years ago, before they were driven beyond the Sierras. Since then they have been reduced to subjection as much as Indians can be, and they scour the plains of the Pampas and the province of Buenos Aires. I quite share Thalcave's surprise at not discovering any traces of them in regions which they usually infest as salteadores, or bandits. And what must we do, then? I'll go and ask him, replied Paganel. After a brief colloquy, he returned and said, This is his advice, and very sensible it is, I think. He says we had better continue our route to the east, as far as Fort Independence, and if we don't get news of Captain Grant there, we shall hear, at any rate, what has become of the Indians of the Argentine Plains. "'Is Fort Independence far away?' asked Glenarvan. "'No, it is in the Sierra Tandil, a distance of about sixty miles.' "'And when shall we arrive?' "'The day after tomorrow, in the evening.' Glenarvan was considerably disconcerted by this circumstance. Not to find an Indian, where, in general, there were only too many, was so unusual that there must be some grave cause for it. But worse still, if Harry Grant were a prisoner, in the hands of any of those tribes, had he been dragged away with them to the north or south? Glenarvan felt that, cost what it might, they must not lose his track, and therefore decided to follow the advice of Thalcave, and go to the village of Tandil. They would find someone there to speak to, at all events. About four o'clock in the evening a hill, which seemed a mountain in so flat a country, was sighted in the distance. This was Sierra Tapalquem, at the foot of which the travellers camped that night. The passage in the morning over the Sierra was accomplished without the slightest difficulty. After having crossed the Cordillera of the Andes, it was easy work to ascend the gentle heights of such a Sierra as this. The horses scarcely slackened their speed. At noon they passed the deserted fort of Tapalquem, the first of the chain of forts which defend the southern frontiers from Indian marauders. But to the increasing surprise of Thalcave, they did not come across even the shadow of an Indian. About the middle of the day, however, three flying horsemen, well mounted and well armed, came in sight, gazed at them for an instant, and then sped away with inconceivable rapidity. Glenarvan was furious. Gauchos, said the Patagonian, designating them by the name which had caused such a fiery discussion between the Major and Paganel. Ah, the Gauchos, replied McNabbs. Well, Paganel, the north wind is not blowing today. What do you think of those fellows yonder? I think they look like regular bandits. "'And how far is it from looking to being, my good geographer?' "'Only just a step, my dear Major.' Paganel's admission was received with a general laugh, which did not in the least disconcert him. He went on talking about the Indians, however, and made this curious observation. "'I have read somewhere,' he said, "'that about the Arabs there is a peculiar expression of ferocity in the mouth, while the eyes have a kindly look. Now in these American savages it is quite the reverse, for the eye has a particularly villainous aspect.' No physiognomist, by profession, could have better characterized the Indian race. But desolate as the country appeared, Thalcave was on his guard against surprises, and gave orders to his party to form themselves in a close platoon. It was a useless precaution, however, 
for that same evening they camped for the night in an immense tolderia, which they not only found perfectly empty, but which the Patagonian declared, after he had examined it all round, must have been uninhabited for a long time. Next day the first estancias of the Sierra Tandil came in sight. The estancias are large cattle stations for breeding cattle, but Thalcave resolved not to stop at any of them, but to go straight on to Fort Independence. They passed several farms fortified by battlements and surrounded by a deep moat, the principal building being encircled by a terrace, from which the inhabitants could fire down on the marauders in the plain. Glenarvan might, perhaps, have got some information at these houses, but it was the surest plan to go straight on to the village of Tando. Accordingly, they went on without stopping, fording the rio of Los Huasos and also the Chapaleofu, a few miles further on. Soon they were treading the grassy slopes of the first ridges of the Sierra Tandil, and an hour afterward the village appeared in the depths of a narrow gorge, and above it towered the lofty battlements of Fort Independence. End of chapter 20「Book One, Chapter Twenty One of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline. In Search of the Castaways, or The Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book One, Chapter Twenty One A False Trail. The Sierra Tandil rises a thousand feet above the level of the sea, that is to say, anterior to all organic and metamorphic creation. It is formed of a semicircular ridge of nice hills, covered with fine short grass. The district of Tandil, to which it has given its name, includes all the south of the province of Buenos Aires, and terminates in a river which conveys north all the rios that take their rise on its slopes. After making a short ascent up the Sierra, they reached the postern gate, so carelessly guarded by an Argentine sentinel that they passed through without difficulty, a circumstance which betokened extreme negligence or extreme security. A few minutes afterward, the commandant appeared in person. He was a vigorous man, about fifty years of age, of military aspect, with grayish hair and an imperious eye, as far as one could see through the clouds of tobacco smoke which escaped from his short pipe. His walk reminded Paganel instantly of the old subalterns in his own country. Thalcave was spokesman, and, addressing the officer, presented Lord Glenarvan and his companions. While he was speaking, the commandant kept staring fixedly at Paganel in rather an embarrassing manner. The geographer could not understand what he meant by it, and was just about to interrogate him when the commandant came forward, and seizing both his hands in the most free and easy fashion, said in a joyous voice in the mother tongue of the geographer, "'A Frenchman!' "'Yes, a Frenchman,' replied Paganel. "'Ah, delightful! Welcome! Welcome! I am a Frenchman, too!' he added, shaking Paganel's hand with such vigor as to be almost alarming. "'Is he a friend of yours, Paganel?' asked the major." Yes, said Paganel, somewhat proudly, one has friends in every division of the globe. After he had succeeded in disengaging his hand, though not without difficulty, from the living vice in which it was held, a lively conversation ensued. Glenarvan would fain have put in a word about the business on hand, but the commandant related his entire history, and was not in a mood to stop till he had done. It was evident that the worthy man must have left his native country many years back, for his mother tongue had grown unfamiliar, and if he had not forgotten the words he certainly did not remember how to put them together. He spoke more like a negro belonging to a French colony. The fact was that the governor of Fort Independence was a French sergeant, an old comrade of Parachapi. He had never left the fort since it had been built in 1828, and, strange to say, he commanded it with the consent of the Argentine government. He was a man about fifty years of age, a Basque by birth, and his name was Manuel Ifaraguer, so that he was almost a Spaniard. 
A year after his arrival in the country he was naturalized, took service in the Argentine army, and married an Indian girl who was then nursing twin babies six months old. Two boys, be it understood, for the good wife of the commandant would never have thought of presenting her husband with girls. Manuel could not conceive of any state but a military one, and he hoped in due time, with the help of God, to offer the Republic a whole company of young soldiers. You saw them. Charming. Good soldiers are Jose, Juan, and Miguel. Pepe, seven years old. Pepe can handle a gun. Pepe, hearing himself complimented, brought his two little feet together and presented arms with perfect grace. He'll get on, added the sergeant. He'll be Colonel Major or Brigadier General some day. Sergeant Manuel seemed so enchanted that it would have been useless to express a contrary opinion, either to the profession of arms or the probable future of his children. He was happy, and as Goethe says, nothing that makes us happy is an illusion. All this talk took up a quarter of an hour, to the great astonishment of Thalcave. The Indian could not understand how so many words could come out of one throat. No one interrupted the sergeant, but all things came to an end, and at last he was silent, but not till he had made his guests enter his dwelling and be presented to Madame Ifarraguerre. Then, and not till then, did he ask his guests what had procured him the honor of their visit. Now or never was the moment to explain, and Paganel, seizing the chance at once, began an account of their journey across the Pampas, and ended by inquiring the reason of the Indians having deserted the country. "'Ah, there was no one,' replied the sergeant, shrugging his shoulders. "'Really, no one, and us too, our arms crossed. Nothing to do.' "'But why?' "'War.' "'War?' "'Yes, civil war between the Paraguayans and Buenos Aires,' replied the sergeant. "'Well?' Well, Indians all in the north, in the rear of General Flores. Indian pillagers find pillage there. But where are the Sakiks? Sakiks are with them. What? Catriel? There is no Catriel. And Calfucura? There is no Calfucura. And there is no Yancha Truz? No, no Yancha Truz. The reply was interpreted by Thalcave, who shook his head and gave an approving look. The Patagonian was either unaware of or had forgotten that civil war was decimating the two parts of the Republic, a war which ultimately required the intervention of Brazil. The Indians have everything to gain by these intestine strifes and cannot lose such fine opportunities of plunder. There was no doubt the sergeant was right in assigning war then as the cause of the forsaken appearance of the plains. But this circumstance upset all Glenarvan's projects, for if Harry Grant was a prisoner in the hands of the Sakiks, he must have been dragged north with them. How and where should they ever find him, if that were the case? Should they attempt a perilous and almost useless journey to the northern border of the Pampas? It was a serious question which would need to be well talked over. However, there was one inquiry more to make to the sergeant, and it was the major who thought of it, for all the others looked at each other in silence. Had the sergeant heard whether any Europeans were prisoners in the hands of the Sakiks? Manuel looked thoughtful for a few minutes, like a man trying to ransack his memory. At last he said, Yes. Ah! said Glenarvan, catching at the fresh hope. They all eagerly crowded round the sergeant, exclaiming, "'Tell us! Tell us!' "'It was some years ago,' replied Manuel. "'Yes. All I heard was that some Europeans were prisoners, but I never saw them.' "'You are making a mistake,' said Glenarvan. "'It can't be some years ago. The date of the shipwreck is explicitly given. The Britannica was wrecked in June 1862.' It is scarcely two years ago. Oh, more than that, my lord. Impossible, said Paganel. Oh, but it must be. It was when Pepe was born. There were two prisoners. No, three, said Glenarvan. Two, replied the sergeant in a positive tone. Two, 
echoed Glenarvan, much surprised. Two Englishmen? No, no, who's talking of Englishmen? No, a Frenchman and an Italian. An Italian who was massacred by the Paiuchis? exclaimed Paganel. Yes, and I heard afterward that the Frenchman was saved. Saved! exclaimed young Robert, his very life hanging on the lips of the sergeant. Yes, delivered out of the hands of the Indians. Paganel struck his forehead with an air of desperation and said at last, Ah, I understand. It is all clear now. Everything is explained. But what is it? asked Glenarvan, with as much impatience. My friends, replied Paganel, taking both Robert's hands in his own, we must resign ourselves to a sad disaster. We have been on a wrong track. The prisoner mentioned is not the captain at all, but one of my own countrymen, and his companion, who was assassinated by the Paiuchis, was Marco Vizello. The Frenchman was dragged along by the cruel Indians several times as far as the shores of the Colorado, but managed at length to make his escape and return to Colorado. Instead of following the track of Harry Grant, we have fallen on that of young Guinard. This announcement was heard with profound silence. The mistake was palpable. The details given by the sergeant, the nationality of the prisoner, the murder of his companions, his escape from the hands of the Indians, all evidenced the fact. Glenarvan looked at Thalcave with a crestfallen face, and the Indian, turning to the sergeant, asked whether he had ever heard of three English captives. Never, replied Manuel. They would have known of them at Tandil, I am sure. No, it cannot be. After this, there was nothing further to do at Fort Independence but to shake hands with the commandant and thank him and take leave. Glenarvan was in despair at this complete overthrow of his hopes, and Robert walked silently beside him with his eyes full of tears. Glenarvan could not find a word of comfort to say to him. Paganel gesticulated and talked away to himself. The major never opened his mouth, nor Thalcave, whose amour propre as an Indian, seemed quite wounded by having allowed himself to go on a wrong scent. No one, however, would have thought of reproaching him for an error so pardonable. They went back to the Fonda and had supper, but it was a gloomy party that surrounded the table. It was not that any of them regretted the fatigue they had so heedlessly endured or the dangers they had run, but they felt their hope of success was gone, for there was no chance of coming across Captain Grant between the Sierra Tandil and the sea, as Sergeant Manuel must have heard if any prisoners had fallen into the hands of the Indians on the coast of the Atlantic. Any event of this nature would have attracted the notice of the Indian traders who trafficked between Tandil and Carmen at the mouth of the Rio Negro. The best thing to do now was to get to the Duncan as quick as possible at the appointed rendezvous. Paganel asked Glenarvan, however, to let him have the document again, on the faith of which they had set out on so bootless a search. He read it over and over, as if trying to extract some new meaning out of it. "'Yet nothing can be clearer,' said Glenarvan. "'It gives the date of the shipwreck, and the manner, and the place of the captivity in the most categorical manner. "'That it does not—' "'No, it does not!' exclaimed Paganel, striking the table with his fist. "'Since Harry Grant is not on the Pampas, he is not in America. But where he is, the document must say. And it shall say, my friends, or my name is not Jacques Paganel any longer.'" End of Book One, Chapter Twenty-One Recording by Roger Moline Book One, Chapter Twenty Two of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Erica Sims. In Search of the Castaways, or the Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. 
Book One, Chapter Twenty Two The Flood. A distance of one hundred and fifty miles separates Fort Independence from the shores of the Atlantic. Unless unexpected and certainly improbable delays should occur, in four days Glenarvan would rejoin the Duncan. But to return on board without Captain Grant, and after having so completely failed in his search, was what he could not bring himself to do. Consequently, when the next day came, he gave no orders for departure. The Major took it upon himself to have the horses saddled, and to make all preparations. Thanks to his activity, next morning at eight o'clock the little troop was descending the grassy slopes of the Sierra. Glenarvan, with Robert at his side, galloped along without saying a word. His bold, determined nature made it impossible to take failure quietly. His heart throbbed as if it would burst, and his head was burning. Paganel, excited by the difficulty, was turning over and over the words of the document, and trying to discover some new meaning. Thaclave was perfectly silent, and left Tauca to lead the way. The Major, always confident, remained firm at his post like a man whom discouragement takes no hold. Tom Austin and his two sailors shared the dejection of their master. A timid rabbit happened to run across their path, and the superstitious men looked at each other in dismay. A bad omen, said Wilson. Yes, and in the highlands, repeated Mulrady. What's bad in the highlands is not better here, returned Wilson sententiously. Toward noon they had crossed the Sierra and descended into the undulating plains which extend to the sea. Limpid rios intersected these plains and lost themselves among the tall grasses. The ground had once more become a dead level. The last mountains of the Pampas were passed, and a long carpet of verdure unrolled itself over the monotonous prairie beneath the horse's tread. Hitherto the weather had been fine, but today the sky presented anything but a reassuring appearance. The heavy vapors, generated by the high temperature of the preceding days, hung in thick clouds, which ere long would empty themselves in torrents of rain. Moreover, the vicinity of the Atlantic and the prevailing west wind made the climate of this district particularly damp. This was evident by the fertility and abundance of the pasture and its dark color. However, the clouds remained unbroken for the present, and in the evening, after a brisk gallop of forty miles, the horses stopped on the brink of deep canadas, immense natural trenches filled with water. No shelter was near, and ponchos had to serve both for tents and coverlets as each man lay down and fell asleep beneath the threatening sky. Next day, the presence of water became still more sensibly felt. It seemed to exude from every pore of the ground. Soon large ponds, some just beginning to form and some already deep, lay across the route to the east. As long as they had only to deal with lagoons, circumscribed pieces of water unencumbered with aquatic plants the horses could get through well enough but when they encountered moving sloths called pentanos it was harder work tall grass blocked them up and they were involved in the peril before they were aware these bogs had already proved fatal to more than one living thing for robert who had got a good bit ahead of the party came rushing back at full gallop calling out monsieur paganel monsieur paganel a forest of horns what exclaimed the geographer you have found a forest of horns yes yes or at any rate a coppice a coppice replied paganel shrugging his shoulders my boy you are dreaming i am not dreaming and you will see for yourself well this is a strange country they sow horns and they sprout up like wheat i wish i could get some of the seed the boy is really speaking seriously, said the Major. Yes, Mr. Major, and you will soon see I am right. The boy had not been mistaken, for presently they found themselves in front of an immense field of horns, regularly planted and stretching far out of sight. It was a complete copse, low and close-packed, but a strange sort. Well, said Robert, this is peculiar, certainly, said Paganel, and he turned round to question Thaclave on the subject. The horns come from the ground, replied the Indian, but the oxen are down below. 
What? exclaimed Paganel. Do you mean to say that a whole herd was caught in that mud and buried alive? Yes, said the Patagonian. And so it was. An immense herd had been suffocated side by side in this enormous bog, and that was not the first occurrence of the kind which had taken place in the Argentine plains. An hour afterward, and the field of horns lay two miles behind, Thaclave was somewhat anxiously observing a state of things which appeared to him unusual. He frequently stopped and raised himself on his stirrups and looked around. His great height gave him a commanding view of the whole horizon, but after a keen rapid survey he quickly resumed his seat and went on. About a mile further he stopped again, and leaving the straight route, made a circuit of some miles north and south, and then returned and fell back in his place at the head of the troop without saying a syllable as to what he hoped or feared. This strange behavior, several times repeated, made Glenarvan very uneasy, and quite puzzled Paganel. At last, at Glenarvan's request, he asked the Indian about it. Thaclave replied that he was astonished to see the plains so saturated with water. Never, to his knowledge, since he had followed the calling of guide, had he found the ground in this soaking condition. Even in the rainy season, the Argentine plains had always been passable. But what is the cause of this increasing humidity, said Paganel? I do not know, and what if I did? Could it be owing to the rios of the Sierra being swollen to overflowing by the heavy rains? Sometimes they are. And is it the case now? Perhaps. Paganel was obliged to be content with this unsatisfactory reply, and went back to Glenarvan to report the result of his conversation. And what does Thalclave advise us to do? said Glenarvan. Paganel went back to the guide and asked him. Go on fast, was the reply. This was easier said than done. The horses soon tired of treading over ground that gave way at every step. It sank each moment more and more till it seemed half under water. They quickened their pace, but could not go fast enough to escape the water, which rolled in great sheets at their feet. Before two hours, the cataracts of the sky opened and deluged the plain in true tropical torrents of rain. Never was there a finer occasion for displaying philosophic equanimity. There was no shelter and nothing for it but to bear it stolidly. The ponchos were streaming like the overflowing gutter spouts on the roof of a house, and the unfortunate horsemen had to submit to a double bath, for their horses dashed up the water to their waists at every step. In this drenching, shivering state, and worn out with fatigue, they came toward evening to a miserable rancho, which could only have been called a shelter by people not very fastidious, and certainly only travelers in extremity would have entered it. But Glenarvan and his companions had no choice, and were glad enough to burrow in this wretched hovel, though it would have been despised by even a poor Indian of the Pampas. A miserable fire of grass was kindled, which gave out more smoke than heat, and was very difficult to keep alight, as the torrents of rain, which dashed against the ruined cabin outside, found their way within, and fell in large drops from the roof. Twenty times over the fire would have been extinguished if Mulrady and Wilson had not kept off the water. The supper was a dull meal, and neither appetizing nor reviving. Only the Major seemed to eat with any relish. The impassive McNabs was superior to all circumstances. Paganel, Frenchman as he was, tried to joke, but the attempt was a failure. My jests are damp, he said. They miss fire. The only consolation in such circumstances was to sleep, and accordingly each one lay down and endeavored to find in slumber a temporary forgetfulness of his discomforts and his fatigues. The night was stormy, and the planks of the rancho cracked before the blast as if every instant they would give way. The poor horses outside, exposed to all the inclemency of the weather, were making piteous moans, and their masters were suffering quite as much inside the ruined rancho. However, sleep overpowered them at length. Robert was the first to close his eyes and lean his head against Glenarvan's shoulder, and soon all the rest were soundly sleeping too under the guardian eye of heaven. The night passed safely, and no one stirred till Thauka woke them by tapping vigorously against the rancho with his hoof. He knew it was time to start, and at a push could give the signal as well as his master. 
They owed the faithful creature too much to disobey him, and set off immediately. The rain had abated, but floods of water still covered the ground. Paganel, on consulting his map, came to the conclusion that the Rios Grande and Viva Rota, into which the water from the plains generally runs, must have been united in one large bed several miles in extent. Extreme haste was imperative, for all their lives depended on it. Should the inundation increase, where could they find refuge? Not a single elevated point was visible on the whole circle of the horizon, and on such level plains water would sweep along with fearful rapidity. The horses were spurred on to the utmost, and Thauka led the way, bounding over the water as if it had been his natural element. Certainly he might justly have been called a seahorse, better than many of the amphibious animals who bear that name. All of a sudden, about ten in the morning, Thauka betrayed symptoms of a violent agitation. He kept turning round toward the south, neighing continually and snorting with wide-open nostrils. He reared violently, and Thakfave had some difficulty in keeping his seat. The foam from his mouth was tinged with blood from the action of the bit, pulled tightly by his master's strong hand, and yet the fiery animal would not be still. Had he been free, his master knew he would have fled away to the north as fast as his legs would have carried him. "'What is the matter with Thauka? asked Paganel. "'Is he bitten by leeches? They are very voracious in the Argentine streams.' "'No,' replied the Indian. "'Is he frightened at something, then?' Yes, he sensed danger. What danger? I don't know. But though no danger was apparent to the eye, the ear could catch the sound of a murmuring noise behind the limits of the horizon, like the coming in of the tide. Soon a confused sound was heard of bellowing and neighing and bleeding, and about a mile to the south, immense flocks appeared, rushing and tumbling over each other in the greatest disorder as they hurried pell-mell along with the inconceivable rapidity. They raised such a whirlwind of water in their course that it was impossible to distinguish them clearly. A hundred whales of the largest size could hardly have dashed up the ocean waves more violently. Anda, anda! Quick, quick! shouted the clave in a voice like thunder. What is it then? asked Paganel. The rising, replied Thaclave. He means an inundation, exclaimed Paganel, flying with the others after Thaclave, who had spurred on his horse toward the north. It was high time, for about five miles south, an immense towering wave was seen advancing over the plain and changing the whole country into an ocean. The tall grass disappeared before it as if cut down by a scythe, and clumps of mimosas were torn up and drifted about like floating islands. The wave was speeding on with the rapidity of a racehorse, and the travelers fled before it like a cloud before a storm wind. They looked in vain for some harbor of refuge, and the terrified horses galloped so wildly along that the riders could hardly keep their saddles. Anda, anda! shouted the clave, and again they spurred on the poor animals till the blood ran from their lacerated sides. They stumbled every now and then over great cracks in the ground, or got entangled in the hidden grass below the water. They fell and were pulled up, only to fall again and again, and be pushed up again and again. The level of the waters was sensibly rising, and less than two miles off, the gigantic wave reared its crested head. For a quarter of an hour this supreme struggle with the most terrible of elements lasted. The fugitives could not tell how far they had gone, but judging by the speed, the distance must have been considerable. The poor horses, however, were breast high in water now, and could only advance with extreme difficulty. Glenarvan and Paganel, and indeed the whole party, gave themselves up for lost. As the horses were fast getting out of their depth, and six feet of water would be enough to drown them. It would be impossible to tell the anguish of mind these eight men endured. They felt their own impotence in the presence of these cataclysms of nature, so far beyond all human power. Their salvation did not lie in their own hands. Five minutes afterward, and the horses were swimming, the current alone carried them along with tremendous force, and with a swiftness equal to their fastest gallop. They must have gone full twenty miles an hour. All hope of delivery seemed impossible, when the Major suddenly called out, A tree! A tree! exclaimed Glenarvan. 
Yes, there, there, replied Thalclave, pointing with his finger to a species of gigantic walnut tree which raised its solitary head above the waters. His companions needed no urging forward now. This tree so opportunely discovered, they must reach it at all hazards. The horses very likely might not be able to get to it, but at all events the men would, the current bearing them right down to it. Just at that moment, Tom Austin's horse gave a smothered neigh and disappeared. His master, freeing his feet from the stirrups, began to swim vigorously. "'Hang on to my saddle!' called Glenarvan. "'Thanks, Your Honor, but I have good stout arms.' "'Robert, how is your horse going?' asked his lordship, turning to young Grant. "'Famously, my lord, he swims like a fish.' "'Look out!' shouted the major in a stentorian voice. The warning was scarcely spoken before the enormous billow, a monstrous wave forty feet high, broke over the fugitives with a fearful noise. Men and animals all disappeared in a whirlwind of foam, a liquid mass weighing several million tons engulfed them in its seething waters. When it rolled on, the men reappeared on the surface and countered each other rapidly, but all the horses, except Tauka, who still bore his master, had gone down forever. Courage! Courage! repeated Glenarvan, supporting Paganel with one arm and swimming with the other. I can manage! I can manage! said the worthy savant. I am even not sorry! But no one ever knew what he was not sorry about, for the poor man was obliged to swallow down the rest of his sentence with half a pint of muddy water. The major advanced quietly, making regular strokes worthy of a master swimmer. The sailors took to the water like porpoises, while Robert clung to Thauka's mane and was carried along with him. The noble animal swam superbly, instinctively making for the tree in a straight line. The tree was only twenty fathoms off, and in a few minutes was safely reached by the whole party. But for this refuge they must all have perished in the flood. The water had risen to the top of the trunk, just to where the parent branches forked out. It was consequently quite easy to clamber up to it. The clave climbed first and got off his horse to hoist up Robert and help the others. His powerful arms had soon placed all the exhausted swimmers in a place of security. But meantime, Falco was being rapidly carried away by the current. He turned his intelligent face towards his master, and shaking his long mane, neighed as if to summon him to the rescue. "'Are you going to forsake him, Thalclave?" asked Paganel. "'Aye!' replied the Indian, and forthwith he plunged down into the tumultuous waters and came up again ten fathoms off. A few instants afterward his arms were round Thalca's neck, and master and steed were drifting together towards the misty horizon of the north. End of Book 1, Chapter 22book 1 chapter 23 of in search of the castaways this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this recording by maria elmlang copenhagen denmark in search of the castaways or the children of captain grant by Van. book 1 chapter 23 a singular abode the tree in which Glenarvan and his companions had just found refuge resembled a walnut tree, having the same glossy foliage and rounded form. In reality, however, it was the ombu, which grows solitarily on the Argentine plains. The enormous and twisted trunk of this tree is planted firmly in the soil, not only by its great roots, but still more by its vigorous shoots, which fastens it down in the most tenacious manner. This was how it stood proof against the shock of the mighty billow. This ombu measured in height a hundred feet, and covered with its shadow a circumference of one hundred and twenty yards. All this scaffolding rested on three great boughs which sprang from the trunk. Two of these rose almost perpendicularly, and supported the immense parasol of foliage, the branches of which were so crossed and intertwined and entangled, as if by the hand of a basket-maker that they formed an impenetrable shade. 
The third arm, on the contrary, stretched right out in a horizontal position above the roaring waters, into which the lower leaves stepped. There was no want of room in the interior of this gigantic tree, for there were great gaps in the foliage, perfect glades, with air in abundance and freshness everywhere. To see the innumerable branches rising to the clouds, and the creepers running from bough to bough, and attaching them together while the sunlight glinted here and there among the leaves, one might have called it a complete forest instead of a solitary tree sheltering them all. On the arrival of the fugitives, a myriad of the feathered tribes fled away into the topmost branches, protesting by their outcries against this flagrant usurpation of their domicile. These birds, who themselves had taken refuge in the solitary ombu, were in hundreds, comprising blackbirds, starlings, isacas, hilgurus, and especially the picaflor, hummingbirds of the most resplendent colors. When they flew away, it seemed as though a gust of wind had blown all the flowers of the tree. Such was the asylum offered to the little band of Glenarvan. Young Grant and the agile Wilson were scarcely perched on the tree before they had climbed to the upper branches and put their heads through the leafy dome to get a view of the vast horizon. The ocean made by the inundation surrounded them on all sides, and, as far as the eye could reach, seemed to have no limits. Not a single tree was visible on the liquid plain. The ombu stood alone amid the rolling waters, and trembled before them. In the distance, drifting from south to north, carried along by the impetuous torrent, they saw trees torn up by the roots, twisted branches, roofs torn off, destroyed ranchos, planks of sheds stolen by the deluge from estancias, carcasses of drowned animals, blood-stained skins, and on a shaky tree a complete family of jaguars, howling and clutching hold of their frail raft. Still farther away, a black spot almost invisible, already caught Wilson's eye. It was Thalcave and his faithful Thauka. Thalcave! Thalcave! shouted Robert, stretching out his hands toward the courageous Patagonian. He will save himself, Mr. Robert, replied Wilson. We must go down to his lordship. The next minute they had descended the three stages of bows, and landed safely on the top of the trunk, where they found Glenarvan, Paganel, the Major, Austin, and Mulready, sitting either astride or in some position they found more comfortable. Wilson gave an account of their investigations aloft, and all shared his opinion with respect to Thalgave. The only question was whether it was Thalcave who would save Thauka, or Thauka who saved Thalcave. Their own situation, meantime, was much more alarming than his. No doubt the tree would be able to resist the current, but the waters might rise higher and higher till the topmost branches were covered, for the depression of the soil made this part of the plain a deep reservoir. Glenarvan's first care, consequently, was to make notches by which to ascertain the progress of the inundation. For the present it was stationary, having apparently reached its height. This was reassuring. "'And now, what are we going to do?' said Glenarvan. "'Make our nest, of course,' replied Paganel. "'Make our nest!' exclaimed Robert. "'Certainly, my boy, and live the life of birds, since we can't that of fishes.' "'All very well, but who will fill our bills for us?' said Glenarvan. "'I will,' said the Major. All eyes turned toward him immediately, and there he sat, in a natural armchair formed of two elastic boughs, holding out his alforges, damp but still intact. "'Ah, oh, McNapps! That is just like you!' exclaimed Glenarvan. "'You think of everything, even under circumstances which would drive all out of your head.' "'Since it was settled we were not going to be drowned, I had no intention of starving of hunger.' "'I should have thought of it, too,' said Paganel. "'But I am so distraught.' "'And what is in the Alforges?' said Tom Austin. "'Food enough to last seven men for two days,' replied McNabbs. "'And I hope the inundation will have gone down in twenty-four hours,' said Glenarvan. "'Or that we shall have found some way of regaining terra firma,' added Paganel. "'Our first business, then, now is to breakfast,' said Glenarvan. 
"'I suppose you mean after we've made ourselves dry,' observed the Major. "'And where the fire?' asked Wilson. "'We must make it,' returned Paganel. "'Where? On the top of the trunk, of course. "'And what with? "'With it at wood we caught off the tree.' "'But how will you kindle it?' asked Glenarvan. "'Our tinder is just like a wet sponge.' "'We can disperse with it,' replied Paganel. "'We only want a little dry moss and a ray of sunshine in the lens of my telescope, "'and you will see what a fire I can get to dry myself by. "'Who will go and cut wood in the forest?' "'I will,' said Robert. "'And off he scampered like a young cat into the depth of the foliage, "'followed by his friend Wilson. "'Paganel set to work to find dry moss.' and had soon gathered sufficient. This he laid on a bed of damp leaves, and where the large branches began to fork out, forming a natural hearth, there was little fear of conflagration. Robert and Wilson speedily reappeared, each with an armful of dry wood, which they threw on the moss. By the help of the lens it was easily kindled, for the sun was blazing overhead. In order to ensure a proper draught, Paganel stood over the hearth, with his long legs straddled out in the Arab manner. Then stooping down and raising himself with a rapid motion, he made a violent current of air with his poncho, which made the wood take fire, and soon a bright flame roared in the improvised brashier. After drying themselves, each in his own fashion, and hanging their ponchos on the tree, where they swung to and fro in the breeze, they breakfasted, carefully, however, rationing out the provisions, for the morrow had to be thought of. The immense basin might not empty so soon as Glenarvan expected, and, anyway, the supply was very limited. The umbu produced no fruit, though fortunately it would likely abound in fresh eggs, thanks to the numerous nests stowed away among the leaves, not to speak of their feathered proprietors. These resources were by no means to be despised. The next business was to install themselves as comfortably as they could, in prospect of a long stay. "'As the kitchen and dining-room are on the ground floor,' said Paganel, "'we must sleep on the first floor. "'The house is large, and as the rent is not dear, "'we must not cramp ourselves for room. "'I can see up yonder natural cradles, "'in which, once safely tucked up, "'we shall sleep as if we were in the best beds of the world. "'We have nothing to fear. "'Besides, we all watch, "'and we are numerous enough to repulse a fleet of engines.' and other wild animals. "'We only want firearms.' "'I have my revolvers,' said Glenarvan. "'And I have mine,' replied Robert. Oh, "'But what is the good of them?' said Tom Austin. "'Unless Monsieur Paganel can find out a way of making powder.' "'We don't need it,' replied McNabbs, exhibiting a powder flask in perfect state of preservation. "'Where did you get it from, Major?' asked Paganel. "'From Thalcave.' He thought it might be useful to us, and gave it to me before he plunged into the water to save Thoka. "'Generous, brave Indian!' exclaimed Glenarvan. "'Yes,' replied Tom Austin. "'If all the Patagonians are cut out after the same pattern, I must compliment Patagonia.' "'I protest against leaving out the horse,' said Paganel. "'He is part and parcel of the Patagonian, and I'm much mistaken if we don't see them again, the one on the other's back.' "'What distance are we from the Atlantic?' asked the Major. "'About forty miles at the outside,' replied Paganel. "'And now, friends, since this is Liberty Hall, I beg to take leave of you. "'I am going to choose an observatory for myself up there, "'and by the help of my telescope, let you know how things are going out in the world.' Forthwith the geographer set off, hoisting himself up very cleverly from bow to bow, till he disappeared beyond the thick foliage. His companions began to arrange the night quarters and prepare their beds. But this was neither a long nor difficult task, and very soon they resumed their seats round the fire to have a talk. As usual, their theme was Captain Grant. In three days, should the water subside, they would be on board the Duncan again. But Harry Grant and his two sailors, those poor shipwrecked fellows, would not be with them. Indeed, it even seemed after all this ill success and this useless journey across America that all chance of finding them was gone forever. Where should they commence a fresh quest? 
What grief Lady Helena and Mary Grant would feel on hearing there was no further hope. Poor sister, said Robert, it is all up with us. For the first time Glenarvan could not find any comfort to give him. What could he say to the lad? Had they not searched exactly where the document stated? And yet, he said, this thirty-seventh degree of latitude is not a mere figure, and that it applies to the shipwreck or captivity of Harry Grant is no mere guess or supposition. We've read it with our own eyes. All very true, your honour, replied Tom Austin, and yet our search has been unsuccessful. It is both a provoking and hopeless business, replied Glenarvan. Provoking enough, certainly, said the Major, but not hopeless. It is precisely because we have an uncontestable figure provided for us that we should follow it up to the end. What do you mean? said Glenarvan. What more can we do? A very logical and simple thing, my dear Edward. When we go on board the Duncan, turn a beak head to the east and go right along the thirty seventh parallel till we come back to our starting point, if necessary. Do you suppose I have not thought of that, Mr. McNabbs? replied Glenarvan. Yes, a hundred times. But what chance is there of success? To leave the American continent, wouldn't it be to go away from the very spot indicated by Harry Grant, and this very Patagonian so distinctly named in the document? And would you recommend your search in the Pampas, where you have the certainty of the shipwreck of the Britannia, neither occurred on the coasts of the Pacific nor the Atlantic? Glenarvan was silent. And however small the chance of finding Harry Grant by following up the given parallel, ought we not to try? I don't say no, replied Glenarvan. And are you not of my opinion, good friends? asked the Major, addressing the sailors. Entirely, said Tom Austin, while Mulready and Wilson gave an assenting nod. Listen to me, friends, said Glenarvan, after a few minutes' reflection. And remember, Robert, this is a grave discussion. I will do my utmost to find Captain Grant, and pledged to it, and will devote my whole life to the task if needs be. All Scotland would unite with me to save so devoted a son as he has been to her. I too quite think with you that we must follow the thirty-seventh parallel around the globe if necessary, however slight our chance of finding him. But that is not the question we should settle. There is one much more important than that is. Should we, from this time, and altogether, give up our search on the American continent? No one made any reply. Each one seemed afraid to pronounce the word. Well, resumed Glenarvan, addressing himself especially to the Major. My dear Edward, replied McNabbs, it would be incurring too great a responsibility for me to reply hic in nuke. It is a question which requires reflection. I must know first through which countries the thirty seventh parallel of southern latitude passes. That is Paganel's business. He will tell you that, said Glenarvan. Let us ask him then, replied the Major. But the learned geographer was nowhere to be seen. He was hidden among the thick leafage of the umbu, and they must call out if they wanted him. Paganel! Paganel! shouted Glenarvan. Here! Yeah replied a voice that seemed to come from the clouds. Where are you? In my tower. What are you doing there? Examining the wide horizon. Could you come down for a minute? Do you want me? Yes. What for? To know what countries the thirty-seventh parallel passes through. That's easily said. I need not disturb myself to come down for that. Very well. Tell us now. Listen, then. After leaving America, the 37th parallel crosses the Atlantic Ocean. And then? It encounters Al Tristan de Acunha. Yes. It goes on two degrees below the Cape of Good Hope. And afterwards? Runs across the Indian Ocean and just touches Isle St. Pierre in the Amsterdam group. Go on. It cuts Australia by the province of Victoria. And then? After leaving Australia in... This last sentence was not completed. Was the geographer hesitating, or did he not know what to say? No, but a terrible cry resounded from the top of the tree. 
Glenarvan and his friends turned pale and looked at each other. What fresh catastrophe had happened now? Had the unfortunate Paganel slipped on his footing? Already Wilson and Mulready had rushed to his rescue when his long body appeared tumbling down from branch to branch. But was he living or dead? For his hands made no attempt to seize anything to stop himself. A few minutes more, and he would have fallen into the roaring waters had not the Major's strong arm bared his passage. Much obliged, McNabbs, said Paganel. How's this? What's the matter with you? What came over you? Another of your absent fits? Yes, yes, replied Paganel, in a voice almost inarticulate with emotion. Yes, but this was something extraordinary. What was it? I said we have made a mistake. We are making it still and have been all along. Explain yourself. Glenarvan, Major, Robert, my friends, exclaimed Paganel. All you that hear me, we are looking for Captain Grant where he is not to be found. What do you say? exclaimed Glenarvan. Not only where he is not now, but where he has never been. End of Book One, Chapter Twenty Three. Book One, Chapter Twenty Four of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Elmbang, Copenhagen, Denmark. In Search of the Castaways, or The Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book One, Chapter Twenty Four, Paganel's Disclosure. Profound astonishment greeted these unexpected words of the learned geographer. What could he mean? Had he lost his sense? He spoke with such conviction, however, that all eyes turned towards Glenarvan, for Paganel's affirmation was a direct answer to his question. But Glenarvan shook his head and said nothing, though evidently he was not inclined to favor his friend's view. Yes, began Paganel again, as soon as he had recovered himself a little. Yes, we have gone a wrong track, and read on the document what was never there. Explain yourself, Paganel, said the Major, and more calmly, if you can. The thing is very simple, Major. Like you, I was in error. Like you, I had rushed at a false interpretation, until about an instant ago, on the top of a, the tree, when I was answering your question, just as I pronounced the word Australia, a sudden flash came across my mind and the document became clear as day. What? exclaimed Glenarvan. You mean to say that Harry Grant? I mean to say, replied Paganel, that the word Austral that occurs in the document is not a complete word, as we have supposed up until now, but just the root of the word Australie. Well, that would be strange, said the Major. Strange, repeated Glenarvan, shrugging his shoulders. It is simply impossible. Impossible, returned Paganel. That is a word we don't allow in France. What, continued Glenarvan, in a tone of the most profound incredulity, you dare to contend, with a document in your hand, that the shipwreck of the Britannia happened on the shores of Australia? I am sure of it, replied Paganel. My conscience, exclaimed Glenarvan. I must say I am surprised at such a declaration from the Secretary of a Geographical Society. And why so? said Paganel, touched in his weak point. Because, if you allow the word Australie, you must also allow the word Indians, and Indians are never seen there. Paganel was not the least surprised at this rejoinder. Doubtless he expected it, for he began to smile and said, my dear Glenarvan, don't triumph over me too fast. I am going to floor you completely, and never was an Englishman more thoroughly defeated than you will be. It will be the revenge for Crissy and Eggincourt. I wish nothing better. Take your revenge, Paganel. Listen, then. In the text of the document, there is neither mention of the Indians nor of Patagonia. The incomplete word Indi does not mean Indians, but of course Indigens 
aboriginals. Now do you admit that there were aborigines in Australia? Bravo, Paganel, said the Major. Well, do you agree to my interpretation, my dear lord? asked the geographer again. Yes, replied Glenarvan. If you will prove to me that the fragment of a word Gorni does not refer to the country of the Patagonians. Certainly it does not. It has nothing to do with Patagonia, said Paganel. Read it any other way you please, except that. How? Cosmogony, theogony, agony, agony, said the Major. I don't care which, returned Paganel. The word is quite unimportant. I will not even try to find out its meaning. The main point is that astral means astrali, and we must have gone blindly on a wrong track not to have discovered the explanation at the very beginning. It was so evident. If I had found the document myself, and my judgment had not been misled by your interpretation, I should never have read it differently. A burst of hurrahs and congratulations and compliments followed Paganel's words. Austin and the sailors, and the Major and Robert, most all overjoyed at this fresh hope, and applauded him heartily, while even Glenarvan, whose eyes were gradually getting open, was almost prepared to give in. "'I only want to know one thing more, my dear Paganel,' he said, "'and then I must bow to your perspicacity.' "'What is it?' "'How will you group the words together, according to your new interpretation? How will the document read?' "'Easily enough answered. Here's the document,' replied Paganel, taking out the precious paper he had been studying so conscientiously for the last few days. For a few minutes there was complete silence, while the worthy savant took time to collect his thoughts before complying with his lordship's request. Then, putting his finger on the words, and emphasizing some of them, he began as follows. June the 7th, 1862 Le trois mars britannica de Glasgow à sombre presse, put, if you please, deux jours, trois jours, jour, or une loge agonie, it doesn't signify, it is quite a matter of indifference. Sur les côtés de l'Australie, se dirigeant à terre, deux métrolés et dix capitaines grandes vont essayer de abord, or on abordé les continents où ils seront, or Son prisonnier de cruel indignis, il en j'ai deux documents, etc. Is that clear? Clear enough, replied Glenarvan. If the word continent can be applied to Australia, which is only an island. Make yourself easy about that, my dear Glenarvan. The best geographers have agreed to call the island the Australian continent. Then all I have now to say is, my friends, said Glenarvan, away to Australia, and may heaven help us. To Australia, echoed his companions with one voice. I'll tell you what, Paganel, added Glenarvan. Your being on board the Duncan is a perfect providence. All right, look on me as a messenger of providence and let us drop the subject. So the conversation ended, a conversation which great results were to follow. It completely changed the moral condition of the travellers. It gave the clue of the labyrinth in which they had thought themselves hopelessly entangled, and, admit their own projects, inspired them with fresh hope. They could now quit the American continent without the least hesitation, and already their thoughts had flown to the Australias. In going on aboard the Duncan again, they would not bring despair with them, and Lady Helena and Mary Grant would not have to mourn the irrevocable loss of Captain Grant. This thought so filled them with joy that they forgot all the dangers of their actual situation, and only regretted that they could not start immediately. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon, and they determined to have supper at six. Paganel wished to get up a splendid spread in honor of the occasion, but as the materials were very scanty, he proposed to Robert to go and hunt in the neighboring forest. Robert clasped his hands at the idea, so they took the cave's powder flask cleaned the revolvers, and loaded them with small shot, and set off. "'Don't go too far,' said the Major gravely to the two hunters. After their departure, Glenarvan and McNabbs went down to examine the state of the water by looking at the notches they had made on the tree, and Wilson and Mulready replenished the fire. No sign of decrease appeared on the surface of the immense lake, 
yet the flood seemed to have reached its maximum height. But the violence with which it rushed from the south to north proved that the equilibrium of the Argentine rivers was not restored. Before getting lower, the liquid mass must remain stationary, as in the case with the ocean, before the ebb tide commences. While Glenarvan and his cousin were making these observations, the report of firearms resounded frequently above their heads, and the jubilant outcries of the two sportsmen, for Paganel was every whit as much a child as Robert. They were having a fine time of it, among the thick leaves, judging by the peals of laughter which rang out in the boy's clear treble voice and Paganel's deep bass. The chase was evidently successful, and wonders in the culinary art might be expected. Wilson had a good idea to begin with, which he had skillfully carried out, for when Glenarvan came back to the brochure, he found that the brave fellow had actually managed to catch, with only a pin and a piece of string, several dozen small fish, as delicate as smelts, called majoras, which were all jumping about in a fold of his poncho, ready to be converted into an exquisite dish. At the same moment the hunters reappeared. Paganel was carefully carrying some black swallow's eggs and a spring of sparrows, which he meant to serve up later under the name of field larks. Robert had been clever enough to bring down several brace of hilgeries, small green and yellow birds, which are excellent eating, and greatly in demand on the Montevideo market. Paganel, who knew fifty ways of dressing eggs, was obliged for this once to be content with simply hardening them on the hot embers. But, notwithstanding this, the viands at the meal were both dainty and varied. The dried beef, hard eggs, grilled morass, sparrows, and roast hill juice made one of those gala feasts, the memory of which is imperishable. The conversation was very animated. Many compliments were paid. Paganel on his twofold talents as hunter and cook, which the savant accepted with a modesty which characterizes true merit. Then he turned the conversation on the peculiarities of the ombu, under whose canopy they had found shelter, and whose depths he declared were immense. Robert and I, he added jestingly, thought ourselves hunting in the open forest. I was afraid for the minute we should lose ourselves, for I could not find the road. The sun was sinking below the horizon. I sought vainly for footmarks. I began to feel the sharp pangs of hunger, and the gloomy depths of the forest resounded already with the roar of wild beasts. No, 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 not that. There are no wild beasts here, I'm sorry to say. What? exclaimed Glenarvan. You're sorry that there are no wild beasts? Certainly I am. And yet we should have every reason to dread their ferocity. Their ferocity is non-existent, scientifically speaking, replied the learned geographer. Now come, Paganel, said the Major. You'll never make me admit the utility of wild beasts. What good are they? Why, Major, exclaimed Paganel, for purposes of classification into orders, and families, and species, and subspecies. A mighty advantage, certainly, replied McNabbs. I could dispense with all that. If I had been one of Noah's companions at the time of the deluge, I should most assuredly have hindered the imprudent patriarch from putting in a pair of lions, and tigers, and panthers, and bears, and such animals for they are as malevolent as they are useless. "'You would have done that?' asked Paganel. "'Yes, I would.' "'Well, you would have done wrong in a so logical point of view,' returned Paganel. "'But not in a humanitarian one,' rejoined the Major. "'It is shocking,' replied Paganel. "'Why, for my part, on the contrary, I should have taken special care to preserve megatheriums and protodactylists, and all of the Andivillian species, of which we are unfortunately deprived by his neglect. And I say, returned McNabbs, that Noah did a very good thing when he abandoned them to their fate. That is, if they lived in his day. And I say it was a very bad thing, retorted Paganel, and he has justly merited the malediction of savants to the end of time. The rest of the party could not help laughing at hearing the two friends disputing over old Noah. Contrary to all his principles, the Major, who all his life had never disputed with anybody, was always bearing with Paganel. The geographer seemed to have a peculiarly exciting effect on him. Glenarvan, as usual, always the peacemaker, interfered in the debate and said, 
whether the loss of ferocious animals is to be regretted or not, in a scientific point of view, there's no help for it now. We must be content to do without them. Paganel can hardly expect to meet with wild beasts in this aerial forest. Why not? asked the geographer. Wild beasts on a tree, exclaimed Tom Austin. Yes, undoubtedly. The American tiger, the jaguar, takes refuge in trees when the chase gets too hot for him. It is quite possible that one of these animals, surprised by the induation, might have climbed up into this umbu and be hiding now among its thick foliage. "'You haven't met any of them at any rate, I suppose,' said the Major. "'No,' replied Paganel, "'though we hunted all through the wood. It is vexing, for it would have been a splendid chase. A jaguar is a bloodthirsty, ferocious creature. He can twist the neck of a horse with a single stroke of his paw. When he has once tasted human flesh, he scents it greedily. He likes to eat an Indian best, and next to him a negro, then a mulatto, and last of all a white man. "'I am delighted to hear we come number four, said McNabbs. "'That only proves you are insipid,' retorted Paganel, with an air of disdain. "'I am delighted to be insipid,' was the Major's reply. "'Well, it is humiliating enough,' said the intractable Paganel. "'The white man proclaimed himself chief of the human race, "'but Mr. Jagger is of a different opinion, it seems. "'Be that as it may, my brave Paganel,' Seeing there are neither Indians, nor Negroes, nor mulattoes among us, I am quite rejoiced at the absence of your beloved jaguars. Our situation is not so particularly agreeable. What? Not agreeable? exclaimed Paganel, jumping at the word as likely to give a new turn to the conversation. You are complaining of your lot, Glenarvan. I should think so indeed, replied Glenarvan. Do you find these uncomfortable hard branches very luxurious? I have never been more comfortable, even if in my study. We live like the birds. We sing and fly about. I begin to believe men were intended to live on trees. But they want wings, suggested the Major. They'll make them some day. Until then, put in Glenarvan, with your leave, I prefer the gravel of a park, or the floor of a house, or the deck of a ship, to this aerial dwelling. We must take some things as they come, Glenarvan, returned Paganel. If good, so much the better. If bad, never mind. Ah, I see you are wishing you had all the comforts of Malcolm Castle. No, but I am quite certain Robert is perfectly happy, interrupted Paganel, eager to ensure one partisan at least. Yes, that I am, exclaimed Robert in a joyous tone. At his age it is quite natural, replied Glenarvan. And at mine too, returned the geographer. The fewer one's comforts, the fewer one's needs. And the fewer one's needs, the greater one's happiness. Now, now, said the major. Here's Paganel running a tilt against riches and gilt ceilings. No, McNabs, replied the savant. I'm not. But if you like, I'll tell you a little Arabian story that comes into my mind, very apropos this minute. Oh, do, do, said Robert. "'And what is your story to prove, Paganel?' inquired the Major. "'Much what all stories prove, my brave comrade.' "'Not much, then,' rejoined McNabbs. "'But go on, and tell us the story.' "'There was once,' said Paganel, "'a son of the great Harun al Rashid, "'who was unhappy, and went to consult an old dervish. "'The old sage told him that happiness was a difficult thing to find in this world.' However, he added, I know an infallible means of procuring your happiness. What is it? asked the young prince. It is to put the shirt of a happy man on your shoulders. Whereupon the prince embraced the old man and set out at once to search for his talisman. He visited all the capital cities in the world. He tried on the shirts of kings and emperors and princes and nobles, but all in vain. He could not find one man among them who was happy. Then he put on the shirts of artists, and warriors, and merchants, but these were no better. By this time he had travelled a long way, without finding what he sought. At last he began to despair of success, and began sorrowfully to retrace his steps back to his father's palace. When one day he heard an honest peasant singing so merrily as he drove the plough, that he thought, surely this man is happy, 
if there is such a thing as, as happiness on the earth. Forthwith he accosted him and said, Are you happy? Yes, was the reply. There is nothing you desire? Nothing. You would not change your lot for that of a king? Never. Well then, sell me your shirt. My shirt? I haven't one. End of Book 1, Chapter 24「Chapter twenty five of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. In Search of the Castaways by Jules Verne. Chapter twenty five Between Fire and Water. Before turning into their nest, as Paginal called it, he and Robert and Glenarvan climbed up into the observatory to have one more inspection of the liquid plain. It was about nine o'clock. The sun had just sunk behind the glowing mists of the western horizon. The eastern horizon was gradually assuming a most stormy aspect. A thick dark bar of cloud was rising higher and higher, and by degrees extinguishing the stars. Before long, half the sky was overspread. Evidently motive power lay in the cloud itself, for there was not a breath of wind. Absolute calm reigned in the atmosphere. Not a leaf stirred on the tree. Not a ripple disturbed the surface of the water. There seemed to be scarcely any air, even, as though some vast pneumatic machine had rarefied it. The entire atmosphere was charged to the utmost with electricity, the presence of which sent a thrill through the whole nervous system of all animated beings. "'We are going to have a storm,' said Paginal. "'You're not afraid of thunder, are you, Robert?' asked Glenarvan. "'No, my lord,' exclaimed Robert. "'Well, my boy, so much the better, for a storm is not far off.' "'And a violent one, too,' added Paginal, "'if I may judge by the look of things.' "'It is not the storm I care about,' said Glenarvan, "'so much as the torrents of rain that will accompany it. "'We shall be soaked to the skin. "'Whatever you may say, Paginal, "'a nest won't do for a man, "'and you will learn that soon, to your cost.' "'With the help of philosophy, it will,' replied Paginal. "'Philosophy! "'That won't keep you from getting drenched.' "'No, but it will warm you.' "'Well,' said Glenarvan, "'we had better go down to our friends and advise them to wrap themselves up in their philosophy and their ponchos as tightly as possible, and above all to lay in a stock of patience, for we shall need it before very long.' Glenarvan gave a last glance at the angry sky. The clouds now covered it entirely. Only a dim streak of light shone faintly in the west. A dark shadow lay on the water and it could hardly be distinguished from the thick vapours above it. There was no sensation of light or sound. All was darkness and silence around. "'Let us go down,' said Glenarvan. "'The thunder will soon burst over us.' On returning to the bottom of the tree, they found themselves, to their great surprise, in a sort of dim twilight, produced by myriads of luminous specks which appeared buzzing confusedly over the surface of the water. "'It is phosphorescence, I suppose,' said Glenarvan. "'No, but phosphorescent insects, positive glow-worms, living diamonds, which the ladies of Buenos Aires convert into magnificent ornaments.' "'What?' exclaimed Robert. "'Those sparks flying about are insects?' "'Yes, my boy.' Robert caught one in his hand and found Paginal was right. It was a kind of large drone, an inch long and the Indians call it Tuco Tuco. This curious specimen of the Coleoptera sheds its radiance from two spots in the front of its breastplate, and the light is sufficient to read by. Holding his watch close to the insect, Paginal saw distinctly that the time was ten p.m. On rejoining the Major and his three sailors, Glenarvan warned them of the approaching storm, 
and advised them to secure themselves in their beds of branches as firmly as possible, for there was no doubt that after the first clap of thunder the wind would become unchained, and the ombu would be violently shaken. Though they could not defend themselves from the waters above, they might at least keep out of the rushing current beneath. They wished one another good night, though hardly daring to hope for it, and then each one rolled himself in his poncho and lay down to sleep. But the approach of the great phenomena of nature excites vague uneasiness in the heart of every sentient being, even in the most strong-minded. The whole party in the ombu felt agitated and oppressed, and not one of them could close his eyes. The first peal of thunder found them wide awake. It occurred about eleven p.m., and sounded like a distant rolling. Glenarvan ventured to creep out of the sheltering foliage, and made his way to the extremity of the horizontal branch to take a look around. The deep blackness of the night was already scarified with sharp bright lines, which were reflected back by the water with unerring exactness. The clouds had rent in many parts, but noiselessly, like some soft cotton material. After attentively observing both the zenith and horizon, Glenarvan went back to the centre of the trunk. "'Well, Glenarvan, what's your report?' asked Paganel. "'I say it is beginning in good earnest, and if it goes on so, we shall have a terrible storm.' "'So much the better,' replied the enthusiastic Paganel. "'I should like a grand exhibition, since we can't run away.' "'That's another of your theories,' said the Major. "'And one of my best, McNabs. I am of Glenarvan's opinion that the storm will be superb. Just a minute ago, when I was trying to sleep, several facts occurred to my memory that make me hope it will, for we are in the region of great electrical tempests. For instance, I have read somewhere that in 1793, in this very province of Buenos Aires, Lightning struck thirty-seven times during one single storm. My colleague, M. Martin de Moussy, counted fifty-five minutes of uninterrupted rolling. "'Watch in hand,' asked the Major. "'Watch in hand! Only one thing makes me uneasy,' added Paganel. "'If it is of any use to be uneasy, and that is, that the culminating point of this plane is just this very ombu where we are.' A lightning conductor would be very serviceable to us at present, for it is this tree especially, among all that grow in the pampas, that the thunder has a particular affection for. Besides, I need not tell you, friend, that learned men tell us never to take refuge under trees during a storm. Most seasonable advice, certainly, in our circumstances, said the Major. I must confess, Paginel, replied Glenarvan that you might have chosen a better time for this reassuring information. Bah! replied Paginel. All times are good for getting information. Ha! Now it's beginning. Louder peals of thunder interrupted this inopportune conversation, the violence increasing with the noise till the whole atmosphere seemed to vibrate with rapid oscillations. The incessant flashes of lightning took various forms. Some darted down perpendicularly from the sky five or six times in the same place in succession. Others would have excited the interests of a savant to the highest degree, for though Arago, in his curious statistics, only cites two examples of forked lightning, it was visible here hundreds of times. Some of the flashes branched out in a thousand different directions, making coralliform zigzags, and threw out wonderful jets of arborescent light. Soon the whole sky, from east to north, seemed supported by a phosphoric band of intense brilliancy. This kept increasing by degrees till it overspread the entire horizon, kindling the clouds which were faithfully mirrored in the waters as if they were masses of combustible material, beneath, and presented the appearance of an immense globe of fire, the centre of which was the ombu. Glenarvan and his companions gazed silently at this terrifying spectacle. They could not make their voices heard, but the sheets of white light which enwrapped them every now and then revealed the face of one and another, sometimes the calm features of the Major, sometimes the eager, curious glance of Paginel, or the energetic face of Glenarvan. 
and at others the scared eyes of the terrified Robert, and the careless looks of the sailors, investing them with a weird spectral aspect. However, as yet no rain had fallen, and the wind had not risen in the least. But this state of things was of short duration. Before long the cataracts of the sky burst forth, and came down in vertical streams. As the large drops fell splashing into the lake, fiery sparks seemed to fly out from the illuminated surface. Was the rain the finale of the storm? If so, Glenarvan and his companions would escape scot-free, except for a few vigorous douche-baths. No. At the very height of this struggle of the electric forces of the atmosphere, a large ball of fire appeared suddenly at the extremity of the horizontal parent branch, as thick as a man's wrist, and surrounded with black smoke. This ball, after turning round and round for a few seconds, burst like a bombshell, and with so much noise that the explosion was distinctly audible among the general fracas. A sulphurous smoke filled the air, and complete silence reigned till the voice of Tom Austin was heard shouting, "'The tree is on fire!' Tom was right. In a moment, as if some fireworks were being ignited, the flame ran along the west side of the ombu, the dead wood and nests of dried grass, and the whole sap, which was of a spongy texture, supplied food for its devouring activity. The wind had risen now and fanned the flame. It was time to flee, and Glenarvan and his party hurried away to the eastern side of their refuge, which was meantime untouched by the fire. They were all silent, troubled, and terrified, as they watched branch after branch shrivel and crack and writhe in the flame like living serpents, and then drop into the swollen torrent, still red and gleaming, as it was borne swiftly along on the rapid current. The flame sometimes rose to a prodigious height, and seemed almost lost in the atmosphere, and sometimes, beaten down by the hurricane, closely enveloped the ombu like a robe of Nessus. Terror seized the entire group. They were almost suffocated with smoke, and scorched with the unbearable heat, for the conflagration had already reached the lower branches on their side of the ombu. To extinguish it or check its progress was impossible, and they saw themselves irrevocably condemned to a torturing death, like the victims of Hindu divinities. At last, their situation was absolutely intolerable. Of the two deaths staring them in the face, they had better choose the less cruel. "'To the water!' exclaimed Glenarvan. Wilson, who was nearest the flames, had already plunged into the lake, but next minute he screamed out in the most violent terror, "'Help! Help!' Austin rushed toward him, and with the assistance of the Major, dragged him up again on the tree. "'What's the matter?' they asked. "'Alligators! Alligators!' replied Wilson. The whole foot of the tree appeared to be surrounded by these formidable animals of the Saurian order. By the glare of the flames they were immediately recognized by Paganel as the ferocious species peculiar to America called caimans in the Spanish territories. About ten of them were there, lashing the water with their powerful tails, and attacking the ombu with the long teeth of their lower jaw. At this sight the unfortunate men gave themselves up to be lost. A frightful death was in store for them, since they must either be devoured by the fire or by the caimans. Even the Major said in a calm voice, This is the beginning of the end now. There are circumstances in which men are powerless, when the unchained elements can only be combated by other elements. Glenarvan gazed with haggard looks at the fire and water leagued against him, hardly knowing what deliverance to implore from heaven. The violence of the storm had abated, but it had developed in the atmosphere a considerable quantity of vapors, to which electricity was about to communicate immense force. An enormous water-spout was gradually forming in the south, a cone of thick mists, but with the point at the bottom, and base at the top linking together the turbulent water and the angry clouds. This meteor soon began to move forward, turning over and over on itself with dizzy rapidity, and sweeping up into its centre a column of water from the lake, while its gyratory motions made all the surrounding currents of air rush towards it. 
A few seconds more, and the gigantic waterspout threw itself on the ombu, and caught it up in its whirl. The tree shook to its roots. Glenarvan could fancy the caiman's teeth were tearing it up from the soil, for as he and his companions held on, each clinging firmly to the other, they felt the towering ombu give way, and the next minute it fell right over with a terrible hissing noise as the flaming branches touched the foaming water. It was the work of an instant. Already the waterspout had passed, to carry on its destructive work elsewhere. It seemed to empty the lake in its passage by continually drawing up the water into itself. The ombu now began to drift rapidly along, impelled by wind and current. All the caimans had taken their departure, except one that was crawling over the upturned roots, and coming toward the poor refugees with wide open jaws. But Mulrady, seizing hold of a branch that was half burned off, struck the monster such a tremendous blow that it fell back into the torrent and disappeared, lashing the water with its formidable tail. Glenarvan and his companions, being thus delivered from the voracious Saurians, stationed themselves on the branches, windward of the conflagration, while the ombu sailed along like a blazing fire-ship through the dark night the flames spreading themselves round like sails before the breath of the hurricane. End of chapter Chapter 26 of In Search of the Castaways This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. In Search of the Castaways by Jules Verne Chapter 26 The Return on Board For two hours the Ombu navigated the immense lake without reaching terra firma. The flames which were devouring it had gradually died out. The chief danger of their frightful passage was thus removed, and the Major went the length of saying that he should not be surprised if they were saved after all. The direction of the current remained unchanged, always running from southwest to northeast. Profound darkness had again set in, only illumined here and there by a parting flash of lightning. The storm was nearly over. The rain had given place to light mists, which a breath of wind dispersed, and the heavy masses of cloud had separated, and now streaked the sky in long bands. The ombu was borne onward so rapidly by the impetuous torrent that any one might have supposed some powerful locomotive engine was hidden in its trunk. It seemed likely enough they might continue drifting in this way for days. About three o'clock in the morning, however, the Major noticed that the roots were beginning to graze the ground occasionally, and by sounding the depth of the water with a long branch, Tom Austin found that they were getting on rising ground. Twenty minutes afterward, the ombu stopped short with a violent jolt. "'Land! Land!' shouted Paganel, in a ringing tone. The extremity of the calcine bow had struck some hillock, and never were sailors more glad. The rock to them was the port." Already Robert and Wilson had leaped on to the solid plateau with a loud, joyful hurrah, when a well-known whistle was heard. The gallop of a horse resounded over the plain, and the tall form of Thalcave emerged from the darkness. "'Thalcave! Thalcave!' they all cried with one voice. "'Amigos!' replied the Patagonian, who had been waiting for the travellers here in the same place where the current had landed himself. As he spoke, he lifted up Robert in his arms, and hugged him to his breast, never imagining that Paginot was hanging on to him. A general and hearty handshaking followed, and every one rejoiced at seeing their faithful guide again. Then the Patagonian led the way into the hangar of a deserted estancia, where there was a good, blazing fire to warm them, and a substantial meal of fine, juicy slices of venison soon broiling, of which they did not leave a crumb. When their minds had calmed down a little, and they were able to reflect on the dangers they had come through from flood and fire and alligators, they could scarcely believe they had escaped. Thalcave, in a few words, 
gave Paginal an account of himself since they parted, entirely ascribing his deliverance to his intrepid horse. Then Paginal tried to make him understand their new interpretation of the document, and the consequent hopes they were indulging. Whether the Indian actually understood his ingenious hypothesis was a question, but he saw that they were glad and confident, and that was enough for him. As can easily be imagined, after their compulsory rest on the Ombu, the travellers were up the times and ready to start. At eight o'clock they set off. No means of transport being procurable so far south, they were compelled to walk. However, it was not more than forty miles now that they had to go, and Thaouka would not refuse to give a lift occasionally to a tired pedestrian, or even to a couple at a pinch. In thirty-six hours they might reach the shores of the Atlantic. The low-lying tract of marshy ground, still under water, soon lay behind them, as Thalcave led them upward to the higher plains. Here the Argentine territory resumed its monotonous aspect. A few clumps of trees, planted by European hands, might chance to be visible among the pasturage, but quite as rarely as in Tandil and Tapalcum Sierras. The native trees are only found on the edge of long prairies and about Cape Corrientes. Next day, though still fifteen miles distant, the proximity of the ocean was sensibly felt. The Verazan, a peculiar wind, which blows regularly half of the day and night, bent down the heads of the tall grasses. Thinly planted woods rose to view, and small tree-like mimosas, bushes of acacia, and tufts of cura mantel. Here and there, shining like pieces of broken glass, were salinous lagoons, which increased the difficulty of the journey as the travellers had to wind round them to get past. They pushed on as quickly as possible, hoping to reach Lake Salado on the shores of the ocean the same day, and at 8 p.m., when they found themselves in front of the sand hills two hundred feet high, which skirt the coast, they were all tolerably tired. But when the long murmur of the distant ocean fell on their ears, the exhausted men forgot their fatigue, and ran up the sand hills with surprising agility. But it was getting quite dark already, and their eager gaze could discover no traces of the Duncan on the gloomy expanse of water that met their sight. "'But she is there for all that!' exclaimed Glenarvan, waiting for us, and running alongside. "'We shall see her to-morrow,' replied McNabbs. Tom Austin hailed the invisible yacht, but there was no response. The wind was very high, and the sea rough. The clouds were scudding along from the west, and the spray of the waves dashed up even to the sand hills. It was little wonder, then, if the man on the lookout could neither hear nor make himself heard, supposing the Duncan were there. There was no shelter on the coast for her, neither bay nor cove nor port, not so much as a creek. The shore was composed of sandbanks which ran out into the sea, and were more dangerous to approach than rocky shoals. The sandbanks irritate the waves, and make the sea so particularly rough, that in heavy weather vessels that run aground there are invariably dashed to pieces." Though, then, the Duncan would keep far away from such a coast, John Manglis is a prudent captain to get near. Tom Austin, however, was of the opinion that she would be able to keep five miles out. The Major advised his impatient relative to restrain himself to circumstances. Since there was no means of dissipating the darkness, what was the use of straining his eyes by vainly endeavouring to pierce through it? He set to work immediately to prepare the night's encampment beneath the shelter of the sand hills, the last provisions supplied the last meal, and afterward each, following the major's example, scooped out a hole in the sand, which made a comfortable enough bed, and then covered himself with the soft material up to his chin, and fell into a heavy sleep. But Glenarvan kept watch. There was still a stiff breeze of wind, and the ocean had not recovered its equilibrium after the recent storm. The waves, at all times tumultuous, now broke over the sandbanks with a noise like thunder. Glenarvan could not rest, knowing the Duncan was so near him. As to supposing she had not arrived at the appointed rendezvous, that was out of the question. Glenarvan had left the Bay of Talconwano on the 14th of October, 
and arrived on the shores of the Atlantic on the 12th of November. He had taken thirty days to cross Chile, the Cordilleras, the Pampas, and the Argentine plains, giving the Duncan ample time to double Cape Horn and arrive on the opposite side. For such a fast runner there was no impediments. Certainly the storm had been very violent, and its fury must have been terrible on such a vast battlefield as the Atlantic, but the yacht was a good ship, and the captain was a good sailor. He was bound to be there, and he would be there. These reflections, however, did not calm Glenarvan. When the heart and the reason are struggling, it is generally the heart that wins the mastery. The laird of Malcolm Castle felt the presence of loved ones about him in the darkness, as he wandered up and down the lonely strand. He gazed and listened, and even fancied he caught occasional glimpses of a faint light. "'I am not mistaken,' he said to himself. "'I saw a ship's light, one of the lights on the Duncan. Oh, why can't I see in the dark?' All at once the thought rushed across him that Paginel said he was a night to lope, and could see at night. He must go and wake him. The learned geographer was sleeping as sound as a mole. A strong arm pulled him up out of the sand and made him call out, "'Who goes there?' "'It is I, Paginal.' "'Who?' "'Glenarvan. Come, I need your eyes.' "'My eyes,' replied Paginal, rubbing them vigorously. "'Yes, I need your eyes to make out the Duncan in this darkness, so come.' "'Confound the Nyctalopia!' said Paginel inwardly, though delighted to be of any service to his friend. He got up and shook his stiffened limbs, and, stretching and yawning as most people do when roused from sleep, followed Glenarvan to the beach. Glenarvan begged him to examine the distant horizon across the sea, which he did most conscientiously for some minutes. "'Well, do you see nothing?' asked Glenarvan. "'Not a thing.' Even a cat couldn't see two steps before her. Look for a red light or a green one, her larboard or starboard light. I see neither a red nor a green light. Oh, it's pitch dark, replied Paginel, his eyes involuntarily beginning to close. For half an hour he followed his impatient friend, mechanically letting his head frequently drop on his chest, and raising it again with a start. At last he neither answered nor spoke, and he reeled about like a drunken man. Glenarvan looked at him, and found he was sound asleep. Without attempting to wake him, he took his arm, led him back to his hole, and buried him again comfortably. At dawn next morning all the slumberers started to their feet and rushed to the shore, shouting, Hurrah! Hurrah! as Glenarvan's loud cry, The Duncan! The Duncan! broke upon his ear. There she was, five miles out, her courses carefully reefed, and her steam half up. Her smoke was lost in the morning mist. The sea was so violent that a vessel of her tonnage could not have ventured safely nearer the sandbanks. Glenarvan, by the aid of Paginel's telescope, closely observed the movements of the yacht. It was evident that John Mangles had not perceived his passengers, for he continued his course as before. But at this very moment Thalcave fired his carbine in the direction of the yacht. They listened and looked, but no signal of recognition was returned. A second and a third time the Indian fired, awakening the echoes among the sand hills. At last a white smoke was seen issuing from the side of the yacht. "'They see us!' exclaimed Glenarvan. "'That's the cannon of the Duncan!' A few seconds, and the heavy boom of the cannon came across the water, and died away on the shore. The sails were instantly altered, and the steam got up so as to get as near the coast as possible. Presently, through the glass, they saw a boat lowered. "'Lady Helena will not be able to come,' said Tom Austin. "'It is too rough.' "'Nor John Mangles,' added McNabbs. "'He cannot leave the ship.' "'My sister! My sister!' cried Robert, stretching out his arms towards the yacht which was now rolling violently. "'Oh, how I wish I could get on board!' said Glenarvan. "'Patience, Edward, you will be there in a couple of hours,' replied the Major. Two hours. 
but it was impossible for a boat, a six-oared one, to come and go in a shorter space of time. Glenarvan went back to Thalcave, who stood beside Thaouka, with his arms crossed, looking quietly at the troubled waves. Glenarvan took his hand, and pointing to the yacht, said, Come. The Indian gently shook his head. Come, friend, repeated Glenarvan. No, said Thalcave gently. Here is Thaouka, and there, the Pampas, he added, embracing with a passionate gesture the wide-stretching prairies. Glenarvan understood his refusal. He knew that the Indian would never forsake the prairie, where the bones of his fathers were whitening, and he knew the religious attachment of these sons of the desert for their native land. He did not urge Thalcave longer, therefore, but simply pressed his hand. Nor could he find it in his heart to insist, when the Indian, smiling as usual, would not accept the price of his services, pushing back the money and saying, For the sake of friendship. Glenarvan could not reply, but he wished at least to leave the brave fellow some souvenir of his European friends. What was there to give, however? Arms, horses, everything had been destroyed in the unfortunate inundation, and his friends were no richer than himself. He was quite at a loss how to show his recognition of the disinterestedness of this noble guide, when a happy thought struck him. He had an exquisite portrait of Lady Helena in his pocket, a chef d'oeuvre of Lawrence. This he drew out and offered to Thalcave, simply saying, My wife. The Indian gazed at it with a softened eye, and said, Good and beautiful. Then Robert and Paganel and the Major, and the rest, exchanged touching farewells with the faithful Patagonian. Thalcave embraced them each, and pressed them to his broad chest. Paganel made him accept a map of South America and the two oceans, which he had often seen the Indian looking at with interest. It was the most precious thing the geographer possessed. As for Robert, he had only caresses to bestow, and these he lavished on his friend, not forgetting to give a share to Thaouka. The boat from the Duncan was now fast approaching, and in another minute had glided into a narrow channel between the sandbanks and run ashore. "'My wife,' were Glenarvan's first words, "'My sister,' said Robert, "'Lady Helena and Miss Grant are waiting for you on board,' replied the coxswain. "'But lose no time, Your Honour. We have not a minute, for the tide is beginning to ebb already.' The last kindly adieus were spoken, and Thalcave accompanied his friends to the boat, which had been pushed back into the water. Just as Robert was going to step in, the Indian took him in his arms, and gazed tenderly into his face— then he said, "'Now go. You are a man.' "'Good-bye. Good-bye, friend,' said Glenarvan once more. "'Shall we never see each other again?' Paginot called out. "'Kin sabe. Who knows?' replied Thalcave, lifting his arms toward heaven. These were the Indian's last words, dying away on the breeze, as the boat receded gradually from the shore." For a long time his dark, motionless silhouette stood out against the sky, through the white dashing spray of the waves. Then by degrees his tall form began to diminish in size, till at last his friends of a day lost sight of him altogether. An hour afterward Robert was the first to leap on board the Duncan. He flung his arms around Mary's neck, amid the loud, joyous hurrahs of the crew on the yacht. Thus the journey across South America was accomplished, the given line of march being scrupulously adhered to throughout. Neither mountains nor rivers had made the travellers change their course, and though they had not had to encounter any ill-will from men, their generous intrepidity had been often enough roughly put to the proof by the fury of the unchained elements. End of Book One Book Two, Chapter One of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways, or The Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. 
Book Two, Australia, Chapter One: A New Destination. For the first few moments, the joy of reunion completely filled the hearts. Lord Glenarvan had taken care that the ill success of their expedition should not throw a gloom over the pleasure of meeting. His very first words being, "Cheer up, friends! Cheer up! Captain Grant is not with us, but we have a certainty of finding him." Only such an assurance as this would have restored hope to those on board the Duncan. Lady Helena and Mary Grant had been sorely tried by the suspense, as they stood on the poop waiting for the arrival of the boat, and trying to count the number of its passengers. Alternate hope and fear agitated the bosom of poor Mary. Sometimes she fancied she could see her father, Harry Grant, and sometimes she gave way to despair. Her heart throbbed violently. She could not speak, and indeed could scarcely stand. Lady Helena put her arm round her waist to support her, but the captain, John Mangles, who stood close beside them, spoke no encouraging word, for his practised eye saw plainly that the captain was not there. He is there. He is coming. Oh, father! Exclaimed the young girl. But as the boat came nearer, her illusion was dispelled. All hope forsook her, and she would have sunk in despair, but for the reassuring voice of Glenarvan. After their mutual embraces were over. Lady Helena and Mary Grant and John Mangles were informed of the principal incidents of the expedition, and especially of the new interpretation of the document, due to the sagacity of Jacques Paganel. His lordship also spoke in the most eulogistic terms of Robert, of whom Mary might well be proud. His courage and devotion, and the dangers he had run, were all shown up in strong relief by his patron, till the modest boy did not know which way to look, and was obliged to hide his burning cheeks in his sister's arms. No need to blush, Robert," said John Mangles. "Your conduct has been worthy of your name." And he leaned over the boy and pressed his lips on his cheek, still wet with Mary's tears. The major and Paganel, it need hardly be said, came in for their due share of welcome, and Lady Helena only regretted she could not shake hands with the brave and generous Thalcave. McNab soon slipped away to his cabin and began to shave himself as coolly and composedly as possible. While Paganel flew here and there, like a bee sipping the sweets of compliments and smiles, he wanted to embrace every one on board the yacht, and beginning with Lady Helena and Mary Grant, wound up with Monsieur Aubinet, the steward, who could only acknowledge so polite an attention by announcing that breakfast was ready. Breakfast! Exclaimed Paganel. Yes, Monsieur Paganel. A real breakfast on a real table with a cloth and napkins. Certainly, Monsieur Paganel. And we shall have neither charqui nor hard eggs nor fillets of ostrich. Oh, Monsieur," said Albinet in an aggrieved tone. "I don't want to hurt your feelings, my friend," said the geographer, smiling. "But for a month that has been our usual bill of fare, and when we dined, we stretched ourselves full length on the ground, unless we sat astride on the trees. Consequently, the meal you have just announced seemed to me like a dream or a fiction or chimera. Well, Monsieur Paganel, come along and let us prove its reality." Said Lady Helena, who could not help laughing. "Take my arm," replied the gallant geographer. "Has his lordship any orders to give me about the Duncan?" asked John Mangles. "After breakfast, John," replied Glenarvan. "We'll discuss the program of our new expedition en famille." Monsieur Aubinet's breakfast seemed quite a fete to the hungry guests. It was pronounced excellent and even superior to the festivities of the Pampas. Paganel was helped twice to each dish through absence of mind. He said. This unlucky word reminded Lady Helena of the amiable Frenchman's propensity, and made her ask if he had ever fallen into his old habits while they were away. The major and Glenarvan exchanged smiling glances, and Paganel burst out laughing and protested on his honor that he would never be caught tripping again once more during the whole voyage. After this prelude, he gave an amusing recital of his disastrous mistake in learning Spanish, and his profound study of Camoens. After all, he added, it's an ill wind that blows nobody good, and I don't regret the mistake. Why not, my worthy friend? Asked the major. Because I not only know Spanish but Portuguese. I can speak two languages instead of one. Upon my word, I never thought of that," said McNabbs. "My compliments, Paganel. My sincere compliments." But Paganel was too busily engaged with his knife and fork to lose a single mouthful, though he did his best to eat and talk at the same time. He was so much taken up with his plate, however, that one little fact quite escaped his observation, though Glenarvan noticed it at once. This was that John Mangles had grown particularly attentive to Mary Grant. A significant glance from Lady Helena told him, moreover, how affairs stood, and inspired him with affectionate sympathy for the young lovers. 
But nothing of this was apparent in his manner to John, for his next question was what sort of a voyage he had made. We could not have had a better, but I must apprise your lordship that I did not go through the Straits of Magellan again. What? You doubled Cape Horn, and I was not there, exclaimed Paganel. Hang yourself, said the Major. Selfish fellow, you advise me to do that because you want my rope, retorted the geographer. Well, you see, my dear Paganel, unless you have the gift of ubiquity, you can't be in two places at once. While you were scouring the Pampas, you could not be doubling Cape Horn. That doesn't prevent my regretting it, replied Paganel. Here the subject dropped, and John continued his account of his voyage. On arriving at Cape Pilaras, he had found the winds dead against him, and therefore made for the south, coasting along the Desolation Isle, and after going as far as the sixty-seventh degree southern latitude, had doubled Cape Horn, passed by Tierra del Fuego, and the Straits of La Mare, keeping close to the Patagonian shore. At Cape Corrientes they encountered the terrible storm which had handled the travellers across the Pampa so roughly, but the yacht had borne it bravely, and for the last three days had stood right out to sea, till the welcome gun of the expedition was heard announcing the arrival of the anxiously looked-for party. It was only justice, the captain added, that he should mention the intrepid bearing of Lady Helena and Mary Grant throughout the whole hurricane. They had not shown the least fear, unless for their friends, who might possibly be exposed to the fury of the tempest. After John Mangles had finished his narrative, Glenarvan turned to Mary and said, My dear Miss Mary, the captain has been doing homage to your noble qualities, and I am glad to think you are not unhappy on board his ship. How could I be? replied Mary, naively, looking at Lady Helena, and the young captain, too, likely enough. Oh, my sister is very fond of you, Mr. John, and so am I, exclaimed Robert. And so am I of you, my dear boy, returned the captain, a little abashed by Robert's innocent avowal, which had kindled a faint blush on Mary's cheek. Then he managed to turn the conversation to safer topics by saying, And now that your lordship has heard all about the doings of the Duncan, perhaps you will give us some details of your own journey, and tell us more about the exploits of our young hero. Nothing could be more agreeable than such a recital to Lady Helena and Mary Grant, and accordingly Lord Glenarvan hastened to satisfy their curiosity, going over incident by incident, the entire march from one ocean to another, the pass of the Andes, the earthquake, the disappearance of Robert, his capture by the condor, Thalcave's providential shot, the episode of the red wolves, the devotion of the young lad, Sergeant Manuel, the inundations, the caimans, the water-spout, the night on the Atlantic shore, all these details, amusing or terrible, excited by turns laughter and horror in the listeners. Often and often Robert came in for caresses from his sister and Lady Helena. Never was a boy so much embraced, or by such enthusiastic friends. "'And now, friends,' added Lord Glenarvan, when he had finished his narrative, "'we must think of the present. The past is gone, but the future is ours. Let us come back to Captain Harry Grant.' As soon as breakfast was over, they all went into Lord Glenarvan's private cabin and seated themselves round a table, covered with charts and plans, to talk over the matter fully. "'My dear Helena,' said Lord Glenarvan, "'I told you when we came on board a little while ago, that though we had not brought back Captain Grant, our hope of finding him was stronger than ever. The result of our journey across America is this. We have reached the conviction, or rather absolute certainty, that the shipwreck never occurred on the shores of the Atlantic nor Pacific.' The natural inference is that, as far as regards Patagonia, our interpretation of the document was erroneous. Most fortunately, our friend Paganel, in a happy moment of inspiration, discovered the mistake. He has proved clearly that we have been on the wrong track, and so explained the document that all doubt whatever is removed from our minds. However, as the document is in French, I will ask Paganel to go over it for your benefit." The learned geographer, thus called upon, executed his task in the most convincing manner, descanting on the syllables Goni and Indi, and extracting Australia out of Austral. He pointed out that Captain Grant, on leaving the coast of Peru to return to Europe, might have been carried away with his disabled ship by the southern currents of the Pacific, right to the shores of Australia, and his hypotheses were so ingenious and his deductions so subtle, that even the matter-of-fact John Mangles, a difficult judge, and most unlikely to be led away by any flights of imagination, was completely satisfied. At the conclusion of Paganel's dissertation, Glenarvan announced that the Duncan would sail immediately for Australia. But before the decisive orders were given, McNabbs asked for a few minutes' hearing. "'Say away, McNabbs,' replied Glenarvan. "'I have no intention of weakening the arguments of my friend Paganel, and still less of refuting them. 
I consider them wise and weighty, and deserving our attention, and I think them justly entitled to form the basis of our future researches. But still I should like them to be submitted to a final examination, in order to mark their worth uncontestable and uncontested. "'Go on, Major,' said Paganel. "'I am ready to answer all your questions.' "'They are simple enough, as you will see. Five months ago, when we left the Clyde, we had studied these same documents, and their interpretation then appeared quite plain. No other coast but the western coast of Patagonia could possibly, we thought, have been the scene of the shipwreck. We had not even the shadow of a doubt on the subject.' "'That's true,' replied Glenarvan. "'A little later,' continued the Major, "'when a providential fit of absence of mind came over Paganel, and brought him on board the yacht, the documents were submitted to him, and he approved our plan of search most unreservedly. "'I do not deny it,' said Paganel. "'And yet we were mistaken,' resumed the Major. "'Yes, we were mistaken,' returned Paganel. "'But it is only human to make a mistake, while to persist in it a man must be a fool. "'Stop, Paganel. Don't excite yourself. I don't mean to say that we should prolong our search in America.' "'What is it, then, that you want?' asked Glenarvan. "'A confession, nothing more.' a confession that Australia now as evidently appears to be the theatre of the shipwreck of the Britannia as America did before. "'We confess it willingly,' replied Paganel. "'Very well, then, since that is the case, my advice is not to let your imagination rely on successive and contradictory evidence. Who knows whether after Australia some other country might not appear with equal certainty to be the place, and we may have to recommence our search?' Glenarvan and Paganel looked at each other silently, struck by the justice of these remarks. I should like you, therefore, continued the Major, before we actually start for Australia, to make one more examination of the documents. Here they are, and here are the charts. Let us take up each point in succession through which the thirty-seventh parallel passes, and see if we come across any other country which would agree with the precise indications of the document. Nothing can be more easily and quickly done, replied Paganel, for countries are not very numerous in this latitude happily. "'Well, look,' said the Major, displaying an English planisphere on the plan of Mercator's chart, and presenting the appearance of a terrestrial globe. He placed it before Lady Helena, and then they all stood round, so as to be able to follow the argument of Paganel. "'As I have said already,' resumed the learned geographer, "'after having crossed South America, the thirty-seventh degree of latitude cuts the islands of Tristan da Cunha. Now I maintain that none of the words of the document could relate to these islands.' The documents were examined with the most minute care, and the conclusion unanimously reached was that these islands were entirely out of the question. "'Let us go on, then,' resumed Paganel. "'After leaving the Atlantic, we passed two degrees below the Cape of Good Hope, and into the Indian Ocean. Only one group of islands is found on this route, the Amsterdam Isles. Now, then, we must examine these as we did the Tristan da Cunha group. After a close survey, the Amsterdam Isles were rejected in their turn. Not a single word, or part of a word, French, English, or German, could apply to this group in the Indian Ocean. "'Now we come to Australia,' continued Paganel. "'The thirty-seventh parallel touches this continent at Cape Bernoulli, and leaves it at Twofold Bay. You will agree with me that, without straining the text, the English word stra and the French one austral may relate to Australia. The thing is too plain to need proof.' The conclusion of Paganel met with unanimous approval. Every probability was in his favour. "'And where is the next point?' asked McNabbs. "'That is easily answered. After leaving Twofold Bay we cross an arm of the sea which extends to New Zealand. Here I must call your attention to the fact that the French word continent means a continent, irrefragably. Captain Grant could not, then, have found refuge in New Zealand, which is only an island. However that might be, though, examine and compare, and go over and over each word, and see if, by any possibility, they can be made to fit this new country. "'In no way whatever,' replied John Mangles, after a minute investigation of the documents and the planisphere. "'No,' chimed in all the rest, and even the Major himself, "'it cannot apply to New Zealand.' "'Now,' went on Paganel, "'in all this immense space between this large island and the American coast, there is only one solitary, barren little island crossed by the thirty-seventh parallel. "'And what is its name?' asked the Major. "'Here it is, marked on the map.' It is Maria Theresa, a name of which there is not a single trace in either of the three documents. Not the slightest, said Glenarvan. I leave you, then, my friends, to decide whether all these probabilities, not to say certainties, are not in favour of the Australian continent. Evidently, replied the captain and all the others. Well, then, John, said Glenarvan, the next question is, have you provisions and coal enough? 
"'Yes, Your Honour. I took in an ample store at Talcahuano, and besides, we can easily replenish our stock of coal at Cape Town. "'Well, then, give orders.' "'Let me make one more observation,' interrupted McNabbs. "'Go on, then. Whatever likelihood of success Australia may offer us, wouldn't it be advisable to stop a day or two at the Tristan da Cunha Islands and the Amsterdam? They lie in our route, and would not take us the least out of the way. Then we should be able to ascertain if the Britannia had left any traces of her shipwreck there.' "'Incredulous Major!' exclaimed Paganel. "'He still sticks to his idea.' "'I stick to this, anyway, that I don't want to have to retrace our steps, supposing that Australia should disappoint our sanguine hopes.' "'It seems to me a good precaution,' replied Glenarvan. "'And I'm not the one to dissuade you from it,' returned Paganel. "'Quite the contrary.' "'Steer straight for Tristan da Cunha. "'Immediately, Your Honor," replied the captain, going on deck, while Robert and Mary Grant overwhelmed Lord Glenarvan with their grateful thanks. Shortly after, the Duncan had left the American coast, and was running eastward, her sharp keel rapidly cutting her way through the waves of the Atlantic Ocean. End of Book Two, Chapter One Book Two, Chapter Two of In Search of the Castaways This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways, or the Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne, Book Two, Chapter Two, Tristan de Chuna and the Isle of Amsterdam. If the yacht had followed the line of the equator, the 196 degrees which separated Australia from America, or, more correctly, Cape Bernoulli from Cape Corrientes, would have been equal to 11,760 geographical miles. But along the 37th parallel, these same degrees, owing to the form of the earth, only represent 9,480 miles. From the American coast to Tristan de Tuna is reckoned 2,100 miles, a distance which John Mangles hoped to clear in ten days, if east winds did not retard the motion of the yacht. But he was not long uneasy on that score for toward evening the breeze sensibly lulled, and then changed altogether, giving the Duncan a fair field on a calm sea for displaying her incomparable qualities as a sailor. The passengers had fallen back into their ordinary ship life, and it hardly seemed as if they really could have been absent a whole month. Instead of the Pacific, the Atlantic stretched itself out before them, and there was scarcely a shade of difference in the ways of the two oceans. The elements, after having handled them so roughly, seemed now disposed to favour them to the utmost. The sea was tranquil, and the wind kept in the right quarter, so that the yacht could spread all her canvas, and lend its aid, if needed, to the indefatigable steam stored up in the boiler. Under such conditions the voyage was safely and rapidly accomplished. Their confidence increased as they found themselves nearer the Australian coast. They began to talk of Captain Grant, as if the yacht were going to take him on board at a given port. His cabin was got ready, and berths for the men. This cabin was next to the famous number 6, which Paganel had taken possession of, instead of the one he had booked on the Scotia. It had been till now occupied by Monsieur Oblanet, who vacated it for the expected guest. Mary took great delight in arranging it with her own hands, and adorning it for the reception of the loved inmate. The learned geographer kept himself closely shut up. He was working away from morning till night at a work entitled Sublime Impressions of a Geographer in the Argentine Pampas, and they could hear him repeating elegant periods aloud before committing them to the white pages of his day-book, and more than once, unfaithful to Clio, the muse of history, he invoked in his transports the divine Calliope, the muse of epic poetry. Paganel made no secret of it either. The chaste daughters of Apollo willingly left the slopes of Helicon and Parnassus at his call. Lady Helena paid him sincere compliments on his mythological visitants, and so did the major, though he could not forbear adding— but mind, no fits of absence of mind, my dear Paganel. And if you take a fancy to learn Australian, don't go and study it in a Chinese grammar. Things went on perfectly smooth on board. 
Lady Helena and Lord Glenarvan found leisure to watch John Mangle's growing attachment to Mary Grant. There was nothing to be said against it, and, indeed, since John remained silent, it was best to take no notice of it. "'What will Captain Grant think?' Lord Glenarvan asked his wife one day. "'He'll think John is worthy of Mary, my dear Edward, and he'll think right.' Meanwhile, the yacht was making rapid progress. Five days after losing sight of Cape Corrientes, on the 16th of November, they fell in with fine westerly breezes, and the Duncan might almost have dispensed with her crew altogether, for she flew over the water like a bird, spreading all her sails to catch the breeze, as if she were running a race with the Royal Thames Club yachts. Next day the ocean appeared covered with immense seaweeds, looking like a great pond choked up with the debris of trees and plants torn off the neighboring continents. Commander Murray had specially pointed them out to the attention of navigators. The Duncan appeared to glide over a long prairie, which Paganel justly compared to the Pampas, and her speed slackened a little. Twenty-four hours after, at break of day, the man on the lookout was heard calling out, "'Land ahead!' "'In what direction?' asked Tom Austin, who was on the watch. "'Layward,' was the reply. This exciting cry brought everyone speedily on deck. Soon a telescope made its appearance, followed by Jacques Paganel. The learned geographer pointed the instrument in the direction indicated, but could see nothing that resembled land. "'Look in the clouds,' said John Mangles. "'Ah, now I do see a sort of peak, but very indistinctly.' "'It is Tristan de Chuna.' replied John Mangles. Then, if my memory serves me right, we must be eighty miles from it, for the peak of Tristan, seven thousand feet high, is visible at that distance. That's it, precisely. Some hours later the sharp, lofty crags of the group of islands stood out clearly on the horizon. The conical peak of Tristan looked black against the bright sky, which seemed all ablaze with the splendor of the rising sun. Soon the principal island stood out from the rocky mass, at the summit of a triangle inclining toward the northeast. Tristan de Chuna is situated in thirty-seven degrees eight minutes of southern latitude, and ten degrees forty-four minutes of longitude west of the meridian at Greenwich. Inaccessible Island is eighteen miles to the southwest, and Nightingale Island is ten miles to the southeast and this completes the little solitary group of islets in the Atlantic Ocean. Toward noon the two principal landmarks by which the group is recognized were sighted, and at 3 p.m. the Duncan entered Falmouth Bay in Tristan de Chuna. Several whaling vessels were lying quietly at anchor there, for the coast abounds in seals and other marine animals. John Mangle's first care was to find a good anchorage, and then all the passengers, both ladies and gentlemen, got into the long-boat and were rowed ashore. They stepped out on a beach covered with fine black sand, the impalpable debris of the calcined rocks of the island. Tristan de Chuna is the capital of the group, and consists of a little village lying in the heart of the bay, and watered by a noisy rapid stream. It contained about fifty houses, tolerably clean, and disposed with geometric regularity. Behind this miniature town there lay 1,500 hectares of meadowland, bounded by an embankment of lava. Above this embankment the conical peaks rose 7,000 feet high. Lord Glenarvan was received by a governor supplied from the English colony at the Cape. He inquired at once respecting Harry Grant and the Britannia, and found the names entirely unknown. The Tristan de Chuna Isles were out of the route of ships, and consequently little frequented. Since the wreck of the Blenden Hall in 1821, on the rocks of Inaccessible Island, two vessels have stranded on the chief island, the Primagut, in 1845, and the three-mast American, Philadelphia, in 1857. These three events comprise the whole catalogue of maritime disasters in the annals of the Achunas. Lord Glenarvan did not expect to glean any information, and only asked by way of duty. He even sent the boats to make the circuit of the island, the entire extent of which was not more than seventeen miles at most. 
In the interim the passengers walked about the village. The population does not exceed 150 inhabitants, and consists of English and Americans married to Negroes and Cape Hottentots, who might bear away the palm for ugliness. The children of these heterogeneous households are very disagreeable compounds of Saxon stiffness and African blackness. It was nearly nightfall before the party returned to the yacht, chattering and admiring the natural riches displayed on all sides, for even close to the streets of the capital fields of wheat and maize were waving, and crops of vegetables imported forty years before, and in the environs of the village herds of cattle and sheep were feeding. The boats returned to the Duncan about the same time as Lord Glenarvan. They had made the circuit of the entire island in a few hours, but without coming across the least trace of the Britannia. The only result of this voyage of circumnavigation was to strike out the name of Isle Tristan from the program of search. End of Book 2, Chapter 2 Book 2, Chapter 3 of In Search of the Castaways This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways, or the Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book 2, Chapter 3. Cape Town and Monsieur Voix. As John Mangles intended to put in at the Cape of Good Hope for coals, he was obliged to deviate a little from the 37th parallel, and go two degrees north. In less than six days he cleared the 1,300 miles which separate the point of Africa from Tristan de Tuna, and on the 24th of November, at 3 p.m., the Table Mountain was sighted. At eight o'clock they entered the bay, and cast anchor in the port of Cape Town. They sailed away next morning at daybreak. Between the Cape and Amsterdam Island there is a distance of 2,900 miles, but with a good sea and favouring breeze this was only a ten days' voyage. The elements were now no longer at war with the travellers, as on their journey across the Pampas, air and water seemed in league to help them forward. "'Ah, the sea, the sea!' exclaimed Paganel. "'It is the field, par excellence, for the exercise of human energies, and the ship is the true vehicle of civilization. Think, my friends, if the globe had only been an immense continent, the thousandth part of it would still be unknown to us, even in this nineteenth century. See how it is in the interior of great countries, in the steppes of Siberia, in the plains of Central Asia, in the deserts of Africa, in the prairies of America, in the immense wilds of Australia, in the icy solitudes of the poles. Man scarcely dares to venture. The most daring shrinks back. The most courageous succumbs. They cannot penetrate them. The means of transport are insufficient, and the heat and disease and savage disposition of the natives are impassable obstacles. Twenty miles of desert separate man more than five hundred miles of ocean. Paganel spoke with such warmth that even the Major had nothing to say against this panegyric of the ocean. Indeed, if the finding of Harry Grant had involved following a parallel across continents instead of oceans, the enterprise could not have been attempted. But the sea was there, ready to carry the travellers from one country to another, and on the 6th of December, at the first streak of day, they saw a fresh mountain apparently emerging from the bosom of the waves. This was Amsterdam Island, situated in 37 degrees, 47 minutes latitude, and 77 degrees, 24 minutes longitude, the high cone of which, in clear weather, is visible fifty miles off. At eight o'clock its form, indistinct though it still was, seemed almost a reproduction of Tenerife. "'And consequently it must resemble Tristan Duchuna, observed Glenarvan. A very wise conclusion, said Paganel, according to the geometric axiom that two islands resembling a third must have a common likeness. I will only add that, like Tristan de Tuna, Amsterdam Island is equally rich in seals and Robinsons. There are Robinsons everywhere, then, said Lady Helena. Indeed, madam, replied Paganel. 
I know few islands without some tale of the kind appertaining to them, and the romance of your immortal countryman, Daniel Defoe, has often been enough realized before his day. Monsieur Paganel, said Mary, may I ask you a question? Two, if you like, my dear young lady, and I promise to answer them. Well, then, I want to know if you would be very much frightened at the idea of being cast away alone on a desert island. I? exclaimed Paganel. "'Come now, my good fellow,' said the Major. "'Don't go and tell us that it is your most cherished desire.' "'I don't pretend that it is. "'But still, after all, such an adventure would not be very unpleasant to me. "'I should begin a new life. "'I should hunt and fish. "'I should choose a grotto for my domicile in winter and a tree in summer. "'I should make storehouses for my harvests. "'In one word, I should colonize my island. "'How by yourself?' "'All by myself if I was obliged. "'Besides, are we ever obliged? "'Cannot one find friends among the animals "'and choose some tame kid or eloquent parrot or amiable monkey? "'And if a lucky chance should send one companion "'like the faithful Friday, what more is needed? Two friends on a rock. There is happiness. "'Suppose now, the Major and I—' "'Thank you,' replied the Major, interrupting him. "'I have no inclination—' in that line, and should make a very poor Robinson Crusoe. "'My dear Monsieur Paganel,' said Lady Helena, "'you are letting your imagination run away with you, as usual. But the dream is very different from the reality. You are thinking of an imaginary Robinson's life, thrown on a picked island, and treated like a spoiled child by nature. You only see the sunny side.' "'What, madam? You don't believe a man could be happy on a desert island?' "'I do not. Man is made for society and not for solitude, and solitude can only engender despair. It is a question of time. At the outset it is quite possible that material wants and the very necessities of existence may engross the poor shipwrecked fellow, just snatched from the waves, but afterward, when he feels himself alone, far from his fellow men, without any hope of seeing country and friends again, what must he think, what must he suffer?' his little island is all his world the whole human race is shut up in himself and when death comes which utter loneliness will make terrible he will be like the last man on the last day of the world believe me monsieur paganel such a man is not to be envied paganel gave in though regretfully to the arguments of lady helena and still kept up a discussion on the advantages and disadvantages of isolation till the very moment that duncan dropped anchor about a mile off amsterdam island this lonely group in the indian ocean consists of two distinct islands thirty-three miles apart and situated exactly on the meridian of the indian peninsula to the north is amsterdam island and to the south st paul but they have often been confounded by geographers and navigators. At the time of the Duncan's visit to the island, the population consisted of three people, a Frenchman and two mulattoes, all three employed by the merchant proprietor. Paganel was delighted to shake hands with a countryman in the person of good old Monsieur Viot. He was far advanced in years, but did the honours of the place with much politeness. It was a happy day for him when these kindly strangers touched at his island, for St. Peter's was only frequented by seal-fishers and now and then a whaler, the crews of which are usually rough, coarse men. Monsieur Viot presented his subjects, the two mulattoes. They composed the whole living population of the island, except a few wild boars and the interior, and myriads of penguins. The little house where the three solitary men lived was in the heart of a natural bay on the southeast, formed by the crumbling away of a portion of the mountain. Twice over, in the early part of the century, Amsterdam Island became the country of deserted sailors, providentially saved from misery and death, but since these events no vessel had been lost on its coast. Had any shipwreck occurred, some fragments must have been thrown on the sandy shore, and any poor sufferers from it would have found their way to Monsieur Viot's fishing-huts. The old man had been long on the island, and had never called upon to exercise such hospitality. Of the Britannia and Captain Grant he knew nothing, but he was certain that the disaster had not happened on Amsterdam Island, nor on the islet called St. Paul, 
for whalers and fishing vessels went there constantly, and must have heard of it. Glenarvan was neither surprised nor vexed at the reply. Indeed, his object in asking was rather to establish the fact that Captain Grant had not been there than that he had. This done, they were ready to proceed on their voyage next day. They rambled about the island till evening, as its appearance was very inviting. Its fauna and flora, however, were poor in the extreme. The only specimens of quadrupeds, birds, fish, and cetacea were a few wild boars, stormy petrels, albatross, perch, and seals. Here and there thermal springs and chalybeate waters escaped from the black lava, and thin, dark vapors rose above the volcanic soil. Some of these springs were very hot. John Mangles held his thermometer in one of them, and found the temperature was 176 degrees Fahrenheit. Fish caught in the sea a few yards off cooked in five minutes in these all but boiling waters, a fact which made Paganel resolve not to attempt to bathe in them. Toward evening, after a long promenade, Glenarvan and his party bade adieu to the old Monsieur Viot, and returned to the yacht, wishing him all the happiness possible on his desert island, and receiving in return the old man's blessing on their expedition. End of Book Two, Chapter Three Book Two, Chapter Four of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eddie Winter. In Search of the Castaways or The Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book Two, Chapter Four A Wager and How Decided. On the 7th of December, at 3 a.m., the Duncan lay puffing out her smoke in the little harbour ready to start, and a few minutes afterward the anchor was lifted and the screw set in motion. By eight o'clock, when the passengers came on deck, the Amsterdam island had almost disappeared from view behind the mists of the horizon. This was the last halting place on the route, and nothing now was between them and the Australian coast but three thousand miles distance. Should the west wind continue but a dozen days longer, and the sea remain favourable, the yacht would have reached the end of her voyage. Mary Grant and her brother could not gaze without emotion at the waves through which the Duncan was speeding her course, when they thought that these very same waves must have dashed against the prow of the Britannia but a few days before her shipwreck. Here, perhaps, Captain Grant, with a disabled ship and diminished crew, had struggled against the tremendous hurricanes of the Indian Ocean, and felt himself driven toward the coast with irresistible force. The captain pointed out to Mary the different currents on the ship's chart, and explained to her their constant direction. Among others, there was one running straight to the Australian continent, and its action is equally felt in the Atlantic and Pacific. It was doubtless against this, that the Britannia, dismasted and rudderless, had been unable to contend, and consequently been dashed against the coast, and broken in pieces. A difficulty about this, however, presented itself. The last intelligence of Captain Grant was from Callao on the 30th of May, 1862, as appeared in the Mercantile and Shipping Gazette. How, then, was it possible that on the 7th of June, only eight days after leaving the shores of Peru, that the Britannia could have found herself in the Indian Ocean. But to this, Paganel, who was consulted on the subject, found a very plausible solution. It was one evening, about six days after their leaving Amsterdam Island, when they were all chatting together on the poop, that the above-named difficulty was stated by Glenarvan. Paganel made no reply, but went and fetched the document. After perusing it, he still remained silent, simply shrugging his shoulders, as if ashamed of troubling himself about such a trifle. "'Come, my good friend,' said Glenarvan, "'at least give us an answer.' "'No,' replied Paganel. "'I'll merely ask a question for Captain John to answer.' "'And what is it, Monsieur Paganel?' said John Mangles. 
could a quick ship make the distance in a month over that part of the pacific ocean which lies between america and australia yes by making two hundred miles in twenty-four hours would that be an extraordinary rate of speed not at all sailing clippers often go faster well then instead of the seventh of june on this document suppose that one figure has been destroyed by the sea-water and read seventeenth of june or the twenty-seventh of june and all is explained that's to say replied lady helena that between the thirty-first of may and the twenty-seventh of june captain grant could have crossed the pacific and found himself in the indian ocean Pagnell's theory met with universal acceptance. "'That's one more point cleared up,' said Glenarvan. "'Thanks to our friend, all that remains to be done now is to get to Australia, and look out for traces of the wreck on the western coast.' "'Or the eastern?' said John Mangles. "'Indeed, John, you may be right, for there is nothing in the document to indicate which shore was the scene of the catastrophe, and both points of the continent crossed by the 37th parallel must therefore be explored. Then, my lord, it is doubtful after all, said Mary. Oh, no, Miss Mary, John Mangles hastened to reply, seeing the young girl's apprehension. His lordship will please to consider that if Captain Grant had gained the shore on the east of Australia, he would almost immediately have found refuge and assistance. The whole of that coast is English, we might say peopled with colonists. The crew of the Britannia could not have gone ten miles without meeting a fellow-countryman. "'I am quite of your opinion, Captain John,' said Paganel. "'On the eastern coast, Harry Grant would not only have found an English colony easily, but he would certainly have met with some means of transport back to Europe. "'And he would not have found the same resources on the side we are making for?' asked Lady Helena. "'No, madam,' replied Paganel. "'It is a desert coast, with no communication between it and melbourne or adelaide if the britannia was wrecked on those rocky shores she was as much cut off from all chance of help as if she had been lost on the inhospitable shores of africa but what has become of my father there then all these two years asked mary grant my dear mary replied bagenell you have not the least doubt have you that captain grant reached the australian continent after his shipwreck no monsieur Paganel. Well, granting that, what became of him? The suppositions we might make are not numerous. They are confined to three. Either Harry Grant and his companions have found their way to the English colonies, or they have fallen into the hands of the natives, or are lost in the immense wilds of Australia. Go on, Paganel, said Lord Glenarvan, as the learned Frenchman made a pause. The first hypothesis I reject, then, to begin with, for Harry Grant could not have reached the English colonies, or long ago he would have been back with his children in the good town of Dundee. Poor father, murmured Mary, away from us for two whole years. Hush, Mary, said Robert, Monsieur Paganel will tell us. Alas, my boy, I cannot. All that I affirm is that Captain Grant is in the hands of the natives. But these natives, said Lady Helena hastily, are they... "'Reassure yourself, madam,' said Paganel, divining her thoughts. "'The aborigines of Australia are low enough in the scale of human intelligence, "'and most degraded and uncivilized, "'but they are mild and gentle in disposition, "'and not sanguinary like their New Zealand neighbours. "'Though they may be prisoners, their lives have never been threatened, you may be sure. "'All travellers are unanimous in declaring that the Australian natives are poor shedding blood, and many a time they have found them faithful allies in repelling the attacks of evil-disposed convicts far more cruelly inclined. "'You hear what Monsieur Paganel tells us, Mary?' said Lady Helena, turning to the young girl. "'If your father is in the hands of the natives, which seems probable from the document, we shall find him.' "'And what if he is lost in that immense country?' asked Mary. "'Well, we'll find him still,' exclaimed Paganel, in a confident tone. "'Won't we, friends?' "'Most certainly,' replied Glenarvan, and anxious to give a less gloomy turn to the conversation, he added, "'But I won't admit the supposition of his being lost, not for an instant.' "'Neither will I,' said Paganel. 
Is Australia a big place? inquired Robert. Australia, my boy, is about as large as four fifths of Europe. It has somewhere about seven hundred and seventy five thousand hectares. So much as that? said the Major. Yes, McNabbs, almost to a yard's breadth. Don't you think now it has a right to be called a continent? I do certainly. I may add, continued the savant, that there are but few accounts of travellers being lost in this immense country. Indeed, I believe Leichhardt is the only one of whose fate we are ignorant, and some time before my departure I learned from the Geographical Society that McIntyre had strong hopes of having discovered traces of him. The whole of Australia, then, is not yet explored? asked Lady Helena. No, madam, but very little of it. This continent is not much better known than the interior of Africa, and yet it is from no lack of enterprising travellers. From 1606 to 1862, more than 50 have been engaged in exploring along the coast and in the interior. Oh, fifty! exclaimed McNabbs incredulously. No, no, objected the Major. That is going too far. And I might go farther, McNabbs, replied the geographer, impatient of contradiction. Yes, McNabbs, quite that number. Father still, Paganel. If you doubt me, I can give you the names. Oh, oh, said the Major coolly. That's just like you, Savants. You stick at nothing. Major, will you bet your Purdy Moore rifle against my telescope? Why not, Paganel, if it would give you any pleasure? Done, Major, exclaimed Paganel. You may say good-bye to your rifle, for it will never shoot another chamois or fox unless I lend it to you, which I shall always be happy to do, by the by. And whenever you require the use of your telescope, Paganel, I shall be equally obliging, replied the Major gravely. Let us begin, then, and ladies and gentlemen, you shall be our jury. Robert, you must keep count. This was agreed upon, and Paganel forthwith commenced. Now as then, goddess of memory, chaste mother of the muses, he exclaimed, inspire thy faithful servant and fervent worshipper. Two hundred and fifty-eight years ago, my friends, Australia was unknown. Strong suspicions were entertained of the existence of a great southern continent. In the library of your British Museum, Glenarvan, there are two charts, the date of which is 1550, which mention a country south of Asia called by the Portuguese Great Java. But these charts were not sufficiently authentic. In the 17th century, in 1606, Quiros, a Spanish navigator, discovered a country which he named Australia de Espirito Santo. Some authors imagine that this was the New Hebrides group and not Australia. I am not going to discuss the question, however. Count Kiros, Robert, and let us pass on to another. One, said Robert. In that same year, Louis Vaz de Torres, the second in command of the fleet of Kiros, pushed further south. But it is to Theodore Hertoge, a Dutchman, that the honour of the great discovery belongs. He touched the western coast of Australia in 25 degrees latitude, and called it Eendracht, after his vessel. From this time, navigators increased. In 1618, Zirken discovered the northern parts of the coast, and called them Arnheim and Diemen. In 1618, Jan Edels went along the western coast, and christened it by his own name. In 1622, Lewin went down as far as the Cape, which became his namesake, and so Paganel continued with name after name, until his hearers cried for mercy. Stop, Paganel, said Glenarvan, laughing heartily. Don't quite crush poor McNabbs. Be generous. He owns he is vanquished. And what about the rifle? asked the geographer triumphantly. It is yours, Paganel, replied the Major. I am very sorry for it. But your memory might gain an armory by such feats. It is certainly impossible to be better acquainted with Australia. Not the least name, not even the most trifling fact. As to the most trifling fact... I don't know about that, said the Major, shaking his head. What do you mean, McNabbs? exclaimed Paganel. Simply that perhaps all the incidents connected with the discovery of Australia may not be known to you. Just fancy, retorted Paganel, throwing back his head proudly. Come now, if I name one fact you don't know, will you give me back my rifle? said McNabbs. On the spot, Major. 
Very well. It's a bargain, then. Yes, a bargain. That's settled. All right. Well, now, Paganel, do you know how it is that Australia does not belong to France? But it seems to me, or at any rate, do you know what the reason the English give? asked the Major. No, replied Paganel, with an air of vexation. Just because Captain Baudin, who was by no means a timid man, was so afraid in 1802 of the croaking of the Australian frogs, that he raised his anchor with all possible speed, and quitted the coast, never to return. What? exclaimed Paganel. Do they actually give that version of it in England? But it is just a bad joke. Bad enough, certainly, but still it is history in the United Kingdom. It's an insult, exclaimed the patriotic geographer, and they relate that gravely. I must own it is the case, replied Glenarvan, amidst a general outburst of laughter. Do you mean to say you have never heard of it before? Never, but I protest against it. Besides, the English call us frog-eaters. Now, in general, people are not afraid of what they eat. It is said, though, for all that, replied McNabbs. So the Major kept his famous rifle, after all. End of Book Two, Chapter Four Book Two, Chapter Five of In Search of the Castaways This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eddie Winter. In Search of the Castaways, or the Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book Two, Chapter Five, The Storm on the Indian Ocean. Two days after this conversation, John Mangles announced that the Duncan was in longitude 113 degrees, 37 minutes, and the passengers found, on consulting the chart, that consequently Cape Bernoulli could not be more than five degrees off. They must be sailing, then, in that part of the Indian Ocean which was the Australian continent, and in four days might hope to see Cape Bernoulli appear on the horizon. Hitherto the yacht had been favoured by a strong westerly breeze, but now there were evident signs that a calm was impending, and on the 13th of December the wind fell entirely. As the sailors say, there was not enough to fill a cap. There is no saying how long this state of the atmosphere might last. But for the powerful propeller, the yacht would have been obliged to lie motionless as a log. The young captain was very much annoyed, however, at the prospect of emptying his coal bunkers, for he had covered his ship with canvas, intending to take advantage of the slightest breeze. After all, though, said Glenarvan, with whom he was talking over the subject, it is better to have no wind than a contrary one. Your lordship is right, replied John Mangles, but the fact is, these sudden calms bring change of weather, and this is why I dread them. We are close on the trade winds, and if we get them ever so little in our teeth, it will delay us greatly. Well, John, what if it does? It will only make our voyage a little longer. Yes, if it does not bring a storm with it. Do you mean to say you think we are going to have bad weather? replied Glenarvan, examining the sky, which from horizon to zenith seemed absolutely cloudless. I do, returned the captain. I may say so to your lordship, but I should not like to alarm Lady Glenarvan or Miss Grant. You are acting wisely, but what makes you uneasy? Sure indications of a storm. Don't trust, my lord, to the appearance of the sky. Nothing is more deceitful. For the last two days the barometer has been falling in a most ominous manner, and is now at twenty-seven degrees. This is a warning I dare not neglect, for there is nothing I dread more than storms in the southern seas. I have had a taste of them already. The vapours which become condensed in the immense glaciers at the South Pole produce a current of air of extreme violence. This causes a struggle between the polar and equatorial winds, which results in cyclones, tornadoes, and all those multiplied varieties of tempest against which a ship is no match. Well, John, said Glenarvan, the Duncan is a good ship, and her captain is a brave sailor. Let the storm come, 
we'll meet it. John Mangles remained on deck the whole night, for though as yet the sky was still unclouded, he had such faith in his weather glass that he took every precaution that prudence could suggest. About 11 p.m., the sky began to darken in the south, and the crew were called up, and all the sails hauled in except the fossil, brigantine, topsail, and jib-boom. At midnight the wind freshened, and before long the crackling of the masts and the rattling of the cordage and the groaning of the timbers awakened the passengers, who speedily made their appearance on deck, at least Paganel, Glenarvan, the Major, and Robert. "'Is it the hurricane?' asked Glenarvan quietly. "'Not yet,' replied the captain. "'But it is close at hand.' And he went on giving his orders to the men, and doing his best to make ready for the storm, standing like an officer commanding a breach, with his face to the wind, and his gaze fixed on the troubled sky. The glass had fallen to twenty-six degrees, and the hand pointed to tempest. It was one o'clock in the morning when Lady Helena and Miss Grant ventured upstairs on deck, but they no sooner made their appearance than the captain hurried toward them, and begged them to go below again immediately. The waves were already beginning to dash over the side of the ship, and the sea might any moment sweep right over her from stem to stern. The noise of the warring elements was so great that his words were scarcely audible, but Lady Helena took advantage of a sudden lull to ask if there was any danger. "'None whatever,' replied John Mangles. "'But you cannot remain on deck, madam. No more can Miss Mary.' The ladies could not disobey an order that seemed almost an entreaty, and they returned to their cabin. At the same moment the wind redoubled its fury, making the masts bend beneath the weight of the sails, and completely lifting up the yacht. "'Haul up the fossil!' shouted the captain. "'Lower the topsail and jib-boom!' Glenarvan and his companions stood silently gazing at the struggle between their good ship and the waves lost in wondering and half-terrified admiration at the spectacle. Just then, a dull hissing was heard above the noise of the elements. The steam was escaping violently, not by the funnel, but from the safety valves of the boiler. The alarm whistle sounded unnaturally loud, and the yacht made a frightful pitch, overturning Wilson, who was at the wheel, by an unexpected blow from the tiller. The Duncan no longer obeyed the helm. "'What is the matter?' cried the captain, rushing on the bridge. "'The ship is heeling over on her side,' replied Wilson. "'The engine! The engine!' shouted the engineer. Away rushed John to the engine-room. A cloud of steam filled the room. The pistons were motionless in their cylinders, and they were apparently powerless, and the engine-driver, fearing for his boilers, was letting off the steam. "'What's wrong?' asked the captain. "'The propeller is bent, or entangled,' was the reply. It's not acting at all. Can't you extricate it? It is impossible. An accident like this could not be remedied, and John's only resource was to fall back on his sails and seek to make an auxiliary of his most powerful enemy, the wind. He went up again on deck, and after explaining in a few words to Lord Glenarvan how things stood, begged him to retire to his cabin with the rest of the passengers but Glenarvan wished to remain above. No, your lordship, said the captain in a firm tone. I must be alone with my men. Go into the saloon. The vessel will have a hard fight with the waves, and they will sweep you over without mercy. But we might be a help. Go in, my lord, go in. I must indeed insist on it. There are times when I must be master on board, and retire you must. Their situation must indeed be desperate for John Mangles to speak in such authoritative language. Glenarvan was wide enough to understand this, and felt he must set an example in obedience. He therefore quitted the deck immediately, with his three companions, and rejoined the ladies, who were anxiously watching the denouement of this war with the elements. "'He's an energetic fellow, this brave John of mine,' said Lord Glenarvan, as he entered the saloon. "'That he is,' replied Paganel. He reminds me of your great Shakespeare's boatswain in the Tempest, who says to the king on board, Hence, what care these roars for the name of king? To cabin, silence, trouble us not. 
However, John Mangles did not lose a second in extricating his ship from the peril in which she was placed by the condition of her screw propeller. He resolved to rely on the mainsail for keeping in the right route as far as possible, and to brace the yards obliquely so as not to present a direct front to the storm. The yacht turned about like a swift horse that feels the spur, and presented a broadside to the billows. The only question was, how long would she hold out with so little sail, and what sail could resist such violence for any length of time? The great advantage of keeping up the mainsail was that it presented to the waves only the most solid portions of the yacht, and kept her in the right course. Still, it involved some peril, for the vessel might get engulfed between the waves, and not be able to raise herself. But Mangles felt there was no alternative, and all he could do was to keep the crew ready to alter the sail at any moment, and stay in the shrouds himself watching the tempest. The remainder of the night was spent in this manner, and it was hoped that morning would bring a calm. But this was a delusive hope. At 8 a.m. the wind had increased to a hurricane. John said nothing, but he trembled for his ship and those on board. The Duncan made a frightful plunge forward, and for an instant the men thought she would never rise again. Already they had seized their hatchets to cut away the shrouds from the mainmast, but the next minute the sails were torn away by the tempest, and had flown off like gigantic albatrosses. The yacht had risen once more, but she found herself at the mercy of the waves entirely now, with nothing to steady or direct her, and was so fearfully pitched and tossed about, that every moment the captain expected the masts would break short off. John had no resource but to put up a forestay sail, and run before the gale. But this was no easy task. Twenty times over he had all his work to begin again, and it was three p.m. before his attempt succeeded. A mere shred of canvas, though it was, it was enough to drive the Duncan forward with inconceivable rapidity to the northeast, of course in the same direction as the hurricane. Swiftness was their only chance of safety. Sometimes she would get in advance of the waves, which carried her along, and cutting through them with her sharp prow, bury herself in their depths. At others she would keep pace with them, and make such enormous leaps, that there was imminent danger of her being pitched over on her side, and then again, every now and then, the storm-driven sea would outdistance the yacht, and the angry billows would sweep over the deck from stem to stern with tremendous violence. In this alarming situation, and amid dreadful alternations of hope and despair, the twelfth of December passed away, and the ensuing night John Mangles never left his post, not even to take food. Though his impassive face betrayed no symptoms of fear, he was tortured with anxiety, and his steady gaze was fixed to the north, as if trying to pierce through the thick mists that enshrouded it. There was indeed great cause for fear. The Duncan was out of her course, and rushing towards the Australian coast, with a speed which nothing could lessen. To John Mangles, it seemed as if a thunderbolt were driving them along. Every instant he expected the yacht would dash against some rock, for he reckoned the coast could be no more than twelve miles off, and better far be in mid-ocean exposed to all its fury than too near land. John Mangles went to find Glenarvan, and had a private talk with him about their situation, telling him frankly the true state of affairs, stating the case with all the coolness of a sailor prepared for anything and everything, and he wound up by saying he might, perhaps, be obliged to cast the yacht on shore. To save the lives of those on board, my lord, he added. Do it then, John, replied Lord Glenarvan. And Lady Helena, Miss Grant? I will tell them at the last moment, when all hope of keeping out at sea is over. Will you let me know? I will, my lord. Glenarvan rejoined his companions, who felt they were in imminent danger, though no word was spoken on the subject. Both ladies displayed great courage, fully equal to any of the party. Paganel descanted in the most inopportune manner about the direction of atmospheric currents, making interesting comparisons between tornadoes, cyclones, and rectilinear tempests, 
the major calmly awaited the end with the fatalism of a mussulman about eleven o'clock the hurricane appeared to decrease slightly the damp mist began to clear away and a sudden gleam of light revealed a low-lying shore about six miles distant they were driving right down on it enormous breakers fifty feet high were dashing over it and the fact of their height showed john there must be solid ground before they could make such a rebound those are sandbanks said he to austin i think they are replied the mate we are in god's hands said john if we cannot find any opening for the yacht and if she doesn't find the way in herself we are lost the tide is high at present it is just possible we may ride over those sandbanks but just see those breakers what ship could stand them let us invoke divine aid austin meanwhile the duncan was speeding on at a frightful rate soon she was within two miles of the sandbanks which were still veiled from time to time in thick mist but john fancied he could see beyond the breakers a quiet basin where the duncan would be in comparative safety but how could she reach it all the passengers were summoned on deck for now that the hour of shipwreck was at hand the captain did not wish any one to be shut up in his cabin john said glenarvan in a low voice to the captain i will try to save my wife or perish with her i put miss grant in your charge yes my lord replied john mangles raising glenarvan's hand to his moistened eyes the yacht was only a few cables lengths from the sandbanks the tide was high and no doubt there was abundance of water to float the ship over the dangerous bar but these terrific breakers alternately lifting her up and then leaving her almost dry would infallibly make her graze the sandbanks was there no means of calming this angry sea a last expedient struck the captain the oil my lads he exclaimed bring the oil here the crew caught at the idea immediately this was a plan that had been successfully tried already the fury of the waves had been allayed before this time by covering them with a sheet of oil its effect is immediate but very temporary the moment after a ship has passed over the smooth surface the sea redoubles its violence and woe to the bark that follows the casks of seal oil were forthwith hauled up for danger seemed to have given the men double strength a few hatchet blows soon knocked in the heads they were then hung over the larboard and starboard be ready shouted john looking out for a favourable moment in twenty seconds the yacht reached the bar now was the time pour out cried the captain and god prosper it the bells were turned upside down and instantly a sheet of oil covered the whole surface of the water the billows fell as if by magic the whole foaming sea seemed levelled and the duncan flew over its tranquil bosom into a quiet basin beyond the formidable bar but almost the same minute the ocean burst forth again with all its fury and the towering breakers dashed over the bar with increased violence end of book two chapter five book two chapter six of in search of the castaways this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eddie Winter. In Search of the Castaways or the Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book 2, Chapter 6 A Hospitable Colonist. The captain's first care was to anchor his vessel securely he found excellent moorage in five fathoms depth of water with a solid bottom of hard granite which afforded a firm hold there was no danger now of either being driven away or stranded at low water after so many hours of danger the duncan found herself in a sort of creek sheltered by a high circular point from the winds outside in the open sea lord glenarvan grasped john mangle's hand and simply said thank you john this was all but john felt it ample recompense glenarvan kept to himself the secret of his anxiety and neither lady helena nor mary nor robert 
suspected the grave perils they had just escaped. One important fact had to be ascertained. On what part of the coast had the tempest thrown them? How far must they go to regain the parallel? At what distance southwest was Cape Bernoulli? This was soon determined by taking the position of the ship, and it was found that she had scarcely deviated two degrees from the route. They were in longitude 36 degrees 12 minutes, and latitude 32 degrees 67 minutes, at Cape Catastrophe, 300 miles from Cape Bernoulli. The nearest port was Adelaide, the capital of southern Australia. Could the Duncan be repaired there? This was the question. The extent of the injuries must first be ascertained, and in order to do this, he ordered some of the men to dive down below the stern. The report was that one of the branches of the screw was bent, and had got jammed against the stern post, which of course prevented all possibility of rotation. This was a serious damage, so serious as to require more skilful workmen than could be found in Adelaide. After mature reflection, Lord Glenarvan and John Mangles came to the determination to sail round the Australian coast, stopping at Cape Bernoulli, and continuing their route south as far as Melbourne, where the Duncan could speedily be put right. This effected, they would proceed to cruise along the eastern coast to complete their search for the Britannia. This decision was unanimously approved and it was agreed that they should start with a first fair wind. They had not long to wait for the same night the hurricane had ceased entirely, and there was only a manageable breeze from the southwest. Preparations for sailing were instantly commenced, and at four o'clock in the morning the crew lifted the anchors, and got under way with fresh canvas outspread, and a wind-blown right for the Australian shores. Two hours afterward, Cape Catastrophe was out of sight. In the evening they doubled Cape Boulder, and came alongside Kangaroo Island. This is the largest of the Australian islands, and a great hiding place for runaway convicts. Its appearance was enchanting. The stratified rocks on the shore were richly carpeted with verdure, and innumerable kangaroos were jumping over the woods and plains, just as at the time of its discovery in 1802. Next day, boats were sent ashore to examine the coast minutely, as they were now on the 36th parallel, and between that and the 38th, Glenarvan wished to leave no part unexplored. The boats had hard, rough work of it now, but the men never complained. Glenarvan and his inseparable companion Paganel, and young Robert, generally accompanied them. But all this painstaking exploration came to nothing. Not a trace of the shipwreck could be seen anywhere. The Australian shores revealed no more than the Patagonian. However, it was not time yet to lose hope altogether, for they had not reached the exact point indicated by the document. On the 20th of December they arrived off Cape Bernoulli, which terminates Lassipede Bay, and yet not a vestige of the Britannia had been discovered. Still this was not surprising, as it was two years since the occurrence of the catastrophe, and the sea might, and indeed must, have scattered and destroyed whatever fragments of the brig had remained. Besides, the natives who sent a wreck as the vultures do a dead body would have pounced upon it and carried off the smaller debris. There was no doubt whatever Harry Grant and his companions had been made prisoners the moment the waves threw them on the shore and had been dragged away into the interior of the continent. But if so, what becomes of Paganel's ingenious hypothesis about the document, viz. that it had been thrown into a river and carried by a current into the sea? That was a plausible enough theory in Patagonia, but not in the part of Australia intersected by the 37th parallel. Besides, the Patagonian rivers, the Rio Colorado, and the Rio Negro flow into the sea along deserted solitudes, uninhabited and uninhabitable, while on the contrary, the principal rivers of Australia, the Murray, the Yarrow, the Torrens, the Darling, all connected with each other, throw themselves into the ocean by well-frequented routes, 
and their mouths are ports of great activity. What likelihood, consequently, would there be that a fragile bottle would ever find its way along such busy thoroughfares right out into the Indian Ocean? Paganel himself saw the impossibility of it, and confessed to the Major, who raised a discussion on the subject, that his hypothesis would be altogether illogical in Australia. It was evident that the degrees given related to the place where the Britannia was actually shipwrecked, and not the place of captivity, and that the bottle, therefore, had been thrown into the sea on the western coast of the continent. However, as Glenarvan justly remarked, this did not alter the fact of Captain Grant's captivity in the least degree, though there was no reason now for prosecuting the search for him along the 37th parallel more than any other. It followed, consequently, that if no traces of the Britannia were discovered at Cape Bernoulli, the only thing to be done was to return to Europe. Lord Glenarvan would have been unsuccessful, but he would have done his duty courageously and conscientiously. But the young Grants did not feel disheartened. They had long since said to themselves that the question of their father's deliverance was about to be finally settled. Irrevocably, indeed, they might consider it, for as Paganel had judiciously demonstrated, if the wreck had occurred on the eastern side, the survivors would have found their way back to their own country long since. Hope on, hope on, Mary, said Lady Helena to the young girl as they neared the shore. God's hand will still lead us. Yes, Miss Mary, said Captain John. Man's extremity is God's opportunity. When one way is hedged up, another is sure to open. God grant it, replied Mary. Land was quite close now. The cape ran out two miles into the sea, and terminated in a gentle slope, and the boat glided easily into a sort of natural creek between coral banks in a state of formation, which in course of time would be a belt of coral reefs round the southern point of the Australian coast. Even now they were quite sufficiently formidable to destroy the keel of a ship, and the Britannia might likely enough have been dashed to pieces on them. The passengers landed without the least difficulty on an absolutely deserted shore. Cliffs, composed of beds of strata, made a coastline sixty to eighty feet high, which it would have been difficult to scale without ladders or cramp irons. John Mangles happened to discover a natural breach about half a mile south. Part of the cliff had been partially beaten down, no doubt by the sea in some equinoctial gale. Through this opening the whole party passed and reached the top of the cliff by a pretty steep path. Robert climbed like a young cat, and was the first on the summit, to the despair of Paganel, who was quite ashamed to see his long legs, forty years old, outdistanced by a young urchin of twelve. However, he was far ahead of the Major, who gave himself no concern on the subject. They were all soon assembled on the lofty crags and from this elevation could command a view of the whole plain below. It appeared entirely uncultivated and covered with shrubs and bushes. Glenarvan thought it resembled some glens in the lowlands of Scotland, and Paganel fancied it like some barren parts of Brittany. But along the coast the country appeared to be inhabited, and significant signs of industry revealed the presence of civilized men, not savages. A mill, exclaimed Robert, and sure enough, in the distance, the long sails of a mill appeared, apparently about three miles off. It certainly is a windmill, said Paganel, after examining the object in question through his telescope. Let us go to it, then, said Glenarvan. Away they started, and after walking about half an hour, the country began to assume a new aspect, suddenly changing its sterility for cultivation. Instead of bushes, quick-set hudges met the eye, enclosing recent clearings. Several bullocks and about half a dozen horses were feeding in meadows, surrounded by acacias supplied from the vast plantations of Kangaroo Island. Gradually, fields covered with cereals came in sight, whole acres covered with bristling ears of corn, hayricks in the shape of large beehives, blooming orchards, 
a fine garden worthy of Horace, in which the useful and agreeable were blended. Then came sheds, commons wisely distributed, and last of all, a plain comfortable dwelling-house, crowned by a joyous-sounding mill, and found and shaded by its long sails, as they kept constantly moving round. Just at that moment, a pleasant-faced man, about fifty years of age, came out of the house, warned by the loud barking of four dogs of the arrival of strangers. He was followed by five handsome strapping lads, his sons, and their mother, a fine tall woman. There was no mistake in the little group. This was a perfect type of the Irish colonist, a man who, weary of the miseries of his country, had come with his family to seek fortune and happiness beyond the seas. Before Glenarvan and his party had time to reach the house and present themselves in due form, they heard the cordial words, "'Strangers, welcome to the house of Paddy O'More.' "'You are Irish,' said Glenarvan, "'if I am not mistaken, warmly grasping the outstretched hand of the colonist. "'I was,' replied Paddy O'More, "'but now I am Australian. "'Come in, gentlemen, whoever you may be, this house is yours.' It was impossible not to accept an invitation given with such grace. Lady Helena and Mary Grant were led in by Mrs. O'More, while the gentlemen were assisted by his sturdy sons to disencumber themselves of their firearms. An immense hall, light and airy, occupied the ground floor of the house, which was built of strong planks laid horizontally. A few wooden benches, fastened against the gaily coloured walls, about ten stalls, two oak chests on tin mugs, a large long table where twenty guests could sit comfortably, composed the furniture, which looked in perfect keeping with a solid house and robust inmates. The noonday meal was spread. The soup tureen was smoking between the roast beef and a leg of mutton, surrounded by large plates of olives, grapes, and oranges. The necessary was there, and there was no lack of the superfluous. The host and hostess were so pleasant, and the big table with its abundant fare looked so inviting, that it would have been ungracious not to have seated themselves. The farm servants, on equal footing with their master, were already in their places to take their share of the mill. Paddy O'More pointed to the seats reserved for the strangers, and said to Glenarvan, "'I was waiting for you.' "'Waiting for us?' replied Glenarvan, in a tone of surprise. I am always waiting for those who come, said the Irishman, and then, in a solemn voice, while the family and domestics reverently stood, he repeated the benedicite. Dinner followed immediately, during which an animated conversation was kept up on all sides. From Scotch to Irish is but a hand's breadth. The tweed, several fathoms wide, digs a deeper trench between scotland and england than the twenty leagues of irish channel which separates old caledonia from the emerald isle paddy o'more related his history it was that of all emigrants driven by misfortune from their own country many come to seek fortunes who only find trouble and sorrow but then they throw the blame on chance and forget the true cause is their own idleness and vice and want of common sense. Whoever is sober and industrious, honest and economical, gets on. Such a one had been, and was, Paddy O'More. He left Dundalk, where he was starving, and came with his family to Australia, landed at Adelaide, where, if using employment as a miner, he got engaged on a farm, and two months afterward commenced clearing ground on his own account. The whole territory of South Australia is divided into lots, each containing eighty acres, and these are granted to colonists by the government. Any industrious man, by proper cultivation, can not only get a living out of his lot, but lay by pounds eighty a year. Paddy O'More knew this. He profited by his own former experience, and laid by every penny he could, till he had saved enough to purchase new lots. His family prospered, and his farm also. The Irish peasant became a landed proprietor, and though his little estate had only been under cultivation for two years, he had five hundred acres cleared by his own hands, 
and five hundred head of cattle. He was his own master, after having been a serf in Europe, and as independent as one can be in the freest country in the world. His guests congratulated him heartily as he ended his narration, and Paddy O'Moore, no doubt, expected confidence for confidence. But he waited in vain. However, he was one of those discreet people who can say, I tell you who I am, but I don't ask who you are. Glenarvan's great object was to get information about the Britannia, and like a man who goes right to the point, he began at once to interrogate O'Moore as to whether he had heard of the shipwreck. The reply of the Irishman was not favourable. He had never heard the vessel mentioned. For two years at least, no ship had been wrecked on that coast, neither above nor below the Cape. Now the date of the catastrophe was within two years. He could therefore declare positively that the survivors of the wreck had not been thrown on that part of the western shore. Now, my lord, he added, may I ask what interest you have in making the inquiry? This pointed question elicited in reply the whole history of the expedition. Glenarvan related the discovery of the document, and the various attempts that had been made to follow up the precise indications given of the whereabouts of the unfortunate captives, and he concluded his account by expressing his doubt whether they should ever find the captain after all. His dispirited tone made a painful impression on the minds of his auditors. Robert and Mary could not keep back their tears, and Paganel had not a word of hope or comfort to give them. John Mangles was grieved to the heart, though he too was beginning to yield to the feeling of hopelessness which had crept over the rest, when suddenly the whole party were electrified by hearing a voice exclaim, My lord, praise and thank God, if Captain Grant is alive, he is on this Australian continent. End of Book Two, Chapter Six Book Two, Chapter Seven, of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eddie Winter. In Search of the Castaways, or the Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book Two, Chapter Seven, The Quartermaster of the Britannia. The surprise caused by these words cannot be described. Glenarvan sprang to his feet, and pushing back his seat, exclaimed, Who spoke? I did, said one of the servants, at the far end of the table. You, Ayrton, replied his master, not less bewildered than Glenarvan. Yes, it was I, rejoined Ayrton, in a firm tone, though somewhat agitated voice. A Scotchman like yourself, my lord, and one of the shipwreck crew of the Britannia. The effect of such a declaration may be imagined. Mary Grant fell back, half fainting, in Lady Helena's arms, overcome with joyful emotion, and Robert, and Mangles, and Paganel, started up and toward the man that Paddy O'Moore had addressed as Ayrton. He was a coarse-looking fellow, about forty-five years of age, with very bright eyes though half hidden beneath thick, overhanging brows. In spite of extreme leanness, there was an air of unusual strength about him. He seemed all bone and nerves, or, to use a Scotch expression, as if he had not wasted time in making fat. He was broad-shouldered and of middle height, and though his features were coarse, his face was so full of intelligence and energy and decision that he gave one a favourable impression. The interest he excited was still further heightened by the marks of recent suffering imprinted on his countenance. It was evident that he had endured long and severe hardships, and that he had borne them bravely and come off victor. "'You are one of the shipwrecked sailors of the Britannia?' was Glenarvan's first question. "'Yes, my lord, Captain Grant's quartermaster, and saved with him after the shipwreck?' "'No, my lord, no.' I was separated from him at that terrible moment, for I was swept off the deck as the ship struck. 
Then you are not one of the two sailors mentioned in the document? No, I was not aware of the existence of the document. The captain must have thrown it into the sea when I was no longer on board. But the captain, what about the captain? I believed he had perished, gone down with all his crew. I imagined myself the sole survivor. But you said just now Captain Grant was living. No, I said, if the captain is living. And you added, he is on the Australian continent. And indeed he cannot be anywhere else. Then you don't know where he is. No, my lord, I say again, I supposed he was buried beneath the waves, or dashed to pieces against the rocks. It was from you I learned that he was still alive. What then do you know? Simply this. If Captain Grant is alive, he is in Australia. Where did the shipwreck occur? asked Major McNabbs. This should have been the first question, but in the excitement caused by the unexpected incident, Glenarvan cared more to know where the captain was than where the Britannia had been lost. After the Major's inquiry, however, Glenarvan's examination proceeded more logically, and before long all the details of the event stood out clearly before the minds of the company. To the question put by the Major, Ayrton replied, When I was swept off the forecastle, when I was hauling in the jib-boom, the Britannia was running right on the Australian coast. She was not more than two cables' length from it, and consequently she must have struck just there. In latitude 37 degrees, asked John Mangles. Yes, in latitude 37 degrees. On the west coast? No, on the east coast, was the prompt reply. And at what date? It was on the night of the 27th of June, 1862. Exactly, just exactly, exclaimed Glenarvan. You see then, my lord, continued Ayrton, I might justly say, if Captain Grant is alive, he is on the Australian continent, and it is useless looking for him anywhere else. And we will look for him there, and find him too, and save him, exclaimed Paganel. Ah, precious document, he added, with perfect naivety. You must own you have fallen into the hands of uncommonly shrewd people. But doubtless nobody heard his flattering words, for Glenarvan and Lady Helena and Mary Grant and Robert were too much engrossed with Ayrton to listen to anyone else. They pressed round him and grasped his hands. It seemed as if this man's presence was a sure pledge of Harry Grant's deliverance. If this sailor had escaped the perils of the shipwreck, why should not the captain? Ayrton was quite sanguine as to his existence but on what part of the continent he was to be found, that he could not say. The replies the man gave to the thousand questions that assailed him on all sides were remarkably intelligent and exact. All the while he spake, Mary held one of his hands in hers. This sailor was a companion of her father's, one of the crew of the Britannia. He had lived with Harry Grant, crossed the seas with him, and shared his dangers. Mary could not keep her eyes off his face, rough and homely though it was, and she wept for joy. Up to this time no one had ever thought of doubting either the veracity or the identity of the quartermaster, but the Major, and perhaps John Mangles, now began to ask themselves if this Ayrton's word was to be absolutely believed. There was something suspicious about this unexpected meeting. Certainly the man had mentioned facts and dates which corresponded, and the minuteness of his details was most striking. Still, exactness of details was no positive proof. Indeed, it had been noticed that a falsehood had sometimes gained ground by being exceedingly particular in minutiae. McNabbs therefore prudently refrained from committing himself by expressing any opinion. John Mangles, however, was soon convinced when he heard Ayrton speak to the young girl about her father. He knew Mary and Robert quite well. He had seen them in Glasgow when the ship sailed. He remembered them at the farewell breakfast given on board the Britannia to the captain's friends, at which Sheriff McIntyre was present. Robert, then a boy of ten years old, had been given into his charge, and he ran away and tried to climb the rigging. 
Yes, that I did. It is quite right, said Robert. He went on to mention several other trifling incidents without attaching the importance to them that John Mangles did, and when he stopped, Mary Grant said in her soft voice, Oh, go on, Mr. Outen, tell us more about our father. The quartermaster did his best to satisfy the poor girl, and Glenarvan did not interrupt him, though a score of questions far more important crowded into his mind. Lady Helena made him look at Mary's beaming face, and the words he was about to utter remained unspoken. Ayrton gave an account of the Britannia's voyage across the Pacific. Mary knew most of it before, as news of the ship had come regularly up to the month of May 1862. In the course of the year, Harry Grant had touched at all of the principal ports. He had been to the Hebrides, to New Guinea, New Zealand, and New Caledonia, and had succeeded in finding an important point on the western coast of Papua, where the establishment of a Scotch colony seemed to him easy, and its prosperity certain. A good port on the Malacca and Philippine route must attract ships, especially when the opening of the Suez Canal would have supplanted the Cape route. Harry Grant was one of those who appreciated the great work of M. de Lesseps, and would not allow political rivalries to interfere with international interests. After reconnoitring Papua, the Britannia went to provision herself at Kaleo, and left that port on the 30th of May, 1862, to return to Europe by the Indian Ocean and the Cape. Three weeks afterward, his vessel was disabled by a fearful storm, in which they were caught, and obliged to cut away the masts. A leak sprang in the hold, and could not be stopped. The crew were too exhausted to work the pumps, and for eight days the Britannia was tossed about in the hurricane like a shuttlecock. She had six feet of water in her hold, and was gradually sinking. The boats had been all carried away by the tempest. Death stared them in the face, when on the night of the 22nd of June, as Paganel had rightly supposed, they came in sight of the eastern coast of Australia. The ship soon neared the shore, and presently dashed violently against it. Ayrton was swept off by a wave, and thrown among the breakers, where he lost consciousness. When he recovered, he found himself in the hands of natives, who dragged him away into the interior of the country. Since that time, he had never heard the Britannia's name mentioned, and reasonably enough came to the conclusion that she had gone down with all hands off the dangerous reefs of Twofold Bay. This ended Ayrton's recital, and more than once sorrowful exclamations were evoked by the story. The Major could not, in common justice, doubt its authenticity. The sailor was then asked to narrate his own personal history, which was short and simple enough. He had been carried by a tribe of natives, four hundred miles north of the thirty-seventh parallel. He spent a miserable existence there, not that he was ill-treated, but the natives themselves lived miserably. He passed two long years of painful slavery among them, but always cherished in his heart the hope of one day regaining his freedom, and watching for the slightest opportunity that might turn up, though he knew that his flight would be attended with innumerable dangers. At length, one night in October, 1864, he managed to escape the vigilance of the natives, and took refuge in the depths of immense forests. For a whole month he subsisted on roots, edible ferns, and mimosa gums, wandering through vast solitudes, guiding himself by the sun during the day, and by the stars at night. He went on, though often almost despairingly, through bogs and rivers, and across mountains, till he had traversed the whole of the uninhabited part of the continent, where only a few bold travellers have ventured, and at last, in an exhausted and all but dying condition, he reached the hospitable dwelling of Paddy O'Moore, where he said he had found a happy home in exchange for his labour. And if Ayrton speaks well of me, said the Irish settler, when the narrative ended, I have nothing but good to say of him. He is an honest, intelligent fellow, and a good worker. 
and as long as he pleases, Paddy O'More's house shall be his. Ayrton thanked him by a gesture, and waited silently for any fresh question that might be put to him, though he thought to himself that he surely must have satisfied all legitimate curiosity. What could remain to be said that he had not said a hundred times already? Glenarvan was just about to open a discussion about their future plan of action, profiting by this rencontre with Ayrton and by the information he had given them, when Major McNabbs, addressing the sailor, said, "'You were quartermaster, you say, on the Britannia?' "'Yes,' replied Ayrton, without the least hesitation. But as if conscious that a certain feeling of mistrust, however slight, had prompted the inquiry, he added, "'I have my shipping papers with me. I saved them from the wreck.' He left the room immediately to fetch his official document, and though hardly absent a minute, Paddy O'More managed to say, My lord, you may trust Ayrton. I vouch for his being an honest man. He has been two months now in my service, and I have never had once to find fault with him. I knew all this story of his shipwreck and his captivity. He is a true man, worthy of your entire confidence. Glenarvan was on the point of replying, that he had never doubted his good faith when the man came in and brought his engagement written out in due form. It was a paper signed by the ship owners and Captain Grant. Mary recognized her father's writing at once. It was to certify that Tom Ayrton, able-bodied seaman, was engaged as quartermaster on board the three-mast vessel, the Britannia Glasgow. There could not possibly be the least doubt now of Ayrton's identity for it would have been difficult to account for his possession of the document, if he were not the man named in it. Now then, said Glenarvan, I wish to ask everyone's opinion as to what is best to be done. Your advice, Ayrton, will be particularly valuable, and I shall be much obliged if you would let us have it. After a few minutes' thought, Ayrton replied, I thank you, my lord, for the confidence you show towards me, and I hope to prove worthy of it. I have some knowledge of the country and the habits of the natives, and if I can be of any service to you— Most certainly you can, interrupted Glenarvan. I think with you, resumed Ayrton, that the captain and his two sailors have escaped alive from the wreck, but since they have not found their way to the English settlement, nor been seen anywhere, I have no doubt that their fate has been similar to my own, and that they are prisoners in the hands of some of the native tribes. That's exactly what I have always argued, said Paganel. The shipwrecked men were taken prisoners, as they feared. But must we conclude, without question, that, like yourself, they have been dragged away north of the 37th parallel? I should suppose so, sir, for hostile tribes would hardly remain anywhere near the districts under the British rule. That will complicate our search, said Glenarvan, somewhat disconcerted. How can we possibly find traces of the captives in the heart of so vast a continent? No one replied, though Lady Helena's questioning glances at her companions seemed to press for an answer. Paganel even was silent. His ingenuity for once was at fault. John Mangles paced the cabin with great strides, as if he fancied himself on the deck of his ship, evidently quite nonplussed. And you, Mr. Ayrton, said Lady Helena at last, what would you do? Madam, replied Ayrton, readily enough, I should re-embark in the Duncan, and go right to the scene of the catastrophe. There I should be guided by circumstances, and by any chance indications we might discover. Very good, returned Glenarvan, but we must wait till the Duncan is repaired. Ah, she has been injured then, said Ayrton. Yes, replied Mangles. To any serious extent? No, but such injuries as require more skilful workmanship than we have on board. One of the branches of the screw is twisted, and we cannot get it repaired nearer than Melbourne. Well, let the ship go to Melbourne, then, said Paganel, and we will go without her to Twofold Bay. And how? asked Mangles. By crossing Australia as we crossed America, keeping along the 37th parallel. But the Duncan? repeated Ayrton, as if particularly anxious on that score. The Duncan can rejoin us, or we can rejoin her, as the case may be. Should we discover Captain Grant in the course of our journey, we can all return together to Melbourne. If we have to go on to the coast, on the contrary, then, the Duncan can come to us there. 
Who has any objection to make? Have you, Major? No, not if there is a practicable route across Australia. So practicable that I propose Lady Helena and Miss Grant should accompany us. Are you speaking seriously, asked Glenarvan? Perfectly so, my lord. It is a journey of three hundred and fifty miles, not more. If we go twelve miles a day, it will barely take us a month, just long enough to put the vessel in trim. If we had to cross the continent in a lower latitude at its wildest part, and traverse immense deserts, where there is no water and where the heat is tropical, and go where the most adventurous travels have never yet ventured, then that would be a different matter. But the thirty-seventh parallel cuts only through the province of Victoria, quite an English country, with roads and railways, and well populated almost everywhere. It is a journey you might make almost in a chaise, though a wagon would be better. It is a mere trip from London to Edinburgh, nothing more. What about wild beasts, though? asked Glenarvan, anxious to go into all the difficulties of the proposal. There are no wild beasts in Australia. And how about the savages? There are no savages in this latitude, and if there were, they are not cruel like the New Zealanders. And the convicts? There are no convicts in the southern provinces, only in the eastern colonies. The province of Victoria not only refused to admit them, but passed a law to prevent any ticket of leave men from other provinces from entering her territories. This very year the government threatened to withdraw its subsidy from the Peninsula Company if their vessels continued to take in coal in those western parts of Australia where convicts are admitted. What, don't you know that, and you an Englishman? In the first place, I beg leave to say I am not an Englishman, replied Glenarvan. What Monsieur Paganel says is perfectly correct, said Paddy O'Moore. Not only the province of Victoria, but also southern Australia, Queensland, and even Tasmania have agreed to expel convicts from their territories. Ever since I have been on this farm, I have never heard of one in this province. And I can speak for myself, I have never come across one. You see then, friends, went on Jacques Paganel, there are few, if any, savages, no ferocious animals, no convicts, and there are not many countries of Europe for which you can say as much. Well, will you go? What do you think, Helena? asked Glenarvan. What we all think, dear Edward, replied Lady Helena, turning toward her companions. Let us be off at once. End of Book Two, Chapter Seven Book Two, Chapter Eight of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eddie Winter. In Search of the Castaways, or the Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book Two, Chapter Eight. Preparation for the Journey. Glenarvan never lost much time between adopting an idea and carrying it out. As soon as he consented to Paganel's proposition, he gave immediate orders to make arrangements for the journey, with as little delay as possible. The time of starting was fixed for the 22nd of December, the next day but one. What results might not come out of this journey? The presence of Harry Grant had become an indisputable fact, and the chances of finding him had increased. Not that any one expected to discover the captain exactly on the 37th parallel, which they intended strictly to follow, but they might come upon his track, and at all events they were going to the actual spot where the wreck had occurred. That was the principal point. Besides, if Ayrton consented to join them and act as their guide through the forests of the province of Victoria, and right to the eastern coast, they would have a fresh chance of success. Glenarvan was sensible of this, and asked his host whether he would have any great objection to his asking Ayrton to accompany them, for he felt particularly desirous of securing the assistance of Harry Grant's old companion. Paddy O'Moore consented, though he would regret the loss of his excellent servant. Well then, Ayrton, Will you come with us in our search expedition? Ayrton did not reply immediately. 
he even showed signs of hesitation but at last after due reflection said yes my lord i will go with you and if i cannot take you to captain grant i can at least take you to the very place where his ship struck thanks ayrton one question my lord well where will you meet the duncan again at melbourne unless we traverse the whole continent from coast to coast but the captain the captain will await my instructions in the port of melbourne you may depend on me then my lord i will ayrton the quartermaster was warmly thanked by the passengers of the duncan and the children loaded him with caresses every one rejoiced in his decision except the irishman who lost in him an intelligent and faithful helper but paddy understood the importance glenarvan attached to the presence of the man and submitted the whole party then returned to the ship after arranging a rendezvous with ayrton and ordering him to procure the necessary means of conveyance across the country when john mangles supported the proposition of paganel he took for granted that he should accompany the expedition he began to speak to glenarvan at once about it and adduced all sorts of arguments to advance his cause his devotion to lady helena and his lordship how useful could he be in organizing the party and how useless on board the duncan everything in fact but the main reason and that he had no need to bring forward i'll only ask you one question john said glenarvan have you entire confidence in your chief officer absolute replied mangles tom austin is a good sailor he will take the ship to her destination see that the repairs are skilfully executed and bring her back on the appointed day tom is a slave to duty and discipline never would he take it upon himself to alter or retard the execution of an order your lordship may rely on him as on myself very well then john replied glenarvan you shall go with us for it would be advisable he added smiling that you should be there when we find mary grant's father oh your lordship murmured john turning pale he could say no more but grasped lord glenarvan's hand next day john mangles and the ship's carpenter accompanied by sailors carrying provisions went back to paddy o'more's house to consult the irishman about the best method of transport all the family met him ready to give their best help ayrton was there and gave the benefit of his experience on one point both he and paddy agreed that the journey should be made in a bullock wagon by the ladies and that the gentlemen should ride on horseback Paddy could furnish both bullocks and vehicle. The vehicle was a cart twenty feet long, covered over by a tilt, and resting on four large wheels, without spokes or fellows or iron tyres. In a word, plain wooden discs. The front and hinder part were connected by means of a rude mechanical contrivance which did not allow of the vehicle turning quickly. There was a pole in front, thirty-five feet long, to which the bullocks were to be yoked in couples these animals were able to draw both with head and neck as their yoke was fastened on the nape of the neck and to this a collar was attached by an iron peg it required great skill to drive such a long narrow shaky concern and to guide such a team by a goad but ayrton had served his apprenticeship to it on the irishman's farm and paddy could answer for his competency the role of conductor was therefore assigned to him there were no springs to the wagon and consequently it was not likely to be very comfortable but such as it was they had to take it but if the rough construction could not be altered john mangles resolved that the interior should be made as easy as possible his first care was to divide it into two compartments by a wooden partition the back one was intended for the provisions and luggage and M. Albinet's portable kitchen. The front was set apart especially for the ladies, and under the carpenter's hands was to be speedily converted into a comfortable room, covered with a thick carpet, and fitted up with a toilet table and two couches. Thick leather curtains shut in this apartment, and protected the occupants from the chilliness of the nights. In case of necessity, 
the gentlemen might shelter themselves here when the violent rains came on but a tent was to be their usual resting-place when the caravan camped for the night john mangles exercised all his ingenuity in furnishing the small space with everything that the two ladies could possibly require and he succeeded so well that neither lady helena nor mary had much reason to regret leaving their cosy cabins on board the duncan for the rest of the party the preparations were soon made for they needed much less strong horses were provided for lord glenarvan paganel robert grant macnabs and john mangles also for the two sailors wilson and mulrady who were to accompany their captain Ayrton's place was of course to be in front of the wagon and monsieur albinet who did not care much for equitation was to make room for himself among the baggage horses and bullocks were grazing in the irishman's meadows ready to fetch at a moment's notice after all arrangements were made and the carpenter set to work john mangles escorted the irishman and his family back to the vessel for paddy wished to return the visit of lord glenarvan ayrton thought proper to go too and about four o'clock the party came over the side of the duncan they were received with open arms glenarvan would not be outstripped in politeness and invited his visitors to stop and dine his hospitality was willingly accepted paddy was quite amazed at the splendour of the saloon and was loud in admiration of the fitting up of the cabins and the carpets and hangings as well as of the polished maple wood of the upper deck Ayrton's approbation was much less hearty for he considered it mere costly superfluity but when he examined the yacht with a sailor's eye the quartermaster of the britannia was as enthusiastic about it as paddy he went down into the hold inspected the screw department and the engine room examining the engine thoroughly and inquired about its power and consumption he explored the coal bunkers the storeroom the powder store and armory in which he seemed to be particularly attracted by a cannon mounted on the forecastle glenarvan saw he had to do with a man who understood such matters as was evident from his questions ayrton concluded his investigations by a survey of the masts and rigging you have a fine vessel my lord he said after his curiosity was satisfied a good one and that is best replied glenarvan and what is her tonnage two hundred and ten tons i don't think i am far out continued ayrton in judging her speed at fifteen knots i should say she could do that easily say seventeen put in john mangles and you've hit the mark seventeen exclaimed the quartermaster why not a man of war not the best among them i mean could chase her not one replied mangles the duncan is a regular racing yacht and will never let herself be beaten even at sailing asked ayrton even at sailing well my lord and you too captain returned ayrton allow a sailor who knows what a ship is worth to compliment you on yours say on board of her then ayrton said glenarvan it rests with yourself to call it yours i will think of it my lord was all ayrton's reply just then m albinet came to announce dinner and his lordship repaired with his guests to the saloon that ayrton is an intelligent man said paganel to the major too intelligent muttered McNabs, who without any apparent reason had taken a great dislike to the face and manners of the quartermaster during the dinner ayrton gave some interesting details about the australian continent which he knew perfectly he asked how many sailors were going to accompany the expedition and seemed astonished to hear that only two were going he advised glenarvan to take all his best men and even urged him to do it which advice by the way ought to have removed the major's suspicion but said glenarvan our journey is not dangerous is it not at all replied ayrton quickly well then we'll have all the men we can on board hands will be wanted to work the ship and to help in the repairs besides it is of the utmost importance that she should meet us to the very day at whatever place may be ultimately selected 
Consequently, we must not lessen her crew. Ayrton said nothing more, as if convinced his lordship was right. When evening came, Scotch and Irish separated. Ayrton and Paddy O'Moore and family returned home. Horses and wagons were to be ready the next day, and eight o'clock in the morning was fixed for starting. Lady Helena and Mary Grant soon made their preparations. They had less to do than Jacques Paganel, for he spent half the night in arranging and wiping and rubbing up the lenses of his telescope. Of course, next morning he slept on till the Major's stentorian voice roused him. The luggage was already conveyed to the farm, thanks to John Mangles, and a boat was waiting to take the passengers. They were soon seated, and the young captain gave his final orders to Tom Austin, his chief officer. He impressed upon him that he was to wait at Melbourne for Lord Glenarvan's commands, and to obey them scrupulously, whatever they might be. The old sailor told John he might rely on him, and in the name of the men, begged to offer his lordship their best wishes for the success of this new expedition. A storm of hurrahs burst forth from the yacht as the boat rowed off. In ten minutes the shore was reached, and a quarter of an hour afterward the Irishman's farm. All was ready. Lady Helena was enchanted with her installation. The huge chariot, with its primitive wheels and massive planks, pleased her particularly. The six bullocks, yoked in pairs, had a patriarchal air about them, which took her fancy. Ayrton, goad in hand, stood waiting the orders of this new master. "'My word,' said Bagenel, "'this is a famous vehicle. It beats all the mail-coaches in the world. I don't know a better fashion of travelling than in a Mount Banks caravan, a movable house which goes or stops wherever you please.' What can one wish better? The Samoratians understood that, and never travelled in any other way. Monsieur Paganel, said Lady Helena, I hope I shall have the pleasure of seeing you in my salon. Assuredly, madam, I should count it an honour. Have you fixed the day? I shall be at home every day to my friends, replied Lady Helena, and you are the most devoted among them all, interrupted Paganel gaily. These mutual compliments were interrupted by the arrival of the seven horses, saddled and ready. They were brought by Paddy's sons, and Lord Glenarvan paid the sum stipulated for his various purchases, adding his cordial thanks, which the worthy Irishman valued at least as much as his golden guineas. The signal was given to start, and Lady Helena and Mary took their places in the reserved compartment. Ayrton seated himself in front, and Albinet scrambled in among the baggage. The rest of the party, well armed with carbines and revolvers, mounted their horses. Ayrton gave a peculiar cry, and his team set off. The wagon shook, and the planks creaked, and the axles grated in the naves of the wheels, and before long the hospitable farm of the Irishman was out of sight. End of Book Two, Chapter Eight Book Two, Chapter Nine of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways, or the Children of Captain Grant, by Jules Verne. Book Two, Chapter Nine A Country of Paradoxes. It was the twenty third of December, eighteen sixty four. A dull, damp, dreary month in the northern hemisphere. But on the Australian continent it might be called June. The hottest season of the year had already commenced, and the sun's rays were almost tropical, when Lord Glenarvan started on his new expedition. Most fortunately, the 37th parallel did not cross the immense deserts, inaccessible regions, which have cost many martyrs to science already. Glenarvan could never have encountered them, he had only to do with the southern part of Australia, that is, with the narrow portion of the province of Adelaide, with the whole of Victoria, and with the top of the reverse triangle, which forms New South Wales. It is scarcely sixty-two miles from Cape Bernoulli to the frontiers of Victoria. 
It was not above two days' march, and Ireton reckoned on their sleeping next night at Apsley, the most westerly town of Victoria. The commencement of a journey is always marked by ardour, both in the horses and the horsemen. This is well enough in the horsemen, but if the horses are to go far, their speed must be moderated and their strength husbanded. It was, therefore, fixed that the average journey every day should not be more than from twenty-five to thirty miles. Besides, the pace of the horses must be regulated by the slower pace of the bullocks, truly mechanical engines which lose in time what they gain in power. The wagon with its passengers and provisions was the very centre of the caravan, the moving fortress. The horsemen might act as scouts, but must never be far away from it. As no special marching order had been agreed upon, everybody was at liberty to follow his inclinations within certain limits. The hunters could scour the plain, amiable folks could talk to the fair occupants of the wagon, and philosophers could philosophize. Paganel, who was all three combined, had to be and was everywhere at once. The march across Adelaide presented nothing of any particular interest. A succession of low hills, rich in dust, a long stretch of what they call in Australia bush, several prairies covered with small prickly bush, considered a great dainty by the ovine tribe, embraced many miles. Here and there they noticed a species of sheep peculiar to New Holland, sheep with pigs' heads, feeding between the posts of the telegraph line recently made between Adelaide and the coast. Up to this time there had been a singular resemblance in the country to the monotonous plains of the Argentine Pampas. There was the same grassy flat soil, the same sharply defined horizon against the sky. McNabbs declared that they had never changed countries, but Paganel told him to wait, and he would soon see a difference. And on the faith of this assurance, marvellous things were expected by the whole party. In this fashion, after a march of sixty miles in two days, the caravan reached the parish of Apsley, the first town in the province of Victoria, in the Wimera district. The wagon was put up at the Crown Inn. Supper was soon smoking on the table. It consisted solely of mutton, served up in various ways. They all ate heartily, but talked more than they ate, eagerly asking Paganel questions about the wonders of the country they were just beginning to traverse. The amiable geographer needed no pressing, and told them first that this part of it was called Australia Felix. Wrongly named, he continued. It had better have been called rich, for it is true of countries, as individuals, that riches do not make happiness. Thanks to her gold mines, Australia has been abandoned to wild, devastating adventurers. You will come across them when we reach the gold fields. Is not the colony of Victoria of but a recent origin? asked Lady Glenarvan. Yes, ma'am. It only numbers thirty years of existence. It was on the 6th of June, 1835, on a Tuesday. At a quarter past seven in the evening, put in the Major, who delighted in teasing the Frenchman about his precise dates. No, at ten minutes past seven, replied the geographer gravely. That Batman and Faulkner first began a settlement at Fort Philip, the bay on which the large city of Melbourne now stands. For fifteen years the colony was part of New South Wales, and recognized Sydney as the capital. But in 1851 she was declared independent, and took the name of Victoria, and has greatly increased in prosperity since then, I believe, said Glenarvan. Judge for yourself, my noble friend, replied Paganel. Here are the numbers given by the last statistics, and let McNabbs say as he likes I know nothing more eloquent than statistics. Go on, said the Major. Well, then, in 1836, the colony of Port Phillips had 222 inhabitants. Today the province of Victoria numbers 550,000. Seven millions of vines produce annually 121,000 gallons of wine. There are 103,000 horses spreading over the plains, and 675,272 horned cattle graze in her wide-stretching pastures. "'Is there not also a certain number of pigs?' inquired McNabbs. 
Yes, Major, 79,625. And how many sheep? 7,115,943, McNabs. Including the one we are eating at this moment? No, without counting that, since it is three parts devoured. Bravo, Monsieur Paganel, exclaimed Lady Helena, laughing heartily. It must be owned you are posted up in geographical questions, and my cousin McNabs need not try and find you tripping. It is my calling, ma'am, to know this sort of thing, and to give you the benefit of my information when you please. You may therefore believe me when I tell you that wonderful things are in store for you in this strange country. It does not look like it at present, said McNabs, on purpose to tease Paganel. Just you wait, impatient Major, was his rejoinder. You have hardly put your foot on the frontier when you turn round and abuse it. Well, I say, and I say again, and will always maintain, that this is the most curious country on the earth. Its formation and nature, and products and climate, and even its future disappearance, have amazed, and are now amazing, and will amaze, all the savants in the world. Think, my friends, of a continent, the margin of which, instead of the centre, rose out of the waters, originally like a gigantic ring, which encloses, perhaps, in its centre, a sea partly evaporated, the waves of which are drying up daily, where humidity does not exist, either in the air or in the soil, where the trees lose their bark every year, instead of their leaves, where the leaves present their sides to the sun and not their face, and consequently give no shade, where the wood is often incombustible, where good-sized stones are dissolved by the rain, where forests are low, and the grasses gigantic, where the animals are strange, where quadrupeds have beaks, like the echinada or ornithornicus, and naturalists have been obliged to create a special order for them, called monotremes, where the kangaroos leap on unequal legs, and sheep have pig's heads, where foxes fly about from tree to tree, where swans are black, where rats make nests, where the bower-bird opens her reception-rooms to receive visits from her feathered friends, where the birds astonish the imagination by the variety of their notes and their aptness, where one bird serves for a clock and another makes a sound like a postulan cracking of a whip, and a third imitates a knife-grinder, and a fourth the motion of a pendulum, where one laughs when the sun rises and another cries when the sun sets. Oh, strange, illogical country, land of paradoxes and anomalies! If ever there was one on earth, the learned botanist Grimard was right when he said, There is that Australia, a sort of parody, or rather a defiance of universal laws, in the face of the rest of the world. Paganel's tirade was poured forth in the most impetuous manner, and seemed as if it were never coming to an end. The eloquent secretary of the Geographical Society was no longer master of himself. He went on and on, gesticulating furiously, and brandishing his fork to the imminent danger of his neighbours. But at last his voice was drowned in a thunder of applause, and he managed to stop. Certainly, after such an enumeration of Australian peculiarities, he might have been left in peace, but the Major said in the coolest tone possible, "'And is that all, Paganel?' "'No, indeed not,' rejoined the Frenchman, with renewed vehemence. "'What?' exclaimed Lady Helena. "'There are more wonders still in Australia?' "'Yes, madam, it's climate. It is even stranger than its productions.' "'Is it possible?' they all said. "'I am not speaking of the hygienic qualities of the climate,' continued Paganel, "'rich as it is in oxygen and poor in azote. There are no damp winds.' because the trade winds blow regularly on the coasts, and most diseases are unknown, from typhus to measles, and chronic affections. Still, that is no small advantage, said Glenarvan. No doubt, but I am not referring to that, but to one quality it has which is incomparable. And what is that? You will never believe me. Yes, we will, exclaimed his auditors, their curiosity aroused by this preamble. Well, it is... It is what? It is a moral regeneration. A moral regeneration? Yes, replied the savant, in a tone of conviction. 
Here metals do not get rust on them by exposure to the air, nor men. Here the pure dry atmosphere whitens everything rapidly, both linen and soles. The virtue of the climate must have been well known in England when they determined to send their criminals here to be reformed. What? Do you mean to say the climate has really any such influence? said Lady Helena. Yes, madam, both on animals and men. You are not joking, Monsieur Paganel? I am not, madam. The horses and the cattle here are of incomparable docility. You see it? It is impossible. But it is a fact. And the convicts transported into this reviving, salubrious air become regenerated in a few years. Philanthropists know this. In Australia, all natures grow better. But what is to become of you, then, Monsieur Paganel? In this privileged country, you, who are so good already, said Lady Helena, what will you turn out? Excellent, madame, just excellent, and that's all. End of Book Two, Chapter Nine Book Two, Chapter Ten of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways or the Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book Two, Chapter Ten An Accident. The next day, the twenty fourth of December, they started at daybreak. The heat was already considerable, but not unbearable, and the road was smooth and good, and allowed the cavalcade to make speedy progress. In the evening they camped on the banks of the White Lake, the waters of which are brackish and undrinkable. Jacques Paganel was obliged to own that the name of this lake was a complete misnomer, for the waters were no more white than the Black Sea is black, or the Red Sea red, or the Yellow River yellow, or the Blue Mountains blue. However, he argued and disputed the point with all the amir propre of a geographer, but his reasoning made no impression. Mr. Oblinet prepared the evening meal with his accustomed punctuality, and after this was dispatched, the travellers disposed themselves for the night in the wagon and in the tent, and were soon sleeping soundly, notwithstanding the melancholy howl of the dingoes, the jackals of Australia. A magnificent plain, thickly covered with chrysanthemums, stretched out beyond the lake, and Glenarvan and his friends would gladly have explored its beauties when they awoke next morning, but they had to start. As far as the eye could reach, nothing was visible but one stretch of prairie enameled with flower in all the freshness and abundance of spring. The blue flowers of the slender leaved flax, combined with the bright hues of the scarlet acanthus, a flower peculiar to the country. A few cassowaries were bounding over the plain, but it was impossible to get near them. The major was fortunate enough, though, however, to hit one very rare animal with a ball in the leg. This was the jabiru, a species which is fast disappearing, the gigantic crane of the English colonies. This winged creature was five feet high, and his wide, conical, extremely pointed beak measured eighteen inches in length. The violet and purple tints of his head contrasted vividly with the glossy green of his neck and the dazzling whiteness of his throat and the bright red of his long legs. Nature seemed to have exhausted in its favor all the primitive colors on her palette. Great admiration was bestowed on this bird, and the major spoil would have borne the honors of the day had not Robert come across an animal a few miles further on and bravely killed it. It was a shapeless creature, half porcupine, half anteater, a sort of unfinished animal belonging to the first stage of creation. A long, glutinous, extensible tongue hung out of his jaws in search of the ants which formed its principal food. It is an echidna, said Paganel. Have you ever seen such a creature? It is horrible, replied Glenarvan. Horrible enough, but curious, and what's more, peculiar to Australia. One might search for it in vain in any other part of the world. Naturally enough, the geographer wished to preserve this interesting species of monotremata, and wanted to stow it away in the luggage, but M. Oblinet resented the idea so indignantly that the savant was obliged to abandon his project. 
About four o'clock in the afternoon, John Mangles descried an enormous column of smoke about three miles off, gradually overspreading the whole horizon. What could be the cause of this phenomenon? Paganel was inclined to think it was some description of meteor, and his lively imagination was already in search of an explanation, when Ayrton cut short all his conjectures summarily by announcing that the cloud of dust was caused by a drove of cattle on the road. The quartermaster proved right, for as the cloud came nearer, quite a chorus of bleedings and neighings and bellowings escaped from it, mingled with the loud tones of a human voice, in the shape of cries, whistles, and vociferations. Presently a man came out of the cloud. This was the leader-in-chief of the four-footed army. Glenarvan advanced toward him. The friendly relations were speedily established between them. The leader, or to give him his proper designation, the stock-keeper, was part owner of the drove. His name was Sam Mashall, and he was on his way from the eastern provinces to Portland Bay. The drove numbered twelve thousand seventy-five head in all, or one thousand bullocks, eleven thousand sheep, and seventy-five horses. All these had been bought in the Blue Mountains in a poor, lean condition, and were going to be fatted up on the rich pasture-lands of southern Australia, and sold again at a great profit. Sam Matchell expected to get pounds, two, on each bullock, and ten shilling on every sheep, which would bring him in pounds three thousand seven hundred and fifty. This was doing good business, but what patience and energy were required to conduct such a restive, stubborn lot to their destination, and what fatigues must have to be endured. Truly the gain was hardly earned. Sam Matchell told his history in a few words, while the drove continued their march among the groves of mimosas. Lady Helena and Mary and the rest of the party seated themselves under the shade of a wide-spreading gum-tree, and listened to his recital. It was seven months since Sam Mitchell had started. He had gone at the rate of ten miles a day, and his interminable journey would last three months longer. His assistants in the laborious task comprised twenty dogs and thirty men, five of whom were blacks, and very serviceable in tracking up any stray beasts. Six wagons made up the rear guard. All the men were armed with stock whips, the handles of which are eighteen inches long and the lash nine feet, and they move about among the ranks, bringing refractory animals back into order, while the dogs, the light cavalry of the regiment, preserved discipline in the wings. The travellers were struck with the admirable arrangement of the drove. The different stock were kept apart, for wild sheep and bullocks would not have got on together at all. The bullocks would never have grazed where the sheep had passed along, and consequently they had to go first, divided into two battalions. Five regiment of sheep followed, in charge of twenty men, and last of all came the horses. Sam Matchell drew the attention of his auditors to the fact that the real guides of the drove were neither the men nor the dogs, but the oxen themselves, beasts of superior intelligence, recognized as leaders by their congenitors. They advanced in front with perfect gravity, choosing the best route by instinct and fully alive to their claim to respect. Indeed, they were obliged to be studied, and humoured in everything, for the whole drove obeyed them implicitly. If they took it into their heads to stop, it was a matter of necessity to yield to their good pleasure, for not a single animal would move a step till these leaders gave the signal to set off. Sundry details added by the stock-keeper completed the history of this expedition, worthy of being written if not commended by xenophon himself as long as the troop marched over the plains it was well enough there was little difficulty or fatigue the animals fed as they went along and slaked their thirst at the numerous creeks that watered the plains sleeping at night and making good progress in the day always obedient and tractable to the dogs but when they had to go through great forests and groves of eucalyptus and mimosas the difficulties increased Platoons, battalions, and regiments got all mixed together or scattered, and it was work of time to collect them again. Should a leader unfortunately go astray, he had to be found, cost what it might, on pain of general disbandment, and the blacks were often long days in quest of him, before their search was successful. During the heavy rains the lazy beasts refused to stir, and when violent storms chanced to occur, 
the creatures became almost mad with terror, and were seized with wild, disorderly panic. However, by dint of energy and ambition, the stock-keeper triumphed over these difficulties, incessantly renewed though they were. He kept steadily on, mile after mile, of plains and woods and mountains, lay behind. But in addition to all his other qualities, there was one higher than all that he specially needed when they came to rivers. This was patience, patience that could stand any trial, and not only could hold out for hours and days but for weeks. The stock-keeper would be himself forced to wait on the banks of a stream that might have been crossed at once. There was nothing to hinder but the obstinacy of the herd. The bullocks would taste the water and turn back. The sheep fled in all directions, afraid to brave the liquid element. The stock-keeper hoped when night came he might manage them better, but they still refused to go forward. The rams were dragged in by force, but the sheep would not follow. They tried what thirst they could, by keeping them without drink for several days, but when they were brought to the river again they simply quenched their thirst, and declined a more intimate acquaintance with the water. The next expedient employed was to carry all the lambs over, hoping the mothers would be drawn after them, moved by their cries, but the lambs might bleat as pitifully as they liked, the mothers never stirred. Sometimes this state of affairs would last a whole month, and the stock-keeper would be driven to his wit's end by his bleeding, bellowing, neighing army. Then all of a sudden one fine day, without rhyme or reason, a detachment would take it to their heads to make a start across, and the only difficulty now was to keep the whole herd from rushing helter-skelter after them. The wildest confusion set in among the ranks, and numbers of the animals were drowned in the passage. Such was the narrative of Sam Matchell. During its recital a considerable part of the troop had filed past in good order. It was time for him to return to his place at their head, that he might be able to choose the best pasturage. Taking leave of Lord Glenarvan, he sprang on a capital horse of the native breed, that one of his men held waiting for him, and after shaking hands cordially with everybody all round, took his departure. A few minutes later nothing was visible of the stock-keeper and his troop but a cloud of dust. The wagon resumed its course in the opposite direction, and did not stop again till they halted for the night at the foot of Mount Talbot. Paganel made the judicious observation that it was the 25th of December, the Christmas day so dear to English hearts. But the steward had not forgotten it, and an appetizing meal was soon ready under the tent, for which he deserved and received warm compliments from the guests. Indeed, M. Oblanet had quite excelled himself on this occasion. He produced from his stores such an array of European dishes as is seldom seen in the Australian desert. Reindeer hams, slices of salt beef, smoked salmon, oat cakes and barley meal scones, tea ad libitum, and whisky in abundance, and several bottles of port, composed this astonishing meal. The little party might have thought themselves in the grand dining-hall of Malcolm Castle in the heart of the highlands of Scotland. The next day, at eleven a.m., the wagon reached the banks of the Wimera, on the 143rd meridian. The river, half a mile in width, wound its limpid course between tall rows of gum-trees and acacias. Magnificent specimens of the Myrtacea, among others, the Metroside Ross, Speciosa, fifteen feet high, with long drooping branches, adorned with red flowers, thousands of birds, the lorries and greenfinches, and gold-winged pigeons, not to speak of the noisy parroquets, flew about in the green branches. Below, on the bosom of the water, were a couple of shy and unapproachable black swans. This rara avis of the Australian rivers soon disappeared among the windings of the Wimera, which water the charming landscape in the most capricious manner. The wagon stopped on a grassy bank, the long fringes of which dipped in the rapid current. There was neither raft nor bridge, but cross over they must. Ayrton looked about for a practicable ford. About a quarter of a mile up the water seemed shallower, and it was here they determined to try and pass over. The soundings in different parts showed a depth of three feet only, so that the wagon might safely enough venture. "'I suppose there is no other way of fording the river,' said Glenarvan to the quartermaster. 
No, my lord, but the passage does not seem dangerous. We shall manage it. Shall Lady Glenarvan and Miss Grant get out of the wagon? Not at all. My bullocks are sure-footed, and you may rely on me for keeping them straight. Very well, Ayrton. I can trust you. The horsemen surrounded the ponderous vehicle, and all stepped boldly into the current. Generally, when wagons have to ford rivers, they have empty casks slung all round them to keep them floating on the water, but they had no such swimming belt with them on this occasion, and they could only depend on the sagacity of the animals and the prudence of Ayrton, who directed the team. The Major and the two sailors were some feet in advance. Glenarvan and John Mangles went at the sides of the wagon, ready to lend any assistance the fair travellers might require, and Paganel and Robert brought up the rear. All went well until they reached the middle of the Wimera, but then the hollow deepened, and the water rose to the middle of the wheels. The bullocks were in danger of losing their footing, and dragging with them the oscillating vehicle. Ayrton devoted himself to his task courageously. He jumped into the water, and hanging on by the bullock's horns, dragged them back into the right course. Suddenly the wagon made a jolt that it was impossible to prevent. A crack was heard, and the vehicle began to lean over it in a most precarious manner. The water now rose to the lady's feet. The whole concern began to float. Though John Mangles and Lord Glenarvan hung on to the side, it was an anxious moment. Fortunately, a vigorous effort drove the wagon toward the opposite shore, and the bank began to slope upward, so that the horses and bullocks were able to regain their footing, and soon the whole party found themselves on the other side, glad enough, though wet enough too. The fore part of the wagon, however, was broken by the jolt, and Glenarvan's horse had lost a shoe. This was an accident that needed to be promptly repaired. They looked at each other, hardly knowing what to do, till Ayrton proposed he should go to Black Point Station, twenty miles further north, and bring a blacksmith with him. "'Yes, go, my good fellow,' said Glenarvan. "'How long will it take you to get there and back?' "'About fifteen hours,' replied Ayrton. "'But no longer. Start at once, then, and we will camp here on the banks of the Wimera till you return.'" End of Book 2, Chapter 10